The first satire of the satires of Decimus Junius Juvenalis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Nicholas Hillier, Wiltshire, England, December 2023. The satires of Decimus Junius Juvenalis. Translated by John Dryden. The first satire. The argument. The poet gives us first a kind of humorous reason for his writing, that being provoked by hearing so many ill poets rehearse their works, he does himself justice on them by giving them as bad as they bring. But since no man will rank himself with all writers, it is easy to conclude that if such wretches could draw an audience, he thought it no hard matter to excel them and gain a greater esteem with the public. Next, he informs us more openly why he rather addicts himself to satire than any other kind of poetry, and here he discovers that it is not so much his indignation to ill poets as to ill men which has prompted him to write. He therefore gives us a summary and a general view of the vices and follies reigning in his time, so that this first satire is the natural groundwork of all the rest. Herein he confines himself to no one subject, but strikes indifferently at all men in his way. In every following satire he has chosen some particular moral which he would inculcate, and lashes some particular vice or folly, an art with which our lampooners are not much acquainted. But our poet, being desirous to reform his own age, not daring to attempt it by an overt act of naming living persons, Enveys only against those who were infamous in the times immediately preceding his, whereby he not only gives a fair warning to great men that their memory lies at the mercy of future poets and historians, but also, with a finer stroke of his pen, brands even the living, and personates them under dead men's names. I have avoided as much as I could possibly the borrowed learning of marginal notes and illustrations, and for that reason have translated this satire somewhat largely, and freely own, if it be a fault, that I have likewise omitted most of the proper names, because I thought they would not much edify the reader. To conclude, if in two or three places I have deserted all the commentators, tis because they first deserted my author, or at least have left him in so much obscurity that too much room is left for guessing. Still shall I hear, and never quit the score, Stunned with hoarse codrus's thessid, o'er and o'er, Shall this man's elegies and t'others play, Unpunished murder a long summer's day? Huge Telephus, a formidable page, Cries vengeance, and Orestes' bulky rage, Unsatisfied with margins closely writ, Foams o'er the covers, and not finished yet. No man can take a more familiar note of his own home than I of Vulcan's grot, or Mars his grove, or hollow winds that blow from Etna's top, or tortured ghosts below. I know by rote the famed exploits of Greece, the centre's fury and the golden fleece, through the thick shades the eternal scribbler balls, and shakes the statues on their pedestals. The best and worst on the same theme employs his muse, and plagues us with an equal noise. Provoked by these incorrigible fools, I left declaiming in pedantic schools, where, with men-boys, I strove to get renown, advising Scylla to a private gown. But since the world with writing is possessed, I'll verify in spite, and do my best, to make as much waste paper as the rest. But why I lift aloft the satire's rod, And tread the path which famed Lucilius trod? Attend the causes which my muse have led, When sapless eunuchs mount the marriage-bed, When mannish Mavia, that two-handed whore, Astride on horseback hunts the Tuscan boar, When all our lords are by his wealth outvied, Whose razor on my callow beard was tried. When I behold the spawn of conquered Nile, Crispinus, both in birth and manners vile, Pacing in pomp with cloak of Tyrian dye, 
changed off today for needless luxury, and finding oft occasion to be fanned, ambitious to produce his lady hand. Charged with light summer rings, his fingers sweat, unable to support a gem of weight. Such fulsome objects meeting everywhere, tis hard to write, but harder to forbear. To view so lewd a town, and to refrain, what hoops of iron could my spleen contain? When pleading Matho, born abroad for air, with his fat paunch fills his new-fashioned chair, and after him the wretch in pomp conveyed, whose evidence his lord and friend betrayed, and but the wished occasion does attend, from the poor nobles the last spoils to rend, whom even spies dread as their superior fiend, and bribe with presents, or with presents fail, they send their prostituted wives for bail. When night performance holds the place of merit, and brawn and back the next of kin disherit, for such good parts are in preferment's way, the rich old madam never fails to pay her legacies by nature's standard given. One gains an ounce, another gains eleven. A dear-bought bargain, all things duly weighed, for which their thrice-concocted blood is paid, with looks as wan as he who, in the break, at unawares has trod upon a snake, or played at lions a declaiming prize, for which the vanquished rhetorician dies. What indignation boils within my veins when perjured guardians, proud with impious gains, choke up the streets too narrow for their trains, whose wards by want betrayed to crimes are led, too foul to name, too fulsome to be read, when he who pilled his province scapes the laws and keeps his money, though he lost his cause, his fine begged off, contemns his infamy, can rise at twelve and get him drunk ere three, enjoys his exile, and condemned in vain leaves thee, prevailing province, to complain? Such villainies roused Horace into wrath, and tis more noble to pursue his path than an old tale of Diomede repeat, or labouring after Hercules to sweat, or wandering in the winding maze of Crete, or with the winged smith aloft to fly, or fluttering perish with his foolish boy. With what impatience must the muse behold the wife by her procuring husband sold? For though the law makes null the adulterer's deed of lands to her, the cuckold may succeed, who his taut eyes up to the ceiling throws, and sleeps all over but his wakeful nose, when he dares hope a colonel's command, whose courses kept, ran out his father's land, who yet a stripling Nero's chariot drove, whirled o'er the streets while his vain master strove, with boasted art to please his eunuch love. Would it not make a modest author dare to draw his table-book within the square, and fill with notes when lolling at his ease, Messenus-like the happy rogue he sees, borne by six weary slaves, in open view, who cancelled an old will and forged anew, made wealthy at the small expense of signing with a wet seal and a fresh interlining? The lady next requires a lashing line, who squeezed a toad into her husband's wine. So well the fashionable medicine thrives, that now tis practised even by country wives, poisoning without regard of fame or fear, and spotted corpse are frequent on the beer. Wouldst thou to honours and preferments climb, be bold in mischief, dare some mighty crime, which dungeons, death, or banishment deserves, for virtue is but dryly praised, and starves. Great men to great crimes owe their plate embossed, fair palaces and furniture of cost, and high commands a sneaking sin is lost. Who can behold that rank old lecher's keep his son's corrupted wife and hope to sleep? Or that male harlot, or that unfledged boy, eager to sin before he can enjoy? If nature could not, anger would indict such woeful stuff as I or sh someone all right. Count from the time since old Deucalion's boat, raised by the flood, did on Parnassus float, and scarcely mooring on the cliff, implored an oracle how man might be restored. 
when softened stones and vital breath ensued, and virgins naked were by lovers viewed. Whatever since that golden age was done, what humankind desires, and what they shun. Rage, passions, pleasures, impotence of will, shall this satirical collection fill. What age so large a crop of vices bore? Or when was avarice extended more? When were the dice with more profusion thrown? The well-filled fob not emptied now alone, but gamesters for whole patrimonies play. The steward brings the deeds which must convey the lost estate. What more than madness reigns when one short sitting many hundreds drains? and not enough is left him to supply board wages or a footman's livery. What age so many summer seats did see, or which of our forefathers fared so well, as on seven dishes at a private meal? Clients of old were feasted, now a poor divided dole is dealt at thoutward door, which by the hungry rout is soon dispatched, the paltry largesse too severely watched, ere given and every face observed with care, that no intruding guests usurp a share. No new receive, the crier calls aloud, our old nobility of Trojan blood, who gape among the crowd for their precarious food. The praetors and the tribune's voice is heard, the freedman jostles and will be preferred. First come, first served, he cries, and I, in spite of your great lordships, will maintain my right. Though born a slave, though my torn ears are bored, tis not the birth, tis money makes the lord. The rent of five fair houses I receive, what greater honours can the purple give? The poor patrician is reduced to keep in melancholy walks a grazier's sheep. Not Pallas, not Licinius had my treasure. Then let the sacred tribunes wait my leisure. Once a poor rogue, tis true, I trod the street and trudged to Rome upon my naked feet. Gold is the greatest god, though yet we see no temples raised to money's majesty. No altars, fuming to her power divine, such as to valour, peace, and virtue shine. And faith and concord, where the stalk on high seems to salute her infant progeny, presaging pious love with her auspicious cry. But since our knights and senators account to what their sordid begging veils amount, judge what a wretched share the poor attends, whose whole subsistence on those arms depends, their household fire, their raiment, and their food, prevented by those harpies when a wood of litters thick besiege the donor's gate, and begging lords and teeming ladies wait the promised dole. Nay, some have learned the trick to beg for absent persons, feign them sick, close mewed in their sedans for fear of air, and for their wives produce an empty chair. This is my spouse, dispatch her with her share. Tis gala, let her ladyship but peep. No, sir, tis pity to disturb her sleep. Such fine employments our whole days divide, the salutations of the morning tide. Call up the sun, those ended to the hall, we wait the patron, hear the lawyer's ball. Then to the statues, where amidst the race of conquering Rome, some Arab shows his face, inscribed with titles, and profanes the place. Fit to be pissed against, and somewhat more, the great man, home conducted, shuts his door. Old clients, weary out with fruitless care, dismiss their hopes of eating and despair though much against the grain forced to retire, buy roots for supper, and provide a fire. Meantime his lordship lolls within at ease, pampering his porch with foreign rarities. Both sea and land are ransacked for the feast, and his own gut the sole invited guest. Such plates, such tables, dishes dressed so well, that whole estates are swallowed at a meal. Even parasites are banished from his board, at once a sordid and luxurious lord, prodigious throat, for which a whole boars are dressed, a creature formed to furnish out a feast. But present punishment pursues his maw. When surfeited and swelled, the peacock roar he bears into the bath, 
whence want of breath repletions apoplex intestate death his fate makes table talk divulge with scorn and he a jest into his grave is born no age can go beyond us future times can add no farther to the present crimes our sons but the same things can wish and do vice is at stand and at the highest flow then satire spread thy sails take all the winds can blow some may perhaps demand what muse can yield sufficient strength for such a spacious field for whence can be derived so large a vein bold truth to speak and spoken to maintain when godlike freedom is so far bereft the noble mind that scarce the name is left ere scandalum magnatum was begot no matter if the great forgive or not but if the honest license now you take if into rogues omnipotent you rake death is your doom impaled upon a stake smeared o'er with wax and set on fire to light the streets and make dreadful blaze by night till they who drench three uncles in a draught of poisonous juice be then in triumph brought make lanes among the people where they go and mounted high on downy chariots throw disdainful glances on the crowd below be silent and beware if such you see tis defamation but to say that's he against bold turnus the great trojan arm amidst their strokes the poet gets no harm achilles may in epic verse be slain and none of all his myrmidons complain hylas may drop his pitcher none will cry not if he drown himself for company but when lucilius brandishes his pen and flashes in the face of guilty men a cold sweat stands in drops on every part and rage succeeds to tears revenge to smart muse be advised tis past considering time when entered once the dangerous lists of rhyme since none the living villains dare impled arrange them in the persons of the dead end of the first satire the second satire of decimus junius juvenalis translated by mr tate this librivox recording is in the public domain read by nicholas hillier wiltshire england december 2023 the second satire the argument the poet in this satire inveighs against the hypocrisy of the philosophers and priests of his time the effeminacy of military officers and magistrates which corruption of manners in general and more particularly of unnatural vices he imputes to the atheistical principles that then prevailed i'm sick of rome and wish myself conveyed where freezing seas obstruct the merchant's trade when hypocrites read lectures and a sot because into a gown and pulpit got though surfeit gorged and reeking from the stews nothing but abstinence for's theme will choose the rake hells too pretend to learning why chrysippus statue decks their library who makes his closet finest is most read the dolt that with an aristotle's head carved to the life as once adorned his shelf straight sets up for a stagrite himself precise their look but to the brothel come you'll know the price of philosophic bum you'd swear if you their bristled hide surveyed that for a bear's caress they are made yet of their obscene part they take such care that like baboons they still keep podex bare to see it so sleek and trimmed the surgeon smiles and scarcely can for laughing launts the piles since silence seems to carry wisdom's power the affected rogues like clocks speak once an hour those grizzled locks which nature did provide in plenteous growth their asses ears to hide the formal slaves reduced to a degree short of their eyebrows now i honour thee thee peribonius thou professed he whore and all thy crimes impute to nature's score thou as in harlot's dress thou art attired for aught i know with harlot's itch art fired 
Thy form seems for the Patrick trade designed, and generously thou dost own thy kind. But what of those lewd miscreants must become who preach morality and shake the bum? Varilus cries, Shall I fear Sextus's doom, whose haunches are the common sink of Rome? Let him cry Blackmore devil, whose skin is white, and bandy legs, who treads himself upright. Let him reprove that's innocent. In vain, the Gracchi of sedition must complain. Could make you swear the planets from their spheres, should Veres peach thieves, Milo murderers, Clodius tax boards, Cethegus Catiline, or Scylla's pupils, Scylla's rules decline. Yet we have seen a modern magistrate Restore those rigid laws that did create, In Mars and Venus dread himself the while, With impious drugs and potions did beguile The teeming Julia's womb, And thence did rest crude births, That yet the incestuous sire confessed. How shall such hypocrites reform the state On whom the brothels can recriminate? Of this we have an instance, great and new, In a cock-zealot of this preaching crew, whose late harangue the gaping rabble drew. His theme, as fate would have't, was fornication, and as if the fury of his declamation, he cried, Why sleeps the Julian law, that awed this vice? Laronia, an industrious board, as boards were run to lectures, nettled much to have her copyhold so nearly touched. With a disdainful smile replied, Blessed times that made thee censor of the age's crimes. Rome now must needs reform, and vice be stopped, since a third Cato from the clouds is dropped. But tell me, sir, what perfume strikes the air, from your most reverend necker grown with hair? For modestly we may presume, I trow, tis not your natural grain the price I'd know. And where tis sold, direct me to the street and shop, for I wish no such essence meet. Let me entreat you, sir, for your own sake, use caution, and permit the laws to take a harmless nap, lest the Scantinian wake. Our wise forefathers took their measures right, nor wreaked on fornicators all their spite, but left a limbo for the sodomite. If you commission courts must needs erect, for manners put the test to your own sect. But you by number think yourselves secure, while our thin squadron must the brunt endure. With grief I must confess our musters few, and much with civil broils impaired, while you are to the devil and to each other true. Your penal laws against us are enlarged, on whom no crimes like what you act are charged. Flavia may now and then turn up for bread, but chastely with Catulla lies abed. Your hispo acts both sexes parts, before a fornicator and behind a whore. We ne'er invade your walks, the client's cause we leave to your confounding and the laws. If now and then an Amazonian dame dares fight a public prize, tis sure less shame than to behold your unnerved sex set in to needlework and like a damsel spin. How Hister's bondman his sole heir became, And his conniving spouse so rich a dame, Is known that wife with wealth must needs be sped, Who is content to make a third in bed. You nymphs that would to coach and six arrive, Marry, keep counsel, and ye are sure to thrive. Yet these obnoxious men, without remorse, Against our tribe will put the laws in force, Clip the dove's wing, and give the vulture course. Thus spoke the matron, the convicted crew, From so direct a charge like lightning flew. It must be so, nor vain Metellus shall From Rome's tribunal thy harangues prevail, Against harlotry, while thou art clad so thin, That through thy cobweb robe we see thy skin. As thou declaimst, fabular is, you say, A whore, I own it, so's Carcinia. Rank prostitutes, therefore, without remorse, Punish the strumpets, give the law its course. But when you've sentenced them, Metellus, no, They'd blush to appear so loosely dressed as you. You say the dog-star reigns, Whose sultry fire melts you to death, E'en in that light attire. 
go naked then to a better to be mad, which has a privilege than so lewdly clad? How would our mountain sires return from plough, or battle such a silken judge allow? Canst thou restore old manners, or retrench Rome's pride, who comes transparent to the bench? This mode in which thou singly dost appear, by thy example shall get footing here, till it has quite depraved the Roman stock, as one infected sheep confounds the flock. Nor will this crime, Metellus, be thy worst, no man e'er reached the heights of vice at first, for vice, like virtue, by degrees must grow. Thus from this wanton dress, Metellus, thou, with those polluted priests at last shalt join, who female chaplets round their temples twine, and with perverted rites profane the goddess's shrine. Where such vile practices twixt males are past, as makes our matrons lewd nocturnals chaste. Cotitus's orgies scarce are more obscene, for thus the feminine priests themselves demean. With jet-black pencils one his eyebrows dyes, and adds new fire to his lascivious eyes. Another in a glass priapus swills, while twisted gold his plaited tresses fills. A female robe, and to complete the farce, his servant not by Jove, but Juno swears. One holds a mirror, Pathic Otho's shield, in which he viewed before he marched to field, nor Ajax with more pride his sevenfold targe did wield. O noble subject for new annals fit, in musty fame's records unmentioned yet. A looking glass must load the imperial car, the most important carriage of the war. Galba to kill, he thought, a general's part but as a courtier used the nicest art to keep his skin from tan, before the fight would paint and set his soiled complexion aright. A softness which Semiramis ne'er knew when once she had the field and foe in view, nor Egypt's queen when she from Actium flew. No chaste discourse their festivals afford, obsceneness is the language of their board, Soft lisping tones port by some bald pate priest, for skilful palate master of the feast, a pack of prostitutes unnerved and rife for the operation of a Phrygian knife, for from such pathics twere but just to take those manly parts of which no use they make. Gracchus, to said, gave to his trumpeter four hundred sesterces, for what in dar, the motions are liked. The parties are agreed, and for performance seal a formal deed. Guests are bespoke, a wedding supper made. The wonted joy is wished, that done, the he-bride in his bridegroom's arms is laid. O peers of Rome, need these stupendous times a censor, or arispex for such crimes? The prodigy less monstrous would appear, if women calves or heifers lambs should bear. In bridal robe and veil, the pathics dressed, who bore the ponderous shield at Mars his feast. Father of Rome, say what detested clime taught Latian shepherds so abhorred crime. Say, thundering Mars, from whence the nettle sprung, whose venom first thy noble offspring stung. Behold, a man by birth and fortune great weds with a man, yet from the ethereal seat no rattling of thy brazen wheels we hear, nor is earth pierced with thy avenging spear. Oh, if thy jurisdiction, Mars, falls short to punish mischief of so vast import, complain to Jove and move the higher court, for shame redress this scandal, or resign thy province to some power that's more divine. Tomorrow, early in Quirinus's vale, I must attend, why, thereby hangs a tale, a male friend to be married to a male, tis true the wedding's carried privately, the parties being at present somewhat shy, but that they own the match ere long you'll hear, and see it in the public register. But one for grief does these he brides perplex, though they debase they cannot change their sex, nor yet by help of all their wicked art, bring offsprings to secure their husband's heart. 
Nature too much he the dire embraces forced, and ne'er joins influence with desires so cursed. Incestuous births and monsters may appear, but teeming males not earth nor hell can bear. Yet Gracchus, thou degenerate son of fame, thy pranks are stigmatized with greater blame. Theirs was a private, thine an open shame, who like a fencer on a public stage hast made thyself the scandal of the age. Nor can Rome's noblest blood with thine compare, while thou makest pastime for the theatre. To what dire cause can we assign these crimes, but to that reigning atheism of the times, ghosts, stygian lakes, and frogs with creaking note, and charon wafting souls in leaky boat, are now thought fables to fright fools conceived, or children, and by children scarce believed. Yet give thou credit, what can we suppose, the temperate Curiae and the Scipios? What will Fabricius or Camillus think, when they behold from their Elysium's brink, an atheist soul to last perdition sink? How will they from the salting banks rebound, and wish for sacred rites to purge the unhallowed ground? In vain, O Rome, thou dost thy conquest boast, Beyond the Arcades' short-nighted coast. Since free the conquered provinces remain From crimes that thy imperial cities stain. Yet rumour speaks, if we may credit fame, Of one Armenian youth, who since he came, Has learned the impious trade, And does exceed the lewdest pathics of our Roman breed. Blessings of commerce! He was sent, tis said, for breeding hither, and he's fairly bred. Fly foreign youths from our polluted streets, and, ere unmanned, regain your native seats. Lest, while for traffic here too long you stay, you learn at last to tread the Italian way, and, with cursed merchandise returning home, stock all your country with the figs of Rome. End of Second Satire The third satire of the satires of Decimus Junius Juvenalis, translated by John Dryden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Nicholas Hillier, Wiltshire, England, December 2023. The third satire. The argument. The story of this satire speaks of itself. Umbricius the supposed friend of Juvenal, and himself a poet, is leaving Rome, and retiring to Cumae. Our author accompanies him out of town. Before they take leave of each other, Umbricius tells his friend the reasons which oblige him to lead a private life in an obscure place. He complains that an honest man cannot get his bread in Rome, that none but flatterers make their fortunes there that Grecians and other foreigners raise themselves by those sordid arts which he describes, and against which he bitterly inveighs. He reckons up the several inconveniences which arise from a city life, and the many dangers which attend it, upbraids the nobleman with covetousness for not rewarding good poets, and arraigns the government for starving them. The great art of this satire is particularly shown in commonplaces, and drawing in as many vices as could naturally fall into the compass of it. Grieved though I am, an ancient friend to lose, I like the solitary seat he choose, in quiet Cumae fixing his repose, where, far from noisy Rome, secure he lives, and one more citizen to Sibyl gives. The road to Bagi, and that soft recess which all the gods with all their bounty bless, though I in Procitor with greater ease could live than in a street of palaces. What scene so desert, or so full of fright, as towering houses tumbling in the night, and Rome on fire beheld by its own blazing light? But worse than all the clattering tiles, and worse than thousand padders, is the poet's curse. Rogues! that in dog days cannot rhyme forbear, but without mercy read and make you hear. Now while my friend, just ready to depart, was packing all his goods in one poor cart, he stopped a little at the conduit gate, where Numa modelled once the Roman state, 
in mighty councils with his nymph retired, though now the sacred shades and founts are hired by banished Jews, who their whole wealth can lay in a small basket on a wisp of hay. Yet such are avarices that every tree pays for his head, not sleep itself is free, nor place nor persons now are sacred held, from their own grove the muses are expelled. Into this lonely vale our steps we bend, I and my sullen discontented friend. The marble caves and aqueducts we view, but how adulterate now and different from the true! How much more beauteous had the fountains been embellished with their first created green, where crystal streams through living turf had run, contented with an urn of native stone! Then thus umbricious, with an angry frown, and looking back on this degenerate town, since noble arts in Rome have no support, and ragged virtue not a friend at court, no profit rises from the ungrateful stage, my poverty increasing with my age, tis time to give my just disdain a vent, and cursing leave so base a government. Where Daedalus his borrowed wings laid by, to that obscure retreat I choose to fly. While yet furrows on my face are seen, while I walk upright, an old age is green, and Lechesis has somewhat left to spin. Now, now, tis time to quit this cursed place, and hide from villains my too honest face. Here let Arturius live, and such as he, such manners will with such a town agree. Knaves who in full assemblies have the knack of turning truth to lies and white to black, can hire large houses and oppress the poor, by farmed excise can cleanse the common shore, and rent the fishery, can bear the dead, and teach their eyes dissembled tears to shed, all this for gain, for gain they sell their very head. These fellows, see what fortune's power can do, were once the minstrels of a country show, followed the prizes through each paltry town, by trumpet cheeks and bloated faces known. But now, grown rich on drunken holy days, at their own cost exhibit public plays, where, influenced by the rabble's bloody will, with thumbs bent back they popularly kill. From thence return, their sordid avarice rakes, in excrements again, and hire the jakes. Why hire they not the town, not everything, since such as they have fortune in a string? Who for her pleasure can her fools advance, and toss em topmost on the wheel of chance? What's Rome to me? What business have I there? I, who can neither lie nor falsely swear, nor praise my patron's undeserving rhymes, nor yet comply with him, nor with his times. Unskilled in schemes by planets to foreshow, like canting rascals, how the walls will go, I neither will nor can prognosticate to the young gaping heir his father's fate, nor in the entrails of a toad have pride nor carried bawdy presents to a bride. For want of these town virtues, thus alone, I go conducted on my way by none, like a dead member from the body rent, maimed and unuseful to the government. Who now is loved but he who loves the times, conscious of close intrigues and dipped in crimes, labouring with secrets which his bosom burn, yet never must to public light return? They get reward alone, who can betray, for keeping honest counsels, none will pay. He who can veres, when he will accuse, the purse of veres may at pleasure use. But let not all the gold which Tagus hides, and pays the sea in tributary tides, be bribe sufficient to corrupt the breast, or violate with dreams thy peaceful rest. Great men with jealous eyes the friend behold, whose secrecy they purchase with their gold. I haste to tell thee, nor shall shame oppose what confidence our wealthy Romans chose, and whom I most abhor, to speak my mind, I hate in Rome a Grecian town to find. To see the scum of Greece transplanted here, received like gods, is what I cannot bear. Nor Greeks alone, but Syrians here abound, obscene Orontes diving underground, conveys his wealth to Tiber's hungry shores, and fattens Italy with foreign whores. Hither their crooked harps and customs come, all find receipt 
in hospitable Rome. The barbarous harlots crowd the public place, Go, fools, and purchase an unclean embrace, The painted mitre court, and the more painted face. Old Romulus and Father Mars look down, Your herdsman primitive, your homely clown, Is turned a bow in a loosely tawdy gown. His once unkempt and horrid locks, behold, Stilling sweet oil, his neck enchained with gold, Aping the foreigners in every dress, Which bought at greater cost, become him less. Meantime they wisely leave their native land, From Sion, Samus, and from Alaband, And Amadon, to Rome they swarm in shoals, So sweet and easy is the gain from fools. Poor refugees at first they purchase here, And soon as denizened they domineer, Grow to the great a flattering servile rout, Work themselves inwards and their patrons out. Quick-witted, brazen-faced, and fluent tongues, Patient of labours and dissembling wrongs, Riddle me this, and guess him if you can, Who bears a nation in a single man? A cook, a conjurer, a rhetorician, A painter, pedant, a geometrician, A dancer on the ropes, and a physician, All things the hungry Greek exactly knows, And bid him to heaven, to heaven he goes. In short, no Scythian, Moor, or Thracian born, But in that town which arms and arts adorn, Shall he be placed above me at the board, In purple clothed and lolling like a lord? Shall he before me sign, Whom t'other day a small craft vessel did hither convey, Where stowed with prunes and rotten figs he lay? How little is the privilege become Of being born a citizen of Rome? The Greeks get all by fulsome flatteries, A most peculiar stroke they have at lies, They make a wit of their insipid friend, His blobber lip and beetle brows commend, His long crane neck and narrow shoulders praise, You'd think they were describing Hercules. A creaking voice for a clear treble goes, Though harsher than a cock that treads and crows. He can as grossly praise, but to our grief, No flattery but from Grecians gains belief. Besides these qualities, we must agree, They mimic better on the stage than we. The wife, the whore, the shepherdess they play, In such a free and such a graceful way, That we believe a very woman shown, And fancy something underneath the gown. But not Antiochus nor Stratocles, Our ears and ravished eyes can only please, The nation is composed of such as these. All Greece is one comedian, laugh, and they return it louder than an ass can bray. Grieve, and they grieve. If you weep silently, there seems a silent echo in their eye. They cannot mourn like you, but they can cry. Call for a fire, their winter clothes they take. Begin but you to shiver, and they shake. In frost and snow, if you complain of heat, they rub the sweating brow, and swear they sweat. We live not on the square with such as these, Such are our betters who can better please, Who day and night are like a looking-glass, Still ready to reflect their patron's face. The panegyric hand and lifted eye, Prepared for some new piece of flattery. Even nastiness occasions will afford, They praise a belching or a well-pissing lord, Besides, there's nothing sacred, nothing free, From bold attempts of their rank lechery. Through the whole family their labours run, The daughter is debauched, the wife is won, Nor scapes the bridegroom, or the blooming sun. If none they find, for their lewd purpose fit, They with the walls and very floors commit. They search the secrets of the house, And so are worshipped there, and feared for what they know. And now we talk of Grecians, cast a view on what in schools their men of morals do. A rigid Stoic his own pupils slew, a friend against a friend of his own cloth, turned evidence and murdered on his oath. What room is left for Romans in a town where Grecians rule and cloaks control the gown? Some Diphilus or some Protogenes look sharply out, our senators to seize and grow some holy by their native art, and feared no rivals in their bubble's heart. One drop of poison in my patron's ear, one slight suggestion of a senseless fear, infused with cunning serves to ruin me. 
disgraced and banished from the family. In vain forgotten services I boast, my long dependence in an hour is lost. Look round the world what country will appear, where friends are left with greater ease than here. At Rome, nor think me partial to the poor, all offices of ours are out the door. In vain we rise, and to the levies run, my lord himself is up before and gone, the praetor bids his lictors mend their pace, lest his colleague outstrip him in the race. The childish matrons are long since awake, and for affronts the tardy visits take. Tis frequent here to see a free-born son on the left hand of a rich hireling run, because the wealthy rogue can throw away for half a brace of bouts a tribune's pay. But you, poor sinner, though you love the vice, and like the whore demur upon the price, and frighted with the wicked sum, forbear to lend a hand and help her from the chair. Produce a witness of unblemished life, holy as Numa, or as Numa's wife, or him who bid the unhallowed flames retire, and snatch the trembling goddess from the fire. The question is not put how far extends his piety, but what he yearly spends. Quick to the business, how he lives and eats, how largely gives, how splendidly he treats, how many thousand acres feed his sheep. What are his rents, what servants does he keep? The count is soon cast up, the judge's rate, our credit in the court by our estate. Swear by the gods, or those the Greeks adore, thou art as sure forsworn as thou art poor. The poor must gain their bread by perjury, and e'en the gods, that other means deny, in conscience must absolve them when they lie. Add that the rich have still the jibe in store, and will be monstrous witty on the poor. For the torn surtout and the tattered vest, the wretch and all his wardrobe are a jest. The greasy gown, sullied with often turning, gives a good hint to say, the man's in mourning. Or if the shoe be ripped, or patches put, he's wounded, see the plaster on his foot. Want is the scorn of every wealthy fool, and wit in rags is turned to ridicule. Pack hence, and from the covered benches rise, the master of the ceremonies cries. This is no place for you, whose small estate is not the value of a settled rate. The sons of happy punks, the pandar's heir, are privileged to sit in triumph there, to clap the first and rule the theatre, up to the galleries for shame retreat, for by the Ruskin law the poor can claim no seat. Whoever brought to his rich daughter's bed the man that polled but twelve pence for his head, whoever named a poor man for his heir, or called him to assist the judging chair, the poor were wise, who by the rich oppressed withdrew, and sought a sacred place of rest. Once they did well to free themselves from scorn, but had done better never to return. Rarely they rise by virtue's aid who lie, plunged in the depths of helpless poverty. At Rome tis worse, where house-rent by the year, and servants' bellies cost so devilish dear, and tavern-bills run high for hungry cheer. To drink or eat in earthenware we scorn, which cheaply country cupboards does adorn and coarse blue hoods on holy days are worn. Some distant parts of Italy are known, where none but only dead men wear a gown. On theatres of turf in homely state, old plays they act, old feasts they celebrate. The same rude song returns upon the crowd, and by tradition is for wit allowed. The mimic yearly gives the same delights, and in the mother's arms the clownish infant writes. Their habits, undistinguished by degree, are plain alike, the same simplicity, both on the stage and in the pit you see. In his white cloak the magistrate appears, the country bumpkin the same livery wears, but here attired beyond our purse we go, for useless ornament and flaunting show. We take on trust in purple robes to shine, and poor are yet ambitious to be fine. This is a common vice, though all things here are sold, and sold unconscionably dear. What will you give, that Cossus may but view your face, and in the crowd distinguish you, may take your incense like a gracious god, and answer only with a civil nod? To please our patrons in this vicious age, 
we make our entrance by the favourite page. Shave his first down, and when he pulls his hair, the consecrated locks to temples bear. Pay tributary cracknels, which he sells, and with our offerings help to raise his veils. Who fears in country towns a house's fall, or to be caught betwixt a riven wall? But we inhabit a weak city here, which buttresses and props but scarcely bear, and tis the village mason's daily calling to keep the world's metropolis from falling, to cleanse the gutters and the chinks to close, and, for one night, secure his lord's repose. At Kumai we can sleep quite round the year, nor falls, nor fires, nor nightly dangers fear, while rolling flames from Roman turrets fly, and the pale citizens for buckets cry. Thy neighbour has removed his wretched store, few hands will rid the lumber of the poor. Thy own third story smokes, while thou, supine, art drenched in fumes of undigested wine. For if the lowest floors already burn, cocklofts and garrets soon will take the turn. Where thy tame pigeons next the tiles were bred, which in their nests, unsafe, are timely fled. Codrus had but one bed, so short to boot that his wife's short legs hung dangling out. His cupboard's head six earthen pitchers graced, beneath them his trusty tankard placed, and, to support this noble plate, there lay a bending chiron cast from honest clay. His few Greek books a rotten chest contained, whose covers much of mouldiness complained, where mice and rats devoured poetic bread and with heroic verse luxuriously were fed. Tis true, poor Codrus, nothing had to boast, and yet poor Codrus, all that nothing lost, begged naked through the streets of wealthy Rome, and found not one to feed or take him home. But if the palace of Arturius burn, the nobles change their clothes, the matrons mourn, the city praetor will no pleadings hear, the very name of fire we hate and fear and look aghast as if the Gauls were here. While yet it burns, the vicious nation flies, some to condole and some to bring supplies. One sends him marble to rebuild, and one with naked statues of the Parian stone, the work of polyclity that seem to live, while other images for altars give. One books and screens and palace to the breast, another bags of gold and he gives best. Childless Arturius, vastly rich before, thus by his losses multiplies his store. Suspected for accomplice to the fire that burnt his palace, but to build it higher. But could you be content to bid adieu to the dear playhouse and the players too? Sweet country seats are purchased everywhere, with lands and gardens at less price than here you hire a darksome dog hole by the year. A small convenience decently prepared a shallow well that rises in your yard, that spreads his easy crystal streams around, and waters all the pretty spot of ground. There, loved fork, thy garden cultivate, and give thy frugal friends a Pythagorean treat. Tis somewhat to be lord of some small ground, in which a lizard may at least turn round. Tis frequent here, for want of sleep to die, which fumes of undigested feasts deny and with imperfect heat in languid stomachs fry. What house secure from noise the poor can keep, when even the rich can scarce afford to sleep, so dear it costs to purchase rest in Rome, and hence the sources of disease come. The drover, who his fellow drover meets, in narrow passages of winding streets, the wagoners that curse their standing teams, would wake even drowsy Drufus from his dreams. And yet the wealthy will not brook delay, But sweep above our heads and make their way, In lofty litters borne, and read and write, Or sleep at ease, the shutters make it night. Yet still he reaches first the public place, The prease before him stops the client's pace. The crowd that follows crush his panting sides, And trip his heels, he walks not, but he rides, One elbows him, one jostles in the shoal, a rafter breaks his head, or chairman's pole. Stockined with loads of fat, town dirt he goes, and some rogue soldier with his hobnailed shoes indents his legs behind in bloody rows. 
see with what smoke our dulls we celebrate. A hundred guests invited walk in state. A hundred hungry slaves with their Dutch kitchens wait. Huge pans the wretches on their head must bear, which scarce gigantic corbulo could rear. Yet they must walk upright beneath the load, nay run and running blow the sparkling flames abroad. Their coats from botching newly brought are torn, unwieldy timber trees in wagons borne, stretched at their length beyond their carriage lie, that nod and threaten ruin from on high, for should their axle break its overthrown, would crush and pound to dust the crowd below. Nor friends their friends, nor sires their sons could know, nor limbs, nor bones, nor carcass would remain, but a mashed heap, a hotchpotch of the slain. One vast destruction, not the soul alone, but, but bodies like the soul invisibly are flown. Meantime, unknowing of their fellow's fate, the servants wash the platter, scour the plate, then blow the fire with puffing cheeks, and lay the rubbers and the bathing sheets display, and oil them first, and each is handy in his way. But he, for whom this busy care they take, poor ghost is wandering by the Stygian lake. Affrighted with the ferryman's grim face, new to the horrors of that uncouth place, his passage begs with unregarded prayer, and wants two farthings to discharge his fare. Return we to the dangers of the night, and first behold our houses' dreadful height, from whence come broken potsherds tumbling down, and leaky ware from garret windows thrown. Well may they break our heads that mark the flinty stone. Tis want of sense to sup abroad too late, unless thou first hast settled thy estate. As many fates attend thy steps to meet, as there are waking windows in the street. Bless the good gods, and think thy chances rare to have a piss-pot only for thy share. The scouring drunkard, if he does not fight, before his bedtime takes no rest that night. Passing the tedious hours in greater pain than stern Achilles when his friend was slain. Tis so ridiculous, but so true withal, a bully cannot sleep without a brawl. Yet, though his youthful blood be fired with wine, he wants not wit the danger to decline, is cautious to avoid the coach and six, and on the lackeys will no quarrel fix. His train of flambeau and embroidered coat may privilege my lord to walk secure on foot. But me, who must by moonlight homeward bend, or lighted only with a candle's end, poor me he fights, if that be fighting, where he only cuddles and I only bear. He stands and bids me stand, I must abide, for he's the stronger and drunk beside. Where did you wet your knife to-night, he cries, and shred the leeks that in your stomach rise? Whose windy beans has stuffed your guts, and where have your black thumbs been dipped in vinegar? With what companion cobbler have you fed an old ox cheeks or he goat's tougher head? What are you dumb? Quick with your answer, quick, before my foot salutes you with a kick. Say in what nasty cellar underground, or what church porch your rogueship may be found. Answer or answer not, tis all the same, he lays me on and makes me bear the blame. Before the bar, for beating him you come, this is a poor man's liberty in Rome. You beg his pardon, happy to retreat, with some remaining teeth to chew your meat. Nor is this all, for when retired you think to sleep securely when the candles wink, when every door with iron chains is barred, and roaring taverns are no longer heard. The ruffian robbers by no justice awed, and unpaid cutthroat soldiers are abroad, those venal souls who harden by each ill, to save complaints and prosecution kill. Chased from their woods and bogs, the padders come, to this vast city as their native home, to live at ease and safely skulk in Rome. The forge in fetters only is employed, our iron mines exhausted and destroyed, in shackles, for these villains scarce allow goads for the team, ploughshares for the plough. O oh, happy ages of our ancestors beneath the kings and tribunitial powers! One jail did all their criminals restrain, which now the walls of Rome can scarce contain. 
More I could say, more causes I could show for my departure, but the sun is low. The wagoner grows weary of my stay, and whips his horses forwards on their way. Farewell, and when, like me, o'erwhelmed with care, you to your own aquinum shall repair, to take a mouthful of sweet country air, be mindful of your friend, and send me word. What joys your fountains and cool shades afford, then to assist your satires, I will come and add new venom when you write of Rome. End of the third satire. The fourth satire of Decimus Junius Juvenalis, translated by Mr. John Dryden and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Nicholas Hillier, Wiltshire, England, December 2023. The Fourth Satire, translated by the Reverend Mr. Richard Duke. The Argument The poet in this satire first brings in Crispinus, whom he had a lash at in his first satire, and whom he promises here not to be forgetful of for the future. He exposes his monstrous prodigality in luxury in giving the price of an estate for a barbell, and from thence takes occasion to introduce the principal subject and true design of this satire, which is grounded upon a ridiculous story of a turbot presented to Domitian of so vast a bigness that all the emperor's scullery had not a dish large enough to hold it, upon which the senate, in all haste, is summoned to consult in this exigency what is fittest to be done. The poet gives us particular of the senators' names, their distinct characters, and speeches and advice, and after much and wise consultation an expedient being found out and agreed upon, he dismisses the senate and concludes the satire. The Fourth Satire Once more Crispinus, called upon the stage, not shall once more suffice, provokes my rage, a monster to whom every vice lays claim, without one virtue to redeem his fame. Feeble and sick, yet strong in lust alone, the rank adulterer preys on all the town. All but the widow's nauseous charms go down. What matter then how stately is the arch, where his tired mules flow with their burden march? What matter then how thick and long the shade, through which by sweating slaves he is conveyed? How many acres near the city walls, or new-built palaces, his own he calls? No ill man's happy, least of all is he, whose study tis to corrupt chastity. The incestuous brute, who the veiled vestal made, but lately to his impious bed betrayed. Who, for her crime, if laws their course might have, ought to descend alive into the grave. But now, of slighter faults, and yet the same, by others done the censors justice claim. For what good men ignoble count and base, Virtue here and does Crispinus grace, In this he's safe, whate'er we write of him, The person is more odious than the crime. And so all satires lost, The lavish slave six thousand pieces for a barbell gave, A cisterce for each pound it weighed, As they give out, that hear great things, but greater say. If by this bribe well placed he would ensnare some sapless usurer that wants an heir, or if this present the sly courtier meant, should to some punk of quality be sent, that in her easy chair in state does ride, the glasses all drawn up on every side. I'd praise his cunning, but expect not this, for his own gut he bought the stately fish. Now even Apicius frugal seems, and poor, at vied in luxury unknown before. Gave you, Crispinus, you this mighty sum, you that for want of other rags did come, in our own country paper wrapped to Rome. Do scales and fins bear price to this excess? You might have bought the fishermen for less. For less some provinces whole acres sell, nay, in Apulia, if you bargain well, a manor could cost less than such a meal. What think we then of his luxurious lord? What banquets loaded that imperial board? 
when in one dish that taken from the rest his constant table would have hardly missed so many sesterces were swallowed down to stuff one scarlet coated court buffoon whom rome of all her knights now chiefest greets from crying stinking fish about the streets begin calliope but not to sing plain honest truth we for our subject bring help then ye young puran maids to tell a downright narrative of what befell afford me willingly your sacred aids me that have called you young me that have styled you maids when he with whom the flavian race decayed the groaning world with iron sceptres swayed when a bald nero reigned and servile rome obeyed where venus's shrine does fair ancona grace a turbot taken of prodigious space filled the extended net not less than those that dull meotis does with ice enclose till conquered by the sun's prevailing ray it opens to the pontic sea their way and throws them out unwieldy with their growths fat with long ease and a whole winter's sloth the wise commander of the boat and lines for our high priest the stately prey designs for who that lordly fish durst sell or buy so many spies and court informers nigh no shore but of this vermin swarms does bear searchers of mud seaweed that would swear the fish had long in caesar's ponds been fed and from its lord undutifully fled so justly ought to be again restored nay if you credit sage palfurus's word or dare rely on armilatus's skill whatever fish the vulgar fry excel belong to caesar wheresoe'er they swim by their own worth confiscated to him the boatman then shall a wise present make and give the fish before the caesars take now sickly autumn to dry frosts gave way cold winter raged and fresh preserved the prey yet with such haste the busy fishes flew as if a hot south wind corruption blew and now he reached the lake where what remains of alba still her ancient rites retains still worships vesta though an humbler way nor lets the hallowed trojan fire decay the wandering crowd that to strange sights resort and choked awhile his passage to the court at length gives way ope flies the palace gate the turbot enters in without the father's weight the boatman straight does to astrides press and thus presents his fish and his address accept dread sir this tribute from the main too great for private kitchens to contain to your glad genius sacrifice this day let common meats respectfully give way haste to unload your stomachs to receive this turbot that for you did only live so long preserved to be imperial food glad of the net and to be taken proud how fulsome this how gross yet this takes well and the vain prince with empty pride does swell nothing so monstrous can be said or feigned but with belief and joy is entertained when to his face the worthless wretch is praised whom vile court flattery to a god has raised but oh hard fate the palace stores no dish afford capacious of the mighty fish to sage debate are summoned all the peers his trusty and much hated counsellors in whose pale looks that ghastly terror fat that haunts the dangerous friendship of the great the loud liburnium that the senate called run run he's set he's set no sooner bold but with his robe snatched up in haste does come pegasus bailiff of affrighted rome what more were prefects then the best he was and faithfulest expounder of the laws yet in ill times thought all things managed best when justice exercised her sword the least old crispus next pleasant though old appears his wit nor humour yielding to his years his temper mild good nature joined with sense and manners charming as his eloquence who fitter for a useful friend than he to the great ruler of the earth and sea if as his thoughts were just his tongue were free if it were safe to vent his generous mind to rome's dire plague the terror of mankind 
if cruel power could softening counsel bear, but what's so tender as a tyrant's ear? With whom, whoever, though a favourite spake, at every sentence set his life at stake, though the discourse were of no weightier things than sultry summers or unhealthy springs. This well he knew, and therefore never tried, with his weak arms to stem the stronger tide, nor did all Rome, grown spiritless, supply a man that for bold truth durst bravely die. So safe, by wise complying silence, he, in in that court, did fourscore summers see. Next him, Achilles, though his age the same, with eager haste to the grand council came. With him a youth unworthy of the fate, that did too near his growing virtues wait. Urged by the tyrant's envy, fear, or hate, but his long since old age began to be in noble blood no less than prodigy. Whence tis I'd rather be of giant's birth, a pygmy brother to those sons of earth. Unhappy youth, whom from his destined end no well-dissembled madness could defend, when naked in the Alban theatre, in Libyan bears he fixed his hunting spear. Who sees not now through the Lord's thin disguise that long seemed fools do prove at last more wise? That state court trick is now too open laid. Who now admires the part old Brutus played? Those honest times might swallow this pretense when the king's beard was deeper than his sense. Next Rubrius came, though not of noble race, with the equal marks of terror in his face, pale with the gnawing guilt and inward shame of an old crime that is not fit to name, worse, yet in scandal taking more delight than the vile Catholic that durst satyr write. Montanus's belly next advancing slow, before the sweating senator did go, Crispinus after but much sweeter comes, scented with costly oils and eastern gums, more than would serve two funerals for perfumes. Then Pompey, none more skilled in the court game of cutting throats, with a soft whisper came. Next Fuscus, he who many a peaceful day for Dacian vultures was reserved a prey. Till having studied war enough at home, he led abroad the unhappy arms of Rome. Cunning Vigento next, and by his side, bloody Catullus, leaning on his guide. Decrepit yet a furious lover he, and deeply smit with charms he could not see. A monster that even this worst age out vies, conspicuous and above the common size. A blind base flatterer, whom from some bridge or gate, raised to a murdering minister of state deserving still to beg upon the road and bless each passing wagon and its load. None more admired the fish, he in its praise, with zeal his voice, with zeal his hands did raise. But to the left all his fine things did say, whilst on his right the unseen turbot lay. So he the famed Cilician fencer praised, and at each hit with wonder seemed amazed. So did the scenes and stage machines admire, and boys that flew through canvas clouds in wire. Nor came Vigento short, but as inspired by thee, Bellona, by thy fury fired, turns prophet, see the mighty omen, see, he cries of some illustrious victory. Some captive king, thee his new lord shall own, or from his British chariot headlong thrown. The proud Arviragus come tumbling down. The monsters foreign mark the pointed spears that from thy hand on his pierced back he wears. Who nobler could or plainer things presage? Yet one thing scaped him the prophetic rage, showed not the turbot's country nor its age. At length by Caesar the grand questions put, My lords, your judgment shall the fish be cut? Far be it, far from us, Montanus cries, Let's not dishonour thus the noble prize. A pot of finest earth, thin, deep, and wide, Some skilful quick Prometheus must provide. Play and the forming wheel prepare with speed, But Caesar, be it from henceforth decreed, That potters on the royal progress wait, To assist in these emergencies of state. 
This counsel pleased, nor could it fail to take, So fit, so worthy of the man that spake. The old court riots he remembered well, Could tales of Nero's midnight suppers tell. When Fallon wines the labouring lungs did fire, And two new dainties kindled false desire. In arts of eating none more early trained, None in my time had equal skill attained. He, whether Circe's rock or his oysters bore, Or Lucrine Lake, or the Rutupian shore, Knew at first taste, nay, at first sight could tell, A crab or lobster's country by its shell. They rise, and straight all with respectful awe, At the word given, obsequiously withdraw. Whom full of eager haste, surprise, and fear, Our mighty prince had summoned to appear as if some news he'd of the catty tell, or that the fierce Sicambrians did rebel, as if expresses from all parts had come, with fresh alarms threatening the fate of Rome. What folly this, but oh, that all the rest of his dire reign had thus been spent in jest, and all that time such trifles had employed, in which so many nobles he destroyed. He safe they unrevenged, to the disgrace of the surviving tame patrician race. But when he dreadful to the rabble grew, him whom so many lords had slain, they slew. End of the fourth satire. The fifth satire of Decimus Junius Juvenalis, translated by John Dryden and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Nicholas Hillier, Wiltshire, England, December 2023. The Fifth Satire. Translated by the Reverend Mr. William Bowles. The Argument. The poet dissuades a parasite from frequenting the tables of great men, where he is certain to be treated with the highest scorn and contempt, and at the same time inveighs against the luxury and insolence of the Roman nobility. If hardened by affronts, and still the same, Lost to all sense of honour and of shame, Thou yet canst love to haunt the great man's board, And think no supper good but with a lord. If yet thou canst hold out, and suffer more Than lewds, sarmentus, or vile galba bore, Thy solemn oath ought to be set aside, But sure the bell is easily supplied. Suppose what frugal nature would suffice, Suppose that wanting, hunger is not nice. Is no bridge vacant, no convenient seat, Where thou mayst cringe and gnaw thy broken meat? And with a mat and crutch and tied-up leg More honestly and honourably beg? First, if he pleases to say, sit down and smile, Behold the full reward of all thy toil. All thy old services are largely paid, And thou a proud and happy man art made. See, of thy boasted friendship, see the fruits, And these too he upbraids, and these imputes. If after two cold months thy lord think fit, His poor neglected client to admit, And say, sup with me, thou hast thy desire, Be thankful, mortal, and no more require. Thus blessed must Trebius to his levies run, When the stars languish near the rising sun. Break off sweet slumbers, drowsy and undressed, To show his zeal, and to prevent the rest. Run to prevent the fawning humble train, While slow Boetes drives his frozen wain. Perhaps the generous entertainment may For all the state and dear attendants pay. For him is kept a liquor more divine. You sponges must be drunk with lees of wine, Drunk for your patron's pleasure and his jest, then raving like a Coribus possessed. Thou and the freedmen first begin to jar, from mutual jeers the prelude to the war. Thou and thy fellow parasites engage, and battle with a troop of servants wage. Then glasses and saguntine pitchers fly, and broken pates discoloured napkins die. While happy he, stretched on his couch supine, Looks on with scorn, and drinks old generous wine, Pressed from the grape, when warlike Rome was free, But kindly never sends one glass to thee. Perhaps to-morrow he may change his wine, And drink old sparking alban or satine. 
whose title and whose age, with mould o'er grown, the good old cask forever keeps unknown. Such bold Helvidius drank, and Thrasse crowned, with garlands when the flowing bowl went round, on Brutus's birthday, and to raise delight, to please at once the taste and charm the sight. He in bright amber drinks, or brighter gold, and cups with shining barrels set does hold. Thou art not suffered, or to touch or taste, and if thou dost, a guard on thee is placed, to watch the gems. This may perhaps surprise, but, sir, you'll pardon, they are stones of price. For Viro does, as many do of late, gems from his fingers to his cups translate, which the bold youth, to Dido's love preferred, wore on the scabbard of his shining sword. Thou mayst at distance gaze, and sigh in vain, a cracked black pot's reserved for thee to drain. If his blood boil, and the adventitious fire raised by high meats and higher wines require, to temper and allay the burning heat, waters are brought, which by decoction get new coolness, such plain nature does not know. Not ice so cool, nor hyperboean snow, did I complain but now, and justly too, that the same wine is not allowed to you? Another water's reached you, when you call from hands of Moorish footmen, lean and tall. The grim attendance he assigns to fright, rather than wait rogues who would scare by night. If met among the tombs, the ghastly slaves look as if newly started from their graves. Before himself the flower of Asia stands to watch his looks and to receive commands. A boy of such a price has had undone old Roman kings, and drained the treasure of a crown. If thou or any of thy tribe want wine, look back and give the Ganymedes the sign. The lovely boy, and bought at such a rate, is much too handsome and too proud to wait on the despised and poor. Will he descend to give a glass to a declining friend? No, his good mien, his youth, and blooming face, tempt him to think that with a better grace himself might sit, and thou supply his place. Behold, there yet remains, which must be borne, proud servants more insufferable scorn. With what disdain another gave thee bread? The meanest wretches are with better fed. The impenetrable crust thy teeth defies, and petrified with age securely lies hard, mouldy, black, if thou presume to invade with sacrilegious hands thy patron's bread, there stands a servant ready to chastise your insolence and teach you to be wise. Will you, a bold intruder, never learn to know your basket and your bread discern? Tis just, ye gods, and what I well deserve, why did I not more honourably starve? Did I for this abandon wife and bed? For this, alas, by vain ambition led, through cold Esquilii run so oft and bare the storms and fury of the vernal air, and then with cloak wet through a tender and dropping hair. See by the tallest servant borne on high, a sturgeon fills the largest dish and eye. With how much pomp he's placed upon the board, with what a tail and breast salutes his lord with what expense and art, how richly dressed, garnished with asparagus, himself a feast. Thou art, to one small dismal dish confined, a crab ill-dressed, and of the vilest kind. He, on his own fish, pours the noblest oil, the product of Venatrum's happy soil. That to your marsid dying herbs assigned, by the rank smell and taste betrays its kind. By moors imported and for lamps alone designed, well rubbed with this, when Bocca comes to town, he makes the theatre and the baths his own. All round from him, as from the infected run, the poisonous stink, even their own serpents shun. Behold a mullet, even from Corfu brought, or near the rocks of Harominium caught, since our own seas no longer can supply, exhausted by our boundless luxury, the secret deep can no protection give, no tyrian fish is suffered now to live, to his just growth 
the provinces from far furnish our kitchens and revenge our war. Baits for the rich and childless they supply, Aurelia thence must sell and Lemus buy. The largest lamprey which their seas afford is made a sacrifice to Viro's board. When Auster and the Leolian caves retires, with dropping wings and murmuring there respires, rash daring nets in hope of such a prize, Charybdis and the treacherous deep despise. An eel for you remains in Tiber bred, with foulest mud and the rank ordure fed. Discharged by common shores from all the town, no secret passage was to him unknown. In every noisome sink the serpents slept, and through dark vaults oft to Sabura crept. One word to Viro now, if he can bear, and tis a truth which he's not used to hear. No man expects, for who so much a sot who has the times he lives in so forgot? What Seneca, what Piso used to send, to raise or to support a sinking friend? Those godlike men, to wanting virtue kind, bounty well placed preferred and well designed, to all their titles, all that height of power, which turns the brains of fools and fools alone adore. When your poor client is condemned to tend, tis all we ask, receive him like a friend. At least let him be easy, if you can, let him be treated like a free-born man. Descend to this, and then we ask no more, rich to yourself, to all beside be poor. Near him is placed the liver of a goose, that part alone which luxury would choose, a boar entire and worthy of the sword, of Meliga smokes upon the board. Next mushrooms larger when the clouds descend, in fruitful showers, and desired thunders rend the vernal air, no more plough up the ground of, of Libya, where such mushrooms can be found. Alidius cries, but furnish us with store of mushrooms, and import thy corn no more. Meanwhile thy indignation yet to raise, the carver dancing round each dish surveys, with flying knife, and as his art directs, with proper gestures every fowl dissects. A thing of so great moment to their taste, that one false slip had surely marred the feast. If thou dare murmur, if thou dare complain, with freedom like a Roman gentleman, Thou'rt seized immediately by his command, And dragged, like Cacus, by Herculean hands, Out from his presence, When does haughty he descend To take a glass once touched by thee? That wretch were lost, Who should presume to think He might be free, Who durst say, Come, sir, drink. Will any freedom here from you be born, Whose clothes are threadbare, And whose cloaks are torn? Would any god or godlike man below four hundred thousand sesterci bestow? How mightily would Trebius be improved, how much a friend to Viro, how beloved! Wilt Trebius eat of this, what sot attends, my brother, who carves to my best of friends? O sesterci, this honour's done to you, you are his friends, and you his brethren too. Wouldst thou become his patron and his lord? Wouldst thou be in thy turn by him adored? No young Aeneas in thy hall must play, Nor sweeter daughter lead thy heart astray. O oh, how a barren wife does recommend! How dear, how pleasant is a childless friend! But if thy Mycale, thy teeming wife, Pour out three boys the comfort of thy life, He too will in the prattling nest rejoice, Farthings and nuts provide, and various toys For the young smiling parasites, the wanton boys. He, viler friends, with doubtful mushrooms treats, Secure for you himself champignon eats. Such Claudius loved, of the same sort and taste, Till Agrippina kindly gave the last. To him are ordered, and those happy few, Whom fate has raised above contempt, and you, most fragrant fruits such in Ephesian gardens grew, where a perpetual autumn ever smiled, and golden apples loaded branches filled. By such swift Atlanta was betrayed, the vegetable gold soon stopped the flying maid. 
To you such scabbed harsh fruit is given, As raw young soldiers at their exercisings gnaw, Who trembling learn to throw the fatal dart, And under rods of rough centurions smart. Thou takest all this as done to save expense, No, tis on purpose done to give offence. What comedy, what farce can more delight Than grinning hunger, and the pleasing sight Of your bilked hopes? No, he's resolved to extort tears from your eyes, his barbarous jest and sport. Thou think'st thyself companion of the great, art free and happy in thy own conceit. He thinks thou tempted by the attractive smell of his warm kitchen, and he judges well. For who so naked in whose empty veins one single drop of noble blood remains? What freeborn man, who, though of mongrel strain, would twice support the scorn and proud disdain with which those idols you adore, the great their wretched vassals and dependents treat. O slaves most abject, you still gaping sit, devouring with your eyes each pleasing bit. Now sure we parasites at last shall share that boar, and now that wildfowl or that hare. Thus you expecting gaze with your teeth set, with your bread ready and your knives well wet, demure and silent, but alas, in vain, he mocks your hunger and derides your pain. If you can bear all this and think him kind, you well deserve the treatment which you find. At last thou wilt beneath the burthen bow, and glad receive the manumitting blow on thy shaved slavish head. Meanwhile attend, worthy of such a treat and such a friend. End of Satire 5The Sixth Satire of the Satires of Decimus Junius Juvenalis Translated by John Dryden and others This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Nicholas Hillier, Wiltshire, England December 2023 the sixth satire the argument this satire of almost double length to any of the rest is a bitter invective against the fair sex tis indeed a commonplace from whence all the moderns have notoriously stolen their sharpest railleries in his other satires the poet has only glanced on some particular women and generally scourged the men but this he reserved wholly for the ladies how they had offended him i know not but upon the whole matter he is not to be excused for imputing to all the vices of some few amongst them neither was it generously done of him to attack the weakest as well as the fairest part of the creation neither do i know what moral he could reasonably draw from it it could not be to avoid the whole sex if all had been true which he alleges against them for that had been to put an end to humankind. And to bid us beware of their artifices is a kind of silent acknowledgement that they have more wit than men, which turns the satire upon us, and particularly upon the poet, who thereby makes a compliment where he meant a libel. If he intended only to exercise his wit, he has forfeited his judgment by making the one half of his readers his mortal enemies and amongst the men all the happy lovers by their own experience will disprove his accusations the whole world must allow this to be the wittiest of his satires and truly he had need of all his parts to maintain with so much violence so unjust a charge i am satisfied he will bring but few over to his opinion and on that consideration chiefly i ventured to translate him though there wanted not another reason which was that no one else would undertake it at least sir c s who could have done more right to the author after a long delay at length absolutely refused so ungrateful an employment and every one will grant that the work must have been imperfect and lame if it had appeared without one of the principal members belonging to it let the poet therefore bear the blame of his own invention and let me satisfy the world that i am not of his opinion whatever his roman ladies were the english are free from all his imputations 
They will read with wonder and abhorrence the vices of an age which was the most infamous of any on record. They will bless themselves when they behold their examples related of Domitian's time. They will give back to antiquity those monsters it produced, and believe with reason that the species of those women is extinguished, or, at least, that they were never here propagated. I may safely therefore proceed to the argument of a satire which is in no way relating to them, and first observe that my author makes their lust the most heroic of their vices. The rest are in a manner but digression. He skims them over, but he dwells on this, when he seems to have taken his last leave of it, on a sudden he returns to it. Tis one branch of it in Hippa, another in Messalina, but lust is the main body of the tree. He begins with this text in the first line, and takes it up with intermissions to the end of the chapter. Every vice is a loader, but that's a ten. The fillers, or intermediate parts, are their revenge, their contrivances of secret crimes, their arts to hide them, their wit to excuse them, and their impudence to own them, when they can no longer be kept secret. Then the person to whom they are most addicted, and on whom they commonly bestow the last favours, as stage-players, fiddlers, singing-boys, and fencers. Those who pass for chaste amongst them are not really so, but only for their own vast dowries are rather suffered than loved by their own husbands. That they are imperious, domineering, scolding wives, set up for learning and criticism in poetry, but are false judges. Love to speak Greek, which was then the fashionable tongue as French is now with us, that they plead courses at the bar, and play prizes at the bear garden that they are gossips and newsmongers, wrangle with their neighbours abroad, and beat their servants at home, that they lie in for new faces once a month, are sluttish with their husbands in private, and paint and dress in public for their lovers, that they deal with Jews, diviners, and fortune-tellers, learn the arts of miscarrying and barrenness, buy children, and produce them for their own, murder their husbands' sons if they stand in their way to his estate, and make their adulterers his heirs. From hence the poet proceeds to show the occasions of all these vices, their original, and how they were introduced in Rome, by peace, wealth, and luxury. In conclusion, if we will take the word of our malicious author, bad women are the general standing rule, and the good, but some few exceptions to it. In Saturn's reign, at nature's early birth, there was that thing called chastity on earth. When in a narrow cave their common shade, the sheep, the shepherds, and their gods were laid. When reeds and leaves and hides of beasts were spread by mountain housewives for their homely bed, and mossy pillows raised for the rude husband's head. Unlike the niceness of our modern dames, affected nymphs, and with newly affected names, the Cynthias and the Lesbias of our years, who for a sparrow's death dissolve in tears. Those first unpolished matrons, big and bold, gave suck to infants of gigantic mould, rough as their savage lords who ranged the wood, and fat with acorns belched their windy food. For when the world was buxom, fresh and young, her sons were undebauched, and therefore strong. And whether born in kindly beds of earth, or struggling from the teeming oaks to birth, or from what other atoms they begun, no sires they had, or if a sire, the son. Some thin remains of chastity appeared, even under Jove, but Jove without a beard. Before the servile Greeks had learned to swear by heads of kings while yet the bounteous year, her common fruits in open plains exposed, ere thieves were feared, or gardens were enclosed. At length uneasy justice upwards flew, and both the sisters to the stars withdrew, and from that old era whoring did begin, so venerably ancient is the sin. Adulterers next invade the nuptial state, and marriage-beds creaked with a foreign weight. All other ills did iron times adorn, but whores and silver in one age were born. 
Yet thou, they say, for marriage dost provide in this age to buckle with a bride? They say, thy hair, the curling art is taught, the wedding ring perhaps already bought. A sober man like thee to change his life, what fury would possess thee with a wife? Art thou of every other death bereft? No knife, no rat's bane, no kind halter left? For every noose compared to hers is cheap. Is there no city bridge from whence to leap? Wouldst thou become her drudge, Who dost enjoy a better sort of bedfellow, thy boy? He keeps thee not awake with nightly brawls, Nor with a begged reward thy pleasure palls, Nor with insatiate heavings calls for more When all thy spirits were drained out before. But still Assidius courts the marriage bait, Longs for a son to settle his estate, and takes no gifts, though every gaping heir would gladly grease the rich old bachelor. What revolution can appear so strange as such a lecher, such a life to change? A rank notorious whoremaster to choose to thrust his neck into the marriage news? He who so often in a dreadful fright had in a coffer scaped the jealous cuckold sight, that he to wedlock dotingly betrayed, should hope in this lewd town to find a maid. The man's grown mad, to ease his frantic pain, run for the surgeon, breathe the middle vein, but let a heifer with gilt horns be led to Juno, regent of the marriage bed, and let him every deity adore, if his new bride prove not an arrant whore, in head and tail, and every other paw. On Ceres's feast, restraint from their delight, few matrons there but curse the tedious night. Few whom their fathers dare salute, such lust their kisses have, and come with such a gust. With ivy now adorn thy doors, and wed such is thy bride, and such are thy genial bed. Think'st thou one man is for one woman meant? She sooner with one eye would be content. And yet tis noised a maid did once appear In some small village, though fame says not where. Tis possible, but sure no man she found. Twas desert all about her father's ground. And yet some lustful god might there make bold, Are Jove and Mars grown impotent and old? Many a fair nymph has in a cave been spread, And much good love without a feather bed. Whither wouldst thou to choose a wife resort? The park, the ball, the playhouse, or the court? Which way soever thy adventures fall, Secure alike of chastity in all. One sees a dancing-master capering high, And raves and pisses with pure ecstasy. Another does with all his motions move, And gapes and grins as in the feet of love, a third is charmed with the new opera notes, admires the song, but on the singer dotes. The country lady in the box appears, softly she warbles over all she hears, and sucks in passion both at eyes and ears. The rest, when now the long vacations come, the noisy hall and theatres grown dumb, their memories to refresh and cheer their hearts, in borrowed breeches act the players' parts. The poor, that scarce have wherewithal to eat, Will pinch to make the singing boy a treat. The rich to buy him will refuse no price, And stretch his quail-pipe till they crack his voice. Tragedians acting love for lust are sought, Though but the parrots of a poet's thought. The pleading lawyer, though for counsel used, In chamber practice often is refused, Still thou wilt have a wife, and father heirs, the product of concurring theatres. Perhaps a fencer did thy brows adorn, and a young swordsman to thy lands is born. Thus Hippia loathed her old patrician lord, and left him for a brother of the sword. To wandering Pharos, and her love she fled, to show one monster more than Afric bred. Forgetting house and husband left behind, even children, too, she sails before the wind, False to em all, but constant to her kind. But stranger yet, and harder to conceive, She could the playhouse and the players leave. Born of rich parentage and nicely bred, She lodged on down and in a damask bed. 
Yet daring now the dangers of the deep, On a hard mattress is content to sleep. Ere this tis true, she did her fame expose, And that great ladies with great ease can lose. The tender nymph could the rude ocean bear, So much her lust was stronger than her fear. But had some honest cause her passage pressed, The smallest hardship had disturbed her breast. Each inconvenience makes their virtue cold, But womankind in ills is ever bold. Were she to follow her own lord to see, What doubts or scruples would she raise to stay? Her stomach sick and her head giddy grows, The tar and pitch are nauseous to her nose. But in love's voyage nothing can offend, Women are never seasick with a friend. Amidst the crew she walks upon the board, She eats, she drinks, she handles every cord, And if she spews, tis thinking of her lord. Now ask, for whom her friends and fame she lost. What youth, what beauty, could the adulterer boast? What was the face for which she could sustain To be called mistress to so base a man? The gallant of his days had known the best, Deep scars were seen indented on his breast, And all his battered limbs required their needful rest. A promontory when, with griefly grace, Stood high upon the handle of his face. His blear eyes ran in gutters to his chin, His beard was stubble, and his cheeks were thin. But twas his fencing did her fancy move, Tis arms and blood and cruelty they love. But should he quit his trade and sheath his sword, Her lover would begin to be her lord. This was a private crime, but you shall hear what fruits the sacred brows of monarchs bear. The good old sluggard but began to snore, when from his side up rose the imperial whore, she who preferred the pleasures of the night to pomps that are but impotent delight, strode from the palace with an eager pace to cope with a more masculine embrace. Muffled she marched like Juno in a cloud, of all her train but one poor wench allowed, one whom in secret service she could trust, the rival and companion of her lust. To the known brothel house she takes away, and for a nasty room gives double pay, that room in which the rankest harlot lay. Prepared for fight, expectingly she lies, with heaving breast and with desiring eyes. Still as one drops, another takes his place, And baffled still succeeds to like disgrace. At length, when friendly darkness is expired, And every strumpet from her cell retired, She lags behind, and lingering at the gate, With a repining sigh, submits to fate. All filth without, and all afire within, Tired with the toil, unsated with the sin. Old Caesar's bed the modest matron seeks, The steam of lamps still hanging on her cheek. In ropey smut thus foul, and thus bedight, She brings him back the product of the night. Now should I sing what poisons they provide, With all their trumpery of charms beside, And all their arts of death, it would be known, Lust is the smallest sin the sex can own. Cecinia, still, they say, is guiltless found, Of every vice, by her own lord renowned, And well she may, she bought ten thousand pound. She brought him wherewithal to be called chaste, His tongue is tied in golden fetters fast, He sighs, adores, and courts her every hour, Who would not do as much for such a dower. She writes love-letters to the youth in grace, Nay, tips the wink before the cuckold's face, and might do more, her portion makes it good, Wealth has the privilege of widowhood. These truths with his example you disprove, Who with his wife is monstrously in love, But know him better, for I heard him swear, Tis not that she's his wife, but that she's fair. Let her but have three wrinkles in her face, Let her eyes lessen, and her skin unbrace, Soon you will hear the saucy steward say, Back up with all your trinkets, and away! You grow offensive both at bed and board, Your betters must be had to please my lord. Meantime she's absolute upon the throne, And knowing time is precious, loses none. 
she must have flocks of sheep with wool more fine than silk and vineyards of the noblest wines whole droves of pages for her train she craves and sweeps the prisons for attending slaves in short whatever in her eyes can come or others have abroad she wants at home when winter shuts the seas and fleecy snows make houses white she to the merchant goes rich crystals of the rock she takes up there huge agate vases and old china ware then berenice's ring her finger proves more precious made by her incestuous loves and infamously dear a brother's bribe even god's anointed and of judah's tribe where barefoot they approach the sacred shrine and think it only sin to feed on swine but is none worthy to be made a wife in all this town suppose her free from strife rich fair and fruitful of unblemished life chaste as the sabines whose prevailing charms dismissed their husbands and their brothers arms grant her besides of noble blood that ran in ancient veins ere heraldry began suppose all these and take a poet's word a black swan is not half so rare a bird a wife so hung with virtues such a freight what mortal shoulders could support the weight some country girl scarce to a curtsy bred would i much rather than cornelia wed if supercilious haughty proud and vain she brought her father's triumphs in her train away with all your carthaginian state let vanquished hannibal without doors wait too burly and too big to pass my narrow gate o pen cries amphion bend thy bow against my wife and let my children go but sullen pen shoots at sons and mothers too his niobe and all his boys he lost even her who did her numerous offspring boast as fair and fruitful as the sow that carried the thirty pigs at one large litter farrowed what beauty or what chastity can bear so great a price if stately and severe she still insults and you must still adore grant that the honey is much the gall is more upbraided with the virtues she displays seven hours in twelve you loathe the wife you praise some faults though small intolerable grow for what's so nauseous and affected too as those that think they do perfection want who have not learnt to lisp the grecian cant in greece their whole accomplishments they seek their fashion breeding language must be greek but raw in all that does to rome belong they scorn to cultivate their mother tongue in greek they flatter all their fears they speak tell all their secrets nay they scold in greek even in the feet of love they use that tongue such affectations may become the young but thou old hag of threescore years and three is showing of thy parts in greek for thee zoixi psihi all those tender words the momentary trembling bliss affords the kind soft murmurs of the private sheets are bawdy while thou speak'st in public streets those words have fingers and their force is such they raise the dead and mount him with a touch but all provocatives from thee are vain no blandishment the slackened nerve constrain if then thy lawful spouse thou canst not love what reason should thy mind to marriage move why all the charges of the nuptial feast wine and desserts and sweetmeats to digest then dying gold that buys the dear delight given for their first and only happy night if thou art thus uxoriously inclined to bear thy bondage with a willing mind prepare thy neck and put it in the yoke but for no mercy from thy woman look for though perhaps she loves with equal fires to absolute dominion she aspires joys in the spoils and triumphs o'er thy purse the better husband makes the wife the worse nothing is thine to give or sell or buy all offices of ancient friendship die 
nor hast thou leave to make a legacy by thy imperious wife thou art bereft a privilege to pimps and panders left thy testaments her will where she prefers her ruffians drudges and adulterers adopting all thy rivals for thy heirs go drag that slave to death your reason why should the poor innocent be doomed to die what proofs for when man's life is in debate the judge can ne'er too long deliberate call'st thou that slave a man the wife replies proved or unproved the crime the villain dies i have the sovereign power to save or kill and give no reason but my will thus the she-tyrant reigns till pleased with change her wild affections to new empires range another subject husband she desires divorced from him she to the first retires while the last wedding feast is scarcely o'er and garlands hang yet green upon the door so still the reckoning rises and appears in total sum eight husbands in five years the title for a tombstone might be fit but that it would too commonly be writ her mother living hope no quiet day she sharpens her instruct her how to flee her husband bear and then divides the prey she takes love letters with a crafty smile and in her daughter's answer mends the style in vain the husband sets his watchful spies she cheats their cunning or she bribes their eyes the doctors call the daughter taught the trick pretends to faint and in full health is sick the panting stallion at the closet door hears the consult and wishes it were o'er canst thou in reason hope abhorred so known should teach her other manners than her own her interest is in all the advice she gives tis on the daughter's rents the mother lives no cause is tried at the litigious bar but women plaintiffs or defendants are they form the process all the briefs they write the tropics furnish and the pleas indite and teach the toothless lawyers how to bite they turn viragos too the wrestlers toil they try and smear their naked limbs with oil against the post their wicker shields they crush flourish the sword and at the flestron push of every exercise the mannish crew fulfils the parts and oft excels us too prepared not only in feigned fights to engage but rout the gladiators on the stage what sense of shame in such a breast can lie inured to arms and her own sex to fly yet to be holy man she would disclaim to quit her tenfold pleasure at the game for frothy praises and an empty name oh what a decent sight tis to behold all thy wife's magazine thy auction sold the belt the crested plume the several suits of armour and the spanish leather boots yet these are they that cannot bear the heat of figured silks and under saracenet sweat behold the strutting amazonian whore she stands in guard with her right foot before her coats tucked up and all her motions just she stamps and then cries ha at every thrust but laugh to see her tired with many about call for the pot and like a man piss out the ghosts of ancient romans should they rise would grin to see their daughters play a prize besides what endless brawls by wives are bred the curtain lecture makes a mournful bed then when she has the shore within the sheets her cry begins and the whole day repeats conscious of crimes herself she teases first thy servants are accused thy whore is cursed she acts the jealous and at will she cries for women's tears are but the sweat of eyes poor cuckold fool thou think'st that love sincere and suck'st between her lips the falling tear but search her cabinet and thou shalt find each tiller there with love epistles lined suppose her taken in a close embrace this you would think so manifest a case no rhetoric could defend no impudence outface and yet even then she cries the marriage vow a mental reservation must allow and there's a silent bargain still implied 
the parties should be pleased on either side, and both may for their private needs provide. Though men yourselves and women us you call, yet homo is a common name for all. There's nothing bolder than a woman caught. Guilt gives them courage to maintain their fault. You ask from whence proceed these monstrous crimes. Once poor and therefore chaste in former times, our matrons were. No luxury found room in low-roofed houses and bare walls of loam. Their hands with labour hardened while twas light, and frugal sleep supplied the quiet night. While pinched with want, their hunger held them straight, when Hannibal was hovering at the gate. But wanton now, and lolling at our ease, we suffer all the inveterate ills of peace, and wasteful riot, whose destructive charms revenge the vanquished world of our victorious arms. No crime, no lustful postures are unknown, since poverty, our guardian god, is gone. Pride, laziness, and all luxurious arts, pour like a deluge in from foreign parts. Since gold obscene and silver found the way, strange fashions with strange bullion to convey, and our plain simple manners to betray. What care our drunken dames to whom they spread? Wine no distinction makes of tail or head who lewdly dancing at a midnight ball for hot eringos and fat oysters call full brimmers to their fuddled noses thrust brimmers the last provocatives of lust when vapours to their swimming brains advance and double tapers on the tables dance now think what bawdy dialogues they have what tullia talk to her confiding slave at modesty's old statue when by night they make a stand, and from their litters light. The good man early to the levy goes, and treads the nasty paddle of his spouse. The secrets of the goddess named the good are even by boys and barbers understood, where the rank matrons dancing to the pipe gig with their bums, and are for action ripe. With music raised they spread abroad their hair, and toss their heads like an enamoured mare. Norcella lays her garland by, and proves the mimic lechery of manly loves. Ranked with the lady the cheap sinner lies, and here not blood, but virtue gives the prize. Nothing is feigned in this venereal strife, tis downright lust, and acted to the life. So full, so fierce, so vigorous, and so strong, that looking on would make old Nestor young. Impatient of delay, a general sound, an universal groan of lust goes round, for then, and only then, the sex sincere is found. Now is the time of action, now begin, they cry, and let the lusty lovers in. The horsons are asleep, then bring the slaves, and watermen a race of strong-backed knaves. I wish at least our sacred rites were free from those pollutions of obscenity but tis well known what singer how disguised a lewd audacious action enterprised into the fair with women mixed he went armed with a huge two-handed instrument a grateful present to those holy choirs where the mouse guilty of his sex retires and even male pictures modestly are veiled yet no profaneness on that age prevailed no scoffers at religious rites are found though now at every altar they are bound. I hear your cautious counsel, you would say, keep close your women under lock and key. But who shall keep those keepers? Women nursed in craft, begin with those and bribe them first. The sex is turned all whore, they love the game, and mistresses and maids are both the same. The poor Ogalnia on poet's day will borrow clothes and chair to see the play she who before had mortgaged her estate and pawned the last remaining piece of plate some are reduced their utmost shifts to try but women have no shame of poverty they live beyond their flint as if their store the more exhausted would increase the more some men instructed by the labouring ant provide against the extremities of want but womankind, 
that never knows a mean, down to the dregs their sinking fortune drain. Hourly they give and spend, and waste and wear, and think no pleasure can be bought too dear. There are who in soft eunuchs place their bliss, to shun the scrubbing of a bearded kiss, and scape abortion, but their solid joy is when the page already past a boy is caponed late, and to the gelding shown, with his two pounders to perfection grown. When all the navel string could give appears, all but the beard, and that's the barber's loss not theirs. Seen from afar, and famous for his wear, he struts into the bath among the fair. The admiring crew to their devotions fall, and kneeling on their new priapus call, curved for his lady's use, and with her lies, and let him drudge for her if thou art wise. Rather than trust him with thy favourite boy, he proffers death in proffering to enjoy. If songs they love, the singer's voice they force beyond his compass till his quail pipes hoarse. His lute and lyre, with their embraces worn, with knots they trim it, and with gems adorn. Run over all the strings, and kiss the case, and make love to it in the master's place. A certain lady, once of high degree, to Janus vowed, and Vesta's deity, that Pollio might in singing win the prize. Pollio, the dear, the darling of her eyes, she prayed and bribed. What could she more have done for a sick husband or an only son? With her face failed and heaving up her hands, the shameless suppliant at the altar stands. The forms of prayer she solemnly pursues, and pale with fear, the offered entrails views. Answer, ye powers, for if you heard her vow, your godships sure had little else to do. This is not all, for actors they implore, and impudence not known to heaven before. Their respects tired with this religious rout, is forced to stand so long he gets the gout. But suffer not thy wife abroad to roam, if she love singing let her sing at home, not strut the streets with Amazonian pace, for that's to cuckle thee before thy face. Their endless itch of news comes next in play, they vent their own and hear what others say. Know what in Thrace or what in France is done, the intrigues betwixt the stepdam and the son. Tell who loves who, what favours some partake, and who is jilted for another's sake. What pregnant widow, in what month was made, how oft she did, and doing what she said. She first beholds the raging comet rise, knows whom it threatens, and what lands destroys. Still for the newest news she lies in wait, and takes reports just entering at the gate. Wrecks, floods, and fires, whatever she can meet, she spreads, and is the fame of every street. This is a grievance, but the next is worse, a very judgment, and her neighbours curse. For, if their barking dog disturb her ease, no prayer can bind her, no excuse appease. The unmannered malefactor is arraigned, but first the master, who the cur maintained, must feel the scourge. By night she leaves her bed, by night her bathing equipage is led, that marching armies a less noise create. She moves in tumult, and she sweats in state. Meanwhile her guests their appetites must keep. Some gape for hunger, and some gasp for sleep. At length she comes, all flushed, but ere she sup, swallows a swinging preparation cup, and then, to clear her stomach, spews it up. The deluge vomit, all the floor o'erflows, and the sour savour nauseates every nose. She drinks again, again she spews a lake, her wretched husband sees, and dares not speak, but mutters many a curse against his wife, and damn himself for choosing such a life. But of all the plagues the greatest is untold, the book-learned wife, in Greek and Latin bold, the critic dame, who at her table sits, Homer and Vigil quotes, and weighs their wits, and pities Dido's agonizing fits. She has so far the ascendant of the board, the prating pedant puts not in one word. 
The man of law is nonplussed in his suit, nay, every other female tongue is mute. Hammers and beating anvils, you would swear, and Vulcan with his home militia there. Tabors and trumpets cease, for she alone is able to redeem the labouring moon. Even wits are burthen when it talks too long, but she who has no continents of tongue should walk in breeches and should wear a beard, and mix among the philosophic herd. Oh, what a midnight curse has he, whose side is pestered with a mood and figure bride! Let mine, ye gods, if such must be my fate, no logic learn, nor history translate, but rather be a quiet, humble fool. I hate a wife to whom I go to school, who climbs the grammar tree distinctly knows, where noun and verb and participle grows, corrects her country neighbour, and a bed for breaking Priscians breaks her husband's head. The gaudy gossip, when she's set agog, in jewels dressed and at each ear a bob, goes flaunting out and in her turn of pride thinks all she says or does is justified. When poor, she's scarce a tolerable evil, but rich and fine, a wife's a very devil. She duly, once a month, renews her face, meantime it lies in daub and hid in grease. Those are the husband's nights. She craves her due, he takes fat kisses, and is stuck with glue. But to the loved adulterer, when she steers, fresh from the bath in brightness she appears. For him the rich Arabia sweats her gum, and precious oils from distant Indies come. How haggardly, sir, she looks at home, the clips then vanishes, and all her face is opened and restored to every grace. The crust removed, her cheeks, as smooth as silk, are polished with a wash of ass's milk. And should she to the farthest north be sent, a train of these attend her banishment. But hadst thou seen her plastered up before, t'was so unlike her face it seemed a sore. Tis worth our while to know what all the day they do, and how they pass their time away. For, if o'er night the husband has been slack, or counterfeited sleep, and turned his back, next day be sure the servants go to rack. The chambermaid, the dresser, are called whores, the pages stripped and beaten out of doors. The whole house suffers from the master's crime, and he himself is warned to wake another time. She hires tormentors by the year. She treats her visitors and talks, but still she beats. Beats while she paints her face, surveys her gown, casts up the day's accounts, and still beats on. Tired out at length, with an outrageous tone, she bids them, in the devil's name, be gone. Compared with such a proud, insulting dame, Sicilian tyrants may renounce their name. For if she hastes abroad to take the air, or goes to Isis's church, the bawdy house of prayer, she hurries all her handmaids to the task, her head alone will twenty dressers ask. Secus the chief, with breast and shoulders bare, trembling considers every sacred hair. If any straggler from his rank be found, a pinch must for the mortal sin compound. Secus is not in fault, but in the glass the dame's offended at her own ill face. The maid is banished, and another girl more dexterous manages the comb and curl. The rest are summoned on a point so nice, and first the grave old woman gives advice. The next is called, and so the turn goes round, as each for age or wisdom is renowned. Such counsel, such deliberate care they take, as if her life and honour lay at stake. With curls on curls they build her head before, and mount it with a formidable tower. A giantess she seems, but look behind, and then she dwindles to the pygmy kind. Duck-legged, short-waisted, such a dwarf she is, that she must rise on tiptoes for a kiss. Meanwhile her husband's whole estate is spent. He may go bare, while she receives his rent. She minds him not, she lives not as a wife, but like a bawling neighbour, full of strife. Near him, in this alone, that she extends her hate to all his servants and his friends. 
Bellona's priests and eunuch at their head, about the streets a mad procession lead. The venerable gelding large and high o'erlooks the herd of his inferior fry. His awkward clergymen about him prance, and beat the timbrels to their mystic dance. Guiltless of testicles they tear their throat, and squeak in treble their unmanly notes. Meanwhile his cheeks the mitred prophet swells, and dire presages of the year foretells. Unless with eggs his priestly hire, they haste to expiate and avert the autumnal blast, and add beside a murray-coloured vest, which in their places may receive the pest, and thrown into the flood their crimes may bear, to purge the unlucky omens of the air. The astonished matron pay before the rest that sex is still obnoxious to the priest. Through ye they beat and plunge into the stream, if so the god has warned them in a dream. Weak in their limbs, but in devotion strong, on their bare hands and feet they call along, a whole field's length the laughter of the throng. Should Io, Io's priest, I mean, command a pilgrimage to Meroe, burning sand, though deserts they would seek the secret spring, a holy water for lustration bring. How can they pay their priests too much respect, who trade with heaven and earthly gains neglect? With him domestic gods discourse by night, by day attended by his choir in white, the bald pate tribe runs madding through the street, and smile to see with how much ease they cheat. The ghostly sire forgives the wife's delights, who sins through frailty on forbidden nights, and tempts her husband in the holy time, when carnal pleasure is a mortal crime. The sweating image shakes his head, but he with mumbled prayers intones the deity, the pious priesthood, the fat goose receive, and they once bribed the godhead must forgive. No sooner these remove, but full of fear, a gypsy a Jewess whispers in your ear, and began arms and high priest's daughters she versed in their talmud and divinity and prophesizes beneath a shady tree her goods a basket and old hay her bed she strolls and telling fortunes gains her bread farthings and some small monies are her fee yet she interprets all your dreams for these foretells their state when the rich uncle dies and sees a sweetheart in the sacrifice such toys a pigeon entrails can disclose which yet the armenian augur far outgoes in dogs a victim more obscene he rakes and murdered infants for inspection takes for gain his impious practice he pursues for gain will his accomplices accuse more credit yet is to chaldeans given what they foretell is deemed the voice of heaven their answers as from hammam's altar come since now the delphian oracles are dumb and mankind ignorant of future fate believes what fond astrologers relate of these the most in vogue is he who sent beyond the seas is returned from banishment his art who to aspiring Otho sold, and sure succession to the crown foretold. For his esteem is in his exile placed, the more believed, the more he was disgraced. No astrologic wizard honour gains, who has not oft been banished or in chains. He gets renown who, to the halter near, but narrowly escapes and buys it dear. From him your wife enquires the planet's will, when the black jaundice shall her mother kill. Her sister's and her uncle's end would know, but first consult his art, when you shall go. And what's the greatest gift that heaven can give, if after her the adulterer shall live? She neither knows nor cares to know the rest, if Mars and Saturn shall the world infest or Jove and Venus, with their friendly rays, will interpose and bring us better days. Beware the woman, too, and shun her sight, who in these studies does herself delight. 
by whom a greasy almanac is borne with often handling like chafed amber worn not now consulting but consulted she of the twelve houses and their lords is free she if the scheme a fatal journey show stays safe at home but lets her husband go if but a mile she travel out of town the planetary hour must first be known and lucky moment if her eye but aches or itches its decumbiture she takes no nourishment receives in her disease but what the stars and ptolemy shall please the middle sort who have not much to spare to chiromancer's cheaper art repair who clap the petty palm to make the lines more fair but the rich matron who has more to give her answers from the brackman will receive skilled in the globe and sphere he gravely stands and with his compass measures seas and lands the poorest of the sex have still an itch to know their fortunes equal to the rich the dairy-maid inquires if she shall take the trusty tailor and the cook forsake yet these though poor the pain of childbed bear and without nurses their own infants rear you seldom hear of the rich mantle spread for the babe born in the great lady's bed such is the power of herbs such arts they use to make them barren or their fruit to lose but thou whatever slops she will have brought be thankful and supply the deadly draught help her to make manslaughter let her bleed and never want for savin at her need for if she holds till her nine months be run thou mayst be father to an ethiop's son a boy who ready gotten to thy hands by law is to inherit all thy lands one of that hue that should he cross the way his omen would discolour all the day i pass the foundling by a race unknown at doors exposed whom matrons make their own and into noble families advance a nameless issue the blind work of chance indulgent fortune does her care employ and smiling broods upon the naked boy her garment spreads and laps him in the fold and covers with her wings from nightly cold gives him her blessing puts him in a way sets up the farce and laughs at her own play him she promotes, she favours him alone, and makes provision for him as her own. The craving wife, the force of magic tries, and filters for the unable husband buys. The potion works not in the part designed, but turns his brains and stupefies his mind. The sotted moon calf gapes, and staring on, sees his own business by another done a long oblivion a benumbing frost constrains his head and yesterday is lost some nimbler juice would make him foam and rave like that Cassonia to her caius gave who plucking from the forehead of the foal his mother's love infused it in the bowl the boiling blood ran hissing in his veins till the mad vapour mounted to his brains the thunderer was not half so much on fire when juno's girdle kindled his desire what woman will not use the poisoning trade when caesar's wife the president has made let agrippina's mushroom be forgot given to a slavering old unuseful sot that only closed the drivelling dotard's eyes and sent his godhead downward to the skies but this fierce potion calls for fire and sword not spares the common when it strikes the lord so many mischiefs were on one combined so much one single poisoner cost mankind if stepdames seek their sons-in-law to kill tis venial trespass let them have their will but let the child entrusted to the care of his own mother of her bread beware beware the food she reaches with her hand the morsel is intended for thy land thy tutor be thy taster ere thou eat there's poison in thy drink and in thy meat you think this feigned the satyr in a rage struts in the buskins of the tragic stage 
forgets his business is to laugh and bite, and will of deaths and dire revenges write. Would it were all fable that you read, but Dryman's wife pleads guilty to the deed. I, she confesses, in the fact was caught, two sons dispatching at one deadly draught. What two, two sons, thou viper, in one day? Yes, seven, she cries, if seven were in my way. Medea's legend is no more a lie, one age adds credit to antiquity. Great ills we grant in former times did reign, and murders then were done, but not for gain. Less admiration to great crimes is due, which they through wrath or through revenge pursue. For, weak of reason, impotent of will, the sex is hurried headlong into ill, and, like a cliff from its foundation torn, by raging earthquakes into seas is born. But those are fiends who crimes from thought begin, and cool in mischief meditate the sin. They read the example of a pious wife, redeeming with her own her husband's life. Yet if the laws did that exchange afford, would save their lapdog sooner than their lord. Where'er you walk, the belides you meet, and Clytemestras grow in every street. But here's the difference. Agamemnon's wife was a gross butcher with a bloody knife. But murder now is to perfection grown, and subtle poisons are employed alone, unless some antidote prevents their arts, and lines with balsam all the nobler parts, in such a case reserved for such a need, rather than fail, the dagger does the deed. End of the Sixth Satire The Seventh Satire of the Satires of Decimus Junius Juvenalis, translated by John Dryden and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Nicholas Hillier, Wiltshire, England, December 2023. The Seventh Satire, translated by Mr. Charles Dryden. The Argument The hope and encouragement of all learned is only reposed in Caesar, whether in Domitian, Nerva, or Trajan, is left doubtful by the poet. The nobility, which in reason ought to patronise poetry and reward it, are now grown sordidly covetous, and think it enough for them barely to praise writers or to write ill verses themselves. This gives occasion to our author to lament, likewise, the hard fortune and necessities of other arts and their professors, particularly historians, lawyers, rhetoricians, and grammarians. On Caesar all our studies must depend, for Caesar is alone the muse's friend. When now the celebrated wits for need hire bagnios to the crier's trade succeed, or get their own by breaking others' bread, or by the porter's lodge with beggars wait for greasy fragments at the great man's gate. Tis better so if thy poetic fob refuse to pay an ordinary club, and much more honest to be hired and stand with auctionary hammer in thy hand provoking to give more and knocking thrice for the sold household stuff or pictures price, exposing playbooks full of fustian lines or the dull libraries of dead divines. Even this is better, though tis hardly got, than be a perjured witness of a plot, to swear he saw three inches through a door, as Asiatic evidences swore who hither coming out at heels and knees, for this had pensions, titles, and degrees. Henceforward let no poet fear to starve, Caesar will give, if we can but deserve. Tune all your lyres, the monarch's praise invites, the labouring muse and vast rewards excites. But if from other hands than his you think to find supply, tis loss of pen and ink. Let flames on your unlucky papers pray, Or moths through written pages eat their way. Your wars, your loves, your praises be forgot, And make of all an universal blot. 
the Muses' ground is barren, desert all. If no support from Caesar's bounty fall, the rest is empty praise, an ivy crown, or the lean statue of a starved renown. For now the cunning patron never pays, but thinks he gives enough in giving praise, extols the poem and the poet's vein, as boys admire the peacock's gaudy train. Meanwhile thy manhood, fit for toils and wars, patient of seas and storms and household cares, ebbs out apace, and all thy strength impairs. Old age, with silent pace, comes creeping on, nauseates the praise which in her youth she won, and hates the muse by which she was undone. The tricks of thy base patron now behold, to spare his purse and save his darling gold. In his own coin the starving wit he treats, himself makes verses which himself repeats, and yields to Homer on no other score than that he lived a thousand years before. But if to fame alone thou dost pretend, the miser will his empty palace lend. Set wide his doors adorned with plated brass, where droves as at a city gate may pass. A spacious hall afford thee to rehearse, and send his clients to applaud thy verse, but not one farthing to defray the costs of carpenters, the pulpit and the posts. House-room that costs him nothing he bestows, yet still we scribble on, though still we lose. We drudge and cultivate with care a ground where no return of gain was ever found. The charms of poetry our souls bewitch, the curse of writing is an endless itch. But he whose noble genius is allowed, who with stretched pinions soars above the crowd, who mighty thought can clothe with manly dress, he whom I fancy but can ne'er express, such, such a wit, though rarely to be found, must be secure from want, if not abound. Nice is his make, impatient of the war, avoiding business and abhorring care. He must have groves and lonely fountains choose, and ease solitudes to bait his muse. Unvexed with thought of wants, which may betide, or for to-morrow's dinner to provide. Horace ne'er wrote, but with a rosy cheek, his belly pampered, and his sides were sleek. A wit should have no care, or this alone, to make his rising numbers justly run. Phoebus and Bacchus, those two jolly gods, bear no starved poets to their blessed abodes. Tis not for hungry wit, with wants controlled, the face of Jove in council to behold, or fierce Electo, when her brand she tossed betwixt the Trojan and Rustilian host. If Virgil's suit Mycenas had not sped, and sent Alexis to the poet's bed, the crested snakes had dropped upon the ground, and the loud trumpet languished in the sound. Yet we expect that Lapper's muse should please, as much as did immortal Sophocles. When he his dishes and his clothes has sent to pawn for payment of a quarter's rent, his patron Numitor will nothing lend, pleads want of money to his wretched friend, yet can large presents to his harlot send, can purchase a tame lion, and can treat the kingly slave with several sorts of meat. It seems he thinks the expense is more to feast the famished poet than the hungry beast. Lucan, content with praise, may lie at ease in costly grots and marble palaces. But to poor Bassus, what avails her name, to starve on compliments and empty fame? All Rome is pleased when Astasius will rehearse, and longing crowds expect the promised verse. His lofty numbers with so great a gust, they hear and swallow with such eager lust. But while the common suffrage crowned his cause, and broke the benches with their loud applause, his muse had starved, had not a piece unread, and by a player bought, supplied her bread. He could dispose of honours and commands. The power of Rome was in an actor's hands. The peaceful gown and a military sword, the bounteous player outgave the pinching lord. And wouldst thou, poet, 
rise before the sun, and to his honour's lazy levy run? Stick to the stage, and leave thy sordid peer, and yet heaven knows tis earned with hardship there. The former age did one Mecenas see, one giving lord of happy memory. Then, then, twas worth a writer's pains to pine, look pale, and all December taste no wine. Such is the poet's lot. What luckier fate does on the works of grave historians wait? More time they spend in greater toils engage, their volumes swell beyond the thousandth page. For thus the laws of history command, and much good paper suffers in their hand. What harvest rises from this laboured ground, where they get pence, a clerk can get a pound? A lazy tribe, just of the poet's pitch, who think themselves above the growing rich. Next, show me the well-lunged civilians again, who bears in triumph an artillery train of chancery libels, opens the first cause, then with a picklock tongue perverts the laws, talks loud enough in conscience for its fee, takes care his client all his zeal may see. Twitched by the sleeve, he mouths it more and more, till with white froth his gown is slavered o'er. Ask what he gains by all this lying prate, a captain's plunder trebles his estate. The magistrate assumes his awful seat, stand forth, pale Ajax, and thy speech repeat. Assert thy client's freedom, ball and tear, so loud thy country judge at least may hear. If not discern, and when thy lungs are sore, hang up the victor's garland at thy door. Ask for what price thy venial tongue was sold, a rusty gammon of some seven years old, tough withered truffles, a ropey wine, a dish of rotten herrings, or stale stinking fish. For four times talking, if one piece thou take, that must be cantled, and the judge go snack. Tis true, Emilius takes a fivefold fee, though some plead better with more law than he, but then he keeps his coach, six Flanders mares draw him in state whenever he appears. He shows his statue too, where placed on high, the jinnet underneath him seems to fly, while with a lifted spear, in armour bright, his aiming figure meditates a fight. With arts like these, rich Matho, when he speaks, attacks all fees, and little lawyers breeks. Tongulus, very poor, has yet an itch of gaining wealth by failing to be rich, bathes often and in state, and proudly vain, sweeps through the streets with a long dirty train, from thence with lackeys running by his side, high on the backs of brawny slaves will ride in a long litter through the market-place, and with a nod the distant rabble grace. Clad in a gown that glows with Tyrian dye, surveys rich movables with curious eye, beats down the price, and threatens still to buy. Nor can I wonder at such tricks as these, the purple garments raise the lawyer's fees, and sell him dearer to the tool that buys. High pomp and state are useful properties. The luxury of Rome will know no end, for still the less we have, the more we spend. Trust eloquence to show our parts and breeding, not Tully now could get ten groats by pleading, unless the diamond glittered on his hand, wealth's all the rhetoric clients understand. Without large equipage and loud expense, the prince of orators would scarce speak sense. Paulus, who with magnificence did plead, grew rich while tattered Gallus begged his bread. Who to poor Basilus his cause would trust, though nearer so full of pity, ne'er so just? His clients unregarded claimed their due, for eloquence in rags was never true. Go, wretch, thy pleadings into Afric send, or France, where merit never needs a friend. But oh, what stock of patience wants the fool, who wastes his time and breath in teaching school, to hear the speeches of declaiming boys, deposing tyrants with eternal noise, 
sitting or standing, still confined to roar, in the same verse, the same rules, o'er er and o'er. Er. What kind the speech, what colours how to purge, objections state the case, and reasons urge. All would learn these, but at the quarter day, few parents will the pedant's labour pay. Pay, sir, for what? The scholar knows no more at six months' end than what he knew before. Taught or untaught, the dunce is still the same, yet still the wretched master bears the blame. Once every week poor Hannibal is mauled. Theme is given, and straight the council called. Whether he should to Rome directly go, to reap the fruit of the dire overthrow, or into quarters put his harassed men, till spring returns and takes the field again. The murdered master cries, Would parents hear, but half that stuff which I am bound to bear, for that revenge I'll quit the whole arrear. The same complaints most other pedants make, plead real causes, and the feigned forsake. Medea's poison, Jason's perjury, and Philomela's rape are all laid by, the accusing stepdame and the sons accused. But if my friendly counsel might be used, let not the learned this course or t'other try, but, leaving both, profess plain poverty, and show his tally for the dole of bread with which the parish poor are daily fed. Even that exceeds the price of all thy pains. Now look into the music master's gains, where noble youth at vast expense is taught, but eloquence not valued at a groat. On sumptuous baths the rich their wealth bestow, or some expensive airy portico, where safe from showers they may be born in state, and free from tempests for fair weather wait. Or rather not expect the clearing sun, through thick and thin their equipage must run. Or staying, tis not for the servants' sake, but that their mules no prejudice may take. At the walk's end, behold, how raised on high a banquet-house salutes the southern sky, where from afar the winter sun displays the milder influence of his weakened rays. The cook, the sower, each his talent tries, in various figures scenes of dishes rise. Besides, a master cook with greasy fist dives in luxurious sauces to the wrist. Amidst this wasteful riot there accrues but poor ten shillings for quintillion's dues, for to breed up the sun to common sense is evermore the parent's least expense. From whence then comes quintillion's vast estate, because he was the darling son of fate, and luck in scorn of merit made him great. Urge not the example of one single man, as rare as a white crow or fabled swan, Quintilian's fate was to be counted wise, rich, noble, fair, and in the state to rise. Good fortune graced his action and his tongue, his coals became him, and when hoarse he sung. Oh, there's strange difference what planets shed, their influence on the new-born infant's head. Tis fate that flings the dice, and as she flings of kings makes pedants, and of pedants kings. What made Ventidius rise, and Tullus great, but their kind stars and hidden power of fate? Few pedagogues but curse the barren chair, like him who hanged himself for mere despair and poverty, or him whom curse sent for liberty of speech to banishment. Even Socrates in rags at Athens taught, and wanted to defray the deadly draught. In peace, ye shades of our great grandsire's rest, no heavy earth your sacred bones molest. Eternal spring and rising flowers adorn the relics of each venerable urn, who pious reverence to their tutors paid, as parents honoured and as gods obeyed. Achilles, grown in stature, feared the rod, and stood corrected at the centre's nod. His tender years in learning did employ, and promised all the hero in the boy. The scenes are much altered in the modern school. The boys of Rufus called their master fool, a just revenge on him who durst defame the merit of immortal Tully's name. 
But ask what fruit Palaemon's pains have earned, or who has paid the price of what he learned? Though grammar profits less than rhetoric are, yet even in those his usher claims a share. Besides, the servant's wages must be paid, thus of a little still a less is made. As merchants gain, come short of half the mart, for he who drives their bargains dribs apart. The covetous father now includes the knight, and covenants thou shalt teach by candlelight. When puffing smiths and every painful trade of handicrafts in peaceful beds are laid, then thou art bound to smell on either hand as many stinking lamps as schoolboys stand. When Horace could not read his own fullid book, and Virgil's sacred page is all besmeared with smoke, but when thou dunst their parents seldom they, without a suit before the tribune pay, and yet hard laws upon the master lay, be sure he knows exactly grammar rules, and all the best historians read in schools, all authors, every poet to an hair, that asked the question he may scarce despair. To tell who nursed Anchises, or to name Ancamolus's stepmother, and whence she came, how long Acestes lived, what stores of wine he gave to the departing Trojan line, bid him beside his daily pains employ, to form the tender manners of the boy, and work him like a waxen babe with art, to perfect symmetry in every part. To be his better parent, to beware, no young obscenities his strength impair, no mutual filth to mark his hands and eyes, distorted with unnatural ecstasies. This be thy task, and yet, for all thy pains, at the year's end expect no greater gains than what a fencer at a prize obtains. End of the Seventh Satire The Eighth Satire of the Satires of Decimus Junius Juvenalis, translated by John Dryden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Nicholas Hillier, Wiltshire, England, January 2024. The Eighth Satire, translated by Mr. G. Stepney. The Argument. In this satire, the poet proves that nobility does not consist in statues and pedigrees, but in honourable and good actions. He lashes Rubilius Plancus for being insolent by reason of his high birth, and lays down an instance that we ought to make the like judgment of men, as we do of horses, who are valued rather according to their personal qualities than by the race of whence they come. He advises his noble friend Ponticus, to whom he dedicates the satire, to lead a virtuous life dissuading him from debauchery, luxury, oppression, cruelty, and other vices by his severe censures on Lateranus, Damasippus, Gracchus Nero, Catiline, and in opposition to those, displays the worth of persons meanly born, such as Cicero, Marius, Servius, Tullius, and the Decii. The translator of this satire industriously avoided imposing upon the reader and perplexing the printer with tedious commonplace notes, but finding towards the latter end many examples of noblemen who disgraced their ancestors by vicious practices, and of men meanly born who ennobled their families by virtuous and brave actions, he thought some historical relations were necessary towards rendering those instances more intelligible, which is all he pretends to by his remarks. He would gladly have left out the heavy passage of the Mamillo and Retiarius, which he honestly confesses he either does not rightly understand, or cannot sufficiently explain, if he has not confined himself to the strict rules of translation, but has frequently taken the liberty of imitating, paraphrasing, or reconciling the Roman customs to our modern usage, he hopes this freedom is pardonable, since he has not used it but when he found the original flat, obscure or defective, and where the humour and connection of the author might naturally allow of such a change. What's the advantage, or the real good, in tracing from the source our ancient blood? 
to have our ancestors in paint or stone preserved as relics, or like monsters shown. The brave Emilii, as in triumph placed, the virtuous Curiae, half by time defaced. Corvinus, with a moulding nose that bears injurious scars the sad effects of years, and Galba, grinning without nose or ears. Vain are their hopes who fancy to inherit, by trees of pedigrees, or fame or merit, though plodding heralds through each branch may trace old captains and dictators of their race, while their ill lives that family belie, and grieve the brass which stands dishonoured by. Tis mere burlesque that our generals praise, their progeny immortal statues raise. Yet, far from that old gallantry, delight to game before their images all night, and steal to bed at the approach of day, the hour when their ensigns did display. Why shouldst soft Fabius imprudently bear names gained by conquest in the Gallic war? Why lays he claim to Hercules his strain, yet dares be base, effeminate, and vain? The glorious altar to that hero built adds but a greater lustre to his guilt, whose tender limbs and polished skin disgrace the grisly beauty of his manly race. And who, by practising the dismal skill of poisoning, and such treacherous ways to kill, make his unhappy kindred marble swear, when his degenerate head by theirs is set? Long galleries of ancestors, and all the follies which ill-grace a country hall, challenge no wonder, or esteem from me, virtue alone is true nobility. Live therefore well, to men and gods appear, such as good Paulus, Cophus, Drusus were, and in thy consular triumphal show, let these before thy father's statues go. Place them before the ensigns of the state, as choosing rather to be good than great. Convince the world that you are devout and true, be just in all you say and all you do. Whatever be your birth, you're sure to be a peer of the first magnitude to me. Rome, for your sake, shall push her conquests on, and bring new titles home from nations won, to dignify so eminent a son. With your blessed name shall every region sound, loud as mad Egypt, when her priests have found a new Osiris for the ox they drowned. But who will call those noble who deface by meaner acts the glories of their race, whose only title to our father's fame is couched in the dead letters of their name? A dwarf as well may for a giant pass, a negro for a swan, a crook-backed lass be called Europa, and a cur may bear the name of tiger, lion, or whate'er, denotes the noblest or the fiercest beast. Be therefore careful, lest the world in jest should thee just so with the mock titles greet of Camerinus, or of conquered Crete. To whom is this advice and censure due? Rebellious Plancus, tis applied to you, who think your person second to divine, because descended from the Drusian line. Though yet you no illustrious act have done, to make the world distinguish Julia's son from the vile offspring of a troll who sits by the town wall and for her living knits. You are poor rogues, you cry, the baser scum and inconsiderable dregs of Rome, who knowst not from what corner of the earth the obscure wretch who got you stole his birth. Mine I derived from Secrops, May your grace live, and enjoy the splendour of your race. Yet of these base plebeians we have known some who, by charming eloquence, have grown great senators and honours to that gown. Some at the bar with subtlety defend the cause of an unlearned noble friend, or on the bench at the knotty laws untie. Others their stronger youth to arms apply. Go to Euphrates, or those forces join which garrison the conquests near the Rhine, while you, rebellious, on your birth rely. 
though you resemble your great family no more than your rough statues on the road, which we call Mercury's, are like that god. Your blockhead, though excels in this alone, you are a living statue, that of stone. Great son of Troy, who ever praised a beast for being of a race above the rest, but rather meant his courage and his force, to give an instance, a weak amend, a horse, without regard of pasture or of breed, for his undaunted mettle and his speed. Who wins most plates with greatest ease, and first prints with his hooves his conquest on the dust? But if fleet dragon's progeny at last proves jaded, and in frequent matches cast, no favour for the stallion we retain, and no respect for the degenerate strain. The worthless brute is from Newmarket brought, and an under-rate in Smithfield bought, to turn a mill or drag a loaded life beneath two panniers and a baker's wife. That we may therefore you, not yours, admire, first, sir, some honour of your own acquire. Add to that stock which justly we bestow to those blessed shades to whom you all things owe. This may suffice the haughty youth to shame, whose swelling veins, if we may credit fame, blast almost with the vanity and pride that their rich blood to Nero is allied. The rumours lightly, for we seldom find much sense with an exalted fortune joined. But, Ponticus, I would not you should raise your credit by hereditary praise. Let your own acts immortalise your name, tis poor relying on another's fame. For take the pillars but away, and all the superstructure must in ruins fall, as a vine droops when by divorce removed from the embraces of the elm she loved. Be a good soldier or upright trustee, an arbitrator from corruption free. And if a witness in a doubtful cause, where a bribed judge means to elude the laws, though Phalaris his brazen bull were there, and he would dictate what he'd have you swear, be not so profligate, but rather choose to guard your honour and your life to lose, rather than let your virtue be betrayed, virtue the noblest cause for which you're made. Improperly we measure life by breath, such do not truly live who merit death, though they their wanton senses nicely please with all the charms of luxury and ease. Though mingled flowers adorn their careless brow, and round em costly sweets neglected flow, as if they in their funeral state were laid, and to the world as there to virtue dead. When you the province you expect obtain, from passion and from avarice refrain, let our associates a poverty provoke, thy generous heart not to increase their yoke. Since riches cannot rescue from the grave, which claims alike the monarch and the slave, to what the laws enjoin, submission pay, and what the senate shall command, obey. Think what rewards upon the good attend, and how those fall unpitied who offend. Tutor and Capito may warnings be who felt the thunder of the state's decree for robbing the Sicilians, though they, like lesser pikes, only subsist on prey. But what avails the rigour of their doom, which cannot future violence overcome, nor give the miserable province ease, since what one plunderer left the next will seize? Chiropus, then, in time yourself bethink, and what your rags will yield by auction sink. Ne'er put yourself to charges to complain of wrongs which heretofore you did sustain. Make not a void to detect the theft, tis mad to lavish what their rapine left. When Rome at first our rich allies subdued, from gentle taxes noble spoils accrued. Each wealthy province, but in part oppressed, thought the loss trivial, and enjoyed the rest. All treasuries did then, with heaps abound, in every wardrobe costly silks were found. The least apartment of the meanest house could all the wealthy pride of art produce. Pictures from which Parassus did receive motion and warmth, and statues taught to live. 
Some Polyclites, some Mermon's work declared, in other Phidias' masterpiece appeared, and crowding plate did on the cupboard stand, embossed by curious mentor's artful hand. Prizes like these oppressors might invite, these Dolabella's rapine did excite. These Antony for his own theft thought fit, Veres for these did sacrilege commit. And when their reigns were ended, ships full fraught, the hidden fruit of their exactions brought, which made in peace a treasure richer far than what is plundered in the rage of war. This was of old, but our confederates now have nothing left but oxen for the plough, or some few mares reserved alone for breed, yet lest this provident design succeed, they drive the father of the herd away making both stallion and his pasture prey. Their rapine is so abject and profane, they nor from trifles nor from gods refrain. But the poor lares from the nightes seize, if they be little images that please. Such are the spoils which now provoke their theft, and are the greatest, nay, they're all that's left. Thus may you, Corinth, or weak roads oppress, who dare not bravely what they feel redress. For how can fops thy tyranny control? Smooth limbs are symptoms of a servile soul. But trespass not too far on sturdy Spain, Sclavonia, France, thy gripes are from those restrain, who with their sweat Rome's luxuries maintain, and sent us plenty while our wanton day is lavished at the circus or the play. For should use to extortion be inclined, your cruel guilt will little booty find. Since gleaning Marius has already seized all that from sunburnt Afric can be squeezed, but above all be careful to withhold your talons from the wretched and the bold, tempt not the brave and needy to despair, for though your violence should leave them bare of gold and silver, swords and darts remain, and will revenge the wrongs which they sustain, the plundered still have arms. Think not the precept I have here laid down, a fond, uncertain notion of my own. No, tis a sibyl's leaf, what I relate, as fixed and sure as the decrees of fate. Let none but men of honour you attend. Choose him that has most virtue for your friend, and give no way to any darling youth to sell your favour and pervert the truth. Reclaim your wife from strolling up and down to all sizes and through every town, with claws like harpies eager for the prey, for which your justice and your fame will pay. Keep yourself free from scandals such as these, then trace your birth from Picus, if you please. If he's too modern and your pride aspire to seek the author of your being higher, choose any titan who the gods withstood to be founder of your ancient blood, Prometheus and that race before the flood, or any other story you can find from heralds or in poets to your mind. But should you prove ambitious, lustful, vain, or could you see with pleasure and disdain rods broke on our associates' bleeding backs, and headsmen labouring till they blunt their act. Your father's glory will your sin proclaim, and to a clearer light expose your shame. For still more public scandal vice extends, as he is great and noble who offends. How dare you, then, your high extraction plead, yet blush not when you go to forge a deed, in the same temple which your grandsire built, making his statue privy to the guilt, or in a bawdy masquerade are led, muffled by night, to some polluted bed. Fat Lateranus does his rebels keep, where his forefathers' peaceful ashes sleep, driving himself a chariot down the hill, and though a consul, links himself the wheel. To do him justice, tis indeed by night, yet the moon sees, and every smaller light, prize as a witness of the shameful sight. Nay, when his year of honours ended, soon he'll leave that nicety, and mount at noon. 
nor blush should he some grave acquaintance meet, but, proud of being known, will jerk and greet. And when his fellow-beasts are weary grown, he'll play the groom, give oats, and rub em down. If after Numa's ceremonial way he at Jove's altar would a victim slay, to no clean goddess he directs his prayers, but by Hippona most devoutly swears or some rank deity, whose filthy face we suitably a uh, stinking stable's place. When he has run his length, and does begin to steer his course directly for the inn, where they have watched expecting him all night, a greasy Syria near he can alight, presents him essence, while his courteous host, well knowing nothing, by good breeding lost, tags every sentence with some thorning word, such as, My king, my prince, at least my lord. And a tight maid, ere he for wine can ask, guesses his meaning, and unoils the flask. Some, friends to vice, industriously defend these innocent diversions, and pretend that I the tricks of youth too roughly blame, alleging that when young we did the same, I grant we did, yet when that age was past, the frolic humour did no longer last. We did not cherish and indulge the crime, what's foul in acting should be left in time. Tis true some faults, of course, with childhood end, we therefore wink at wags when they offend, and spare the boy in hopes the man may mend. But Lateranus, now his vigorous age, should prompt him for his country to engage, the circuit of our empire to extend, and all our lives in Caesar's to defend. Mature in riots, places his delight, all day implying bumpers, and at night, reels to the balls over whose doors are set, pictures and bills, with here are whores to let. Should any desperate unexpected fate summon all heads and hands to guard the state, Caesar send quickly to secure the port, but where's the general, where does he resort? Send to the sutlers, there you are sure to find the bully matched with rascals of his kind. Cracks, coffin-makers, fugitives and sailors, rooks, common soldiers, hangmen, thieves and tailors with Sibyl's priests, who, wearied with processions, drink here and sleep with knaves of all professions, a friendly gag, each equal to the best, and all who can have liberty to jest. One flagon walks the round, that none should think they either change or flint him of his drink, and lest exceptions may for place be found, their stools are, all alike, their table round. What think you, Ponticus, yourself might do, should any slave so lewd belong to you? No doubt you'd send the rogue in fetters bound, to work in Bridewell, or to plough your ground. But nobles, you who trace your birth from Troy, think you the great prerogative enjoy of doing ill by virtue of that race, as if what we esteem in cobbler's base would the high family of Brutus grace. Shameful are these examples, yet we find, to Rome's disgrace, far worse than these behind. Poor Damasippus, whom we once have known, fluttering with coach and six about the town, is forced to make the stage his last retreat, and pawns his voice and all he has for meat. For now he must, since his estate is lost, or represent, or be himself, a ghost and Lentullus acts hanging with such art. Were I a judge, he should not feign the part. Nor would I their vile insolence acquit, who can with patience, nay, diversion sit, applauding my lord's buffoonery for wit, and slapping farces acted by the court, while the peers cuff to make the rabble sport. Or hirelings, at a prize their fortunes try, certain to fall unpitied if they die. As since none can have the favourable thought, that to obey a tyrant's will they fought. But that their lives they willingly expose, bought by the praetors to adorn their shows. Yet say the stage and lists were both in sight, and you must either choose to act or fight. Death never sure bears such a ghastly shape that a rank card basely would escape. 
by playing a foul harlot's jealous tool, or a feigned Andrew to a real fool. Yet a peer actor is no monstrous thing, since Rome has owned a fiddler for a king. After such pranks the world itself at best may be imagined nothing but a jest. Go to the lists where feats of arms are shows. There you'll find Gracchus from Patrician grown, a fencer and the scandal of the town. Nor will he the Mermilo's weapons bear, the modest helmet he disdains to wear. As Retiaris he attacks his foe, first waves his trident ready for the throw, next casts his net, but neither levelled right, he stares about exposed to public sight, then places all his safety in his flight. Room for the noble gladiator, see, his coat and hat-band show his quality. Thus when at last the brave Mamillo knew, T'was Gracchus was the wretch he did pursue, To conquer such a coward grieved him more Than if he many glorious wounds had bore. Had we the freedom to express our mind, There's not a wretch so much to vice inclined, But will own Seneca did far excel his pupil, By whose tyranny he fell to expiate whose complicated guilt with some proportion to the blood he spilt. Rome should more serpents, apes, and sacks provide than one for the compendious parricide. Tis true, Orestes, a like crime did act, yet weigh the cause, there's difference in the fact. He slew his mother at the gods' command, they bid him strike, and did direct his hand, to punish falsehood and appease the ghost of his poor father treacherously lost, just in the minute when the flowing bowl with a full tide enlarged his cheerful soul. Yet killed he not his sister or his wife, nor aimed at any near relation's life. Orestes, in the heat of all his rage, ne'er played or sung upon a public stage. Never on verse did his wild thoughts employ To paint the horrid scene of burning joy, Like Nero, who to raise his fancy higher And finish the great work, set Rome on fire. Such crimes make treason just, And might compel Virginius, Vindex, Galba, to rebel. But what could Nero's self have acted worse To aggravate the wretched nation's curse? These are the blessed endowments, studies, arts, which exercise our mighty emperor's parts. Such frolics with his roving genius suit, on foreign theatres, to prostitute his voice and honour for the poor renown of putting all the Grecian actors down, and winning at a wake their parsley crown. Let this triumphal chaplet find some place among the other trophies of thy race, by thee, Domitii, statues shall be laid, The habit and the mask in which you played, Antigone's or bold Thaistes' part, While your wild nature little wanted art, And on the marble pillar shall be hung The lute to which the royal madman sung. Who, Catiline, can boast a nobler line Than thy lewd friend, Carthagus, his and thine? Yet you took arms, and did by night conspire, To set our houses and our gods on fire, An enterprise which might indeed become Our enemies, the Gauls, not sons of Rome. To recompense whose barbarous intent, Pitched shirts would be too mild a punishment. But Tully, your wise counsel, Watched the blow, with care discovered, And disarmed the foe. Tully, the humble mushroom, scarcely known, the lowly native of a country town, who till of late could never reach the height of being honoured as a Roman knight. Throughout the trembling city placed a guard, dealing an equal share to every ward, and by the peaceful robe got more renown within our walls than young Octavius won, by victories at Actium, or the plain of Thessaly discoloured by the slain. Him, therefore, Rome, in gratitude, decreed, the father of his country, which he freed. Marius, another consul we admire, in the same village born, first ploughed for hire. His next advance was to the soldier's trade, where, if he did not nimbly ply the spade, his surly officer ne'er failed to crack 
his knotty cudgel on his tougher back. Yet he alone secured the tottering state, withstood the Cimbrians, and redeemed our fate. So when the eagles to their quarry flew, who never such a goodly banquet knew, only a second laurel did adorn his colleague Catullus, though nobly born. He shared the pride of the triumphal bay, but Marius won the glory of the day. From a mean stock the pious Decii came, small their estates, and vulgar was their name, yet such their virtues that their loss alone for Rome and all our legions did atone. Their country's doom they, by their own retrieved, themselves more worth than all the host they favoured. The last good king, who willing Rome obeyed, was the poor offspring of a captive maid, yet he those robes of empire justly bore, which Romulus, our sacred founder, wore. Nicely he gained, and well possessed the throne, not for his father's merit, but his own, and reigned himself a family alone. When Tarquin, his proud successor, was quelled, and with him lust and tyranny expelled, the consul's son, who, for their country's good, and to enhance the honour of their blood, should have asserted what their father won, and to confirm that liberty have done, actions which Cocles might have wished his own. What might to Matthias wonderful appear, and what bold Clelia might with envy hear, opened the gates endeavouring to restore their banished king and arbitrary power. Whilst a poor slave with scarce a name betrayed the horrid ills these well-born rogues had laid, who therefore for their treason justly bore the rods and axe ne'er used in Rome before. If you have strength Achilles' arms to bear, and courage to sustain a ten years' war, Though foul Thersites got thee, thou shalt be more loved by all, and more esteemed by me than if by chance you from some hero came, in nothing like your father but his name. Boast then your blood, and your long lineage stretch, as high as Rome, and its great founders reach. You'll find in these hereditary tales your ancestors the scum of broken jails, and Romulus, your honour's ancient source, but a poor shepherd boy, or something worse. End of the Eighth Satire The Ninth Satire of the Satires of Decimus Junius Juvenalis, translated by Mr. John Dryden, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Nicholas Hillier, Wiltshire, England. January 2024 The Ninth Satire Translated by Mr. Stephen Harvey The Argument Juvenal here, in dialogue with Nivolus, exposes the detestable vice then practised in Rome, and the covetousness of a rich old citizen which so prevailed over his pleasure that he would not gratify the drudge who had so often obliged him in the lewd enjoyment of his desires. Juvenal Tell me why, sauntering thus from place to place, I meet thee, Nivolus, with a clouded face. What human ills can urge to this degree? Not vanquished Marissus had a brow like thee nor Ravola so sneaked and hung his head, catched with that lewd board rudope in bed. Our grand beau, Pollio, seemed not half so sad when not a drachma could in Rome be had. When treble use he proffered for a friend and tempting bribes did to the scriveners send, yet none he found so much a fool to lend. Hard fate untrolled is now the charming die, the playhouse and the parks unvisited must lie. The beauteous nymph in vain he does adore, and his gilt chariot wheels must roll no more. But why these frightful wrinkles in thy prime, that show old age so long before the time? At lowest ebb a fortune when you lay, contented then, how merry was the day! But oh, the curse of wishing to be great! Dazzled with hope we cannot see the cheat, where wild ambition in the heart we find farewell content and quiet of the mind. 
For glittering clouds we leave the solid shore, And wonted happiness returns no more. Till such aspiring thoughts had filled thy breast, No man so pleasant, such a cheerful guest, So brisk, so gay of that engaging air, No mirth was crowned till Nivolus was there. The scenes now changed, that frolic genius fled, And gloomy thought seems entered in its stead. Not hands nor linen clean, And thy bare skin through the large rents is seen. Thy locks uncombed like a rough wood appear, And every part seems suited to thy care. Where now that laboured niceness in thy dress, And all those arts that did the spark express? A look so pale no quartain ever gave, Thy dwindled legs seem crawling to the grave. When we are touched with some important ill, How vainly silence would our grief conceal! Sorrow nor joy can be disguised by art, Our foreheads blab the secrets of our heart, By which, alas, tis evident and plain, Thy hopes are dashed, and thy endeavours vain. And yet tis strange, but lately thou wert known For the most envied stallion of the town. What conscious shrine, what cell by thee unsought, Where love's dark pleasures might be sold and bought? From human view you hid these deeds of lust, But gods in brass and marble you could trust. Ceres herself not scaped, for where can be From boards and prostitutes an altar free? Nor didst thou only for the females burn, The husband and the wife succeeded in their turn. Nevolus. This life I own, to some has prosperous been, But I have no such golden minutes seen. Right have you hit the cause of my distress, None has earned more and been rewarded less. All I can gain is but a threadbare coat, And that with utmost pains and drudging got. Some single money too, but that, alas, Broken and counterfeit will hardly pass, Whilst others, pampered in their shameless pride, Are served in plate and in their chariots ride. Tell me what mortal can his grief contain That has, like me, such reason to complain? On fate alone man's happiness depends, To parts concealed fate's prying power extends, And if our stars of their kind influence fail, The gifts of nature, what will they avail? The gifts of nature, curse upon the thought, By that alone I am to ruin brought. Old Viro did the fatal secret here, but curse on fame that bore it to his ear. What soft address his wooing did begin, What oaths, what promises to draw me in. Scarce could they fail to make a virgin sin, Who would not then swear Nivolus had sped, And golden shower were dropping on his head. But, oh, this wretch, this prodigy, behold, A slave at once to lechery and gold. For in the act of his lewd, brutal joy, Sirrah, my rogue, he cries, Mine own dear boy, my lad, my life, Already ask for more. I paid last bout, and you must quit the score. Poor five sestercia have been all my gains, And what is that for such detested pains? What is an ease and pleasure, couldst thou say, Where nature's law forbids to force my way To the digested meals of yesterday? The slave more toiled and harassed will be found, Who digs his master's buttocks than his ground. But sure old Viro thinks himself a boy, Whom Jove once more might languish to enjoy. Sees not his withered face and grisly hair, But would be thought smooth, charming, soft, and fair. With female pride would have his love be sought, And every smile with a rich present bought. Say, goat, for whom this mass of wealth you heap, For whom thy hoarded bags in silence sleep? Apulian farms, for the rich soil admired, And thy large fields where falcons may be tired? Thy fruitful vineyards on Campanian hills, Though none drink less, yet none more vessels fills. From such a store, tis barbarous to grudge A small relief to your exhausted drudge, Weigh well the matter, wert not fitter much, The poor inhabitants of yonder thatch, Call me their lord, who to extremes am driven, 
than to some worthless sycophant be given. Yet what smooth sycophant by thee can gain when lust itself strikes thy flint heart in vain? A beggar, fie, tis impudence, he cried, and such shifting answers still replied, but rent unpaid says beg till Vero grant. How ill does modesty consist with want? My single boy, like Polyphemus is I, mourns his harsh fate and weeps for a supply. One will not do, hard laboured and hard fed, how then shall hungry too expect their bread? What shall I say when rough December storms, when frosts and snows have cramped their naked arms? What comforts without money can I bring? Will they be satisfied to think on spring? These motives urged to his obdurate mind is casting water to the adverse wind. But one thing yet, base wretch, I must impart, thyself shalt own ungrateful as thou art, at your entreaties had I not obeyed, still your deluded wife had been a maid, down on the bridal bed a maid she lay, a maid she rose at the approaching day. Another night thy lumpish love she tried, but still she rose, a virgin and a bride. What could have touched her more? Away she flung, and every street of thy lost manhood rung. Her speaking eyes were full of thy disgrace, and her vexed thoughts abhorred the cold embrace. Such wrongs what wishing woman could have borne? In rage the marriage articles were torn. Yet when she vowed to see thy face no more, and heartless thou stood whining at the door, I met the angry fair, all over charms, and catching her flying from thy frozen arms. Much pains it cost to write the injured dame, a whole night's vigour to repair thy shame. Witness yourself who heard the labouring bed, and shrieks at the departing maiden head. Thus many a spouse, who would her choice recant, is kept obedient by a kind gallant. Now could you shift all this and pass it o'er, yet, monster, I have left one instance more. Think, if so well her business I have done, as that night's service may produce a son. Our Roman laws great privilege afford to him that stands a father on record. Thyself tis true a cuckold thou must own, but that reproach is in my breast alone. To me the pleasure be, to thee the fame, my brat shall thy abilities proclaim, and free thee ever from inglorious shame. Let circling wreaths adorn thy crowded door, matrons and girls shall hoot at thee no more, but stories to thy lasting credit raise, while fumbling fribbles grudge thy borrowed praise. Juvenal through Novolus, most aptly you complain, but though your griefs are just, they are in vain. Your service past he does with scorn forget, and seeks some other fool like thee to cheat. Novolus, beware, my friend, by what I now reveal, as the great secret of thy life conceal. A lustful pathic, when he turns a foe, he gives like destiny a wardless blow. His crimes are such they will not bear a jest, and fire and sword pursue the conscious breast. For sweet revenge no drugs will be too dear, in lust a miser but a spendthrift here. Then slight him not, nor with his scandal sport, but be as mute as was the Athenian court. Juvenal Dull Corridon, art thou so stupid grown to think a rich man's faults can be unknown? Has he not slaves about him? Would not they rejoice and laugh such secrets to betray? What more effectual to revenge their wrongs than the unbounded freedom of their tongues? Or grant it possible to silence those dumb beasts and statues would his crimes expose? Try to imprison the restless wind, so swift is guilt, so hard to be confined. Though crafty tears should cast a veil between, yet in dark his vices would be seen. And there's a lust in man no charm can tame, of loudly publishing our neighbour's shame. On eagle wings immortal scandals fly, while virtuous actions are but born and die. Let us live well, were it alone for this, 
the baneful tongues of servants to despise. Slander, the worst of poisons, ever finds an easy entrance to ignoble minds. And they whose vicious lives such abject foes must fear, more mean and wretched far than their own slaves appear. Nivolus. Your counsel's good and useful, tis confessed, but, oh, to me, it is in vain addressed. Let the great man whom gaping crowds attend fear a scourged slave or a dissembling friend. No matter what I do or what I say, I have no spies about me to betray. And you advise me now, my time is lost, and all my hopes of prosperous hours are crossed. My full-blown youth already fades apace, of our short being tis the shortest space. While melting pleasures in our arms are found, while lovers smile, and while the bowl goes round, while in surprising joys entranced we lie, old age creeps on us ere we think it nigh. Juvenal, fear not, thy trade will never find an end. While yon hills stand, thou canst not want a friend. By land and sea, from every point they come, they dread no dearth of prostitutes in Rome. Nevolus. Tell this to happier men, for I am sped, if all my drudging can procure me bread. Ye dare tis the substitutes of heaven, to whom the guide of human life is given, at whose loved altars, with an ample zeal, though slender sacrifice, I daily kneel. His ebbing hours let your poor suppliant see, from the mean crutch and thatched cottage free, no shameful want, nor troublesome disease, but easy death approaching by degrees. Necessity supplied would comfort bring, yet constant store would be a glorious thing. To treat a friend, methinks, I would afford, while silver bowls stand smiling on my board. And when the cares of Rome to pleasure yield, two Mycenaean slaves should bear me to the field, where on their brawny shoulders mounted high, while the brave youth their various manhood try, I would the thrones of emperors defy. Superfluous wealth and pomp I not desire, but what content and decency require. Then might I live by my own surly rules, not forced to worship knaves nor flatter fools. And thus secured of ease, by shunning strife, with pleasure would I sail down the swift stream of life. But, O oh, ridiculous vain wish, for one already lost and doomed to be undone! Alas, what hope remains, for to my prayers regardless fortune stops her wounded ears, as to the siren's charms, Ulysses' mariners. End of the Ninth Satire The Tenth Satire of the Satires of Decimus Junius Juvenalis, translated by Mr. John Dryden and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Nicholas Hillier, Wiltshire, England, January 2024. The Tenth Satire, translated by Mr. Dryden. The Argument The poet's design in this divine satire is to represent the various wishes and desires of mankind, and to set out the folly of them. He runs through all the several heads of riches, honours, eloquence, fame for martial achievement, long life and beauty, and gives instances in each how frequently they have proved the ruin of those that owned them. He concludes, therefore, that since we generally choose so ill for ourselves, we should do better to leave it to the gods to make the choice for us. All we can safely ask of heaven lies within a very small compass. Tis but health of body and mind, and if we have these, tis not much matter what we want besides, for we have already enough to make us happy. Look round the habitable world, how few know their own good or knowing it pursue. How void of reason are our hopes and fears, What in the conduct of our life appears, So well designed, so luckily begun, But when we have our wish, we wish undone. 
whole houses of their whole desires possessed are often ruined at their own request. In wars and peace, things hurtful we require, when made obnoxious to our own desire. With laurels some have fatally been crowned, some who the depths of eloquence have found in that unnavigable stream were drowned. The brawny fool who did his vigour boast in that presuming confidence was lost, but more have been by avarice oppressed and heaps of money crowded in the chest. Unwieldy sums of wealth, which higher amount than files of marshalled figures can account, to which the stores of Croesus in the scale would look like little dolphins when they sail in the vast shadow of the British whale. For this in Nero's arbitrary time, when virtue was a guilt and wealth a crime, a troop of cut-throat guards were sent to seize the rich men's goods and gut their palaces. The mob commissioned by the government are seldom to an empty garret sent. The fearful passenger who travels late, charged with the carriage of a paltry plate, shakes at the moonshine shadow of a rush and sees a red coat rise from every bush. The beggar sings, even when he sees the place, beset with thieves, and never mends his pace. Of all the vows, the first and chief request of each is to be richer than the rest. And yet, no doubts, the poor man's draught control, he dreads no poison in his homely bowl. Then fear the deadly drug, when gems divine enchase the cup and sparkle in the wine. Will you not now the pair of sages praise, who the same end pursued by several ways? One pitied, one contemned the woeful times, one laughed at follies, one lamented crimes. Laughter is easy, but the wonder lies what store of brine supplied the weeper's eyes. Democritus could feed his spleen and shake his sides and shoulders till he felt him ache though in his country town no lictors were, no rods, nor axe, nor tribune did appear, nor all the foppish gravity of show which cunning magistrates on crowds bestow. What had he done? Had he beheld on high, our praetor seated in mock majesty, his chariot rolling o'er the dusty place, while with dumb pride and a set formal face he moves in the dull ceremonial track? with Jove's embroidered coat upon his back. A suit of hangings had not more breast his shoulders than that long laborious vest, a heavy gilgaw called a crown that spread about his temples drowned his narrow head, and would have crushed it with the massy freight, but that a sweating slave sustained the weight. A slave in the same chariot seemed to ride to mortify the mighty madman's pride. And now the imperial eagle, raised on high, with golden beak, the mark of majesty, trumpets before, and on the left and right, a cavalcade of nobles all in white. In their own nature's false and flattering tribes, but made his friends by places and by bribes. Learn from so great a wit a land of bogs, with ditches fenced, a heaven fat with fogs, may form a spirit fit to sway the state, and make the neighbouring monarchs fear their fate. He laughs at all the vulgar cares and fears, at their vain triumphs and their vainer tears. An equal temper in his mind he found, when fortune flattered him, and when she frowned. Tis plain from hence that what our vows request are hurtful things, or useless at the best. Some ask for envied power, which public hate pursues and hurries headlong to their fate, down to the titles and the statue crowned, is by base hands in the next river drowned. The guiltless horses and the chariot wheel, the same effects of vulgar fury feel. The smith prepares his hammer for the stroke, while the lunged bellows hissing fire provoke. Sejanus, almost first of Roman names, the great Sejanus crackles in the flames, Formed in the forge, the pliant brass is laid, On anvils and of head and limbs are made, Pans, cans, and piss-pots, 
a whole kitchen trade. Adorn your doors with laurels and a bull, milk white and large, lead to the capitol. Sejanus, with a rope, is dragged along, the sport and laughter of the giddy throng. Good Lord, they cry, what Ethiop lips he has, how foul a snout, and what a hanging face! By heaven I never could endure his sight, but say, how came his monstrous crimes to light? What is the charge, and who the evidence, the saviour of the nation, and the prince? Nothing of this, but our old Caesar sent, a noisy letter to his parliament. Nay, sirs, if Caesar writ, I ask no more, he's guilty, and the question's out of door. How goes the mob? For that's a mighty thing. When the king's trump, the mob for the king. They follow fortune, and the common cry is still against the rogue condemned to die. But the same very mob, that rascal crowd, had cried Sejanus with a shout as loud, had his designs, by fortune's favour blessed, succeeded, and the prince's age oppressed. But long, long since the times have changed their face, the people grown degenerate and base, not suffered now the freedom of their choice to make their magistrate and sell their voice. Our wise forefathers, great by sea and land, had once the power at absolute command. All offices of trust themselves disposed, raised whom they pleased and whom they pleased deposed. But we who give our native rights away and our enslaved posterity betray are now reduced to beg an alms and go on holidays to see a puppet show. There was a damned design, cries one, no doubt, for warrants are already issued out. I met Brutidus in a mortal fright. He dipped for certain and plays least in sight. I fear the rage of our offended prince, who thinks the Senate slack in his defence. Come, let us haste our loyal zeal to show, and spurn the wretched core of Caesar's foe. But let our slaves be present there, lest they accuse their masters and for gain betray. Such were the whispers of those jealous times about Sejanus's punishment and crimes. Now tell me truly, wouldst thou change thy fate, to be, like him, first minister of state? To have thy levy crowded with resort of a depending, gaping, servile court? Dispose all honours of the sword and gown, grace with a nod and ruin with a frown? To hold thy prince in pupil age, and sway that monarch whom the mastered world obey? while he, intent on secret lust alone, lives to himself, abandoning the throne, cooped in a narrow aisle, observing dreams, with flattering wizards and erecting schemes. I well believe thou wouldst be great as he, for every man's a fool to that degree, all wish the dire prerogative to kill, even they would have the power who want the will. But wouldst thou have thy wishes understood, to take the bad together with the good? Wouldst thou not rather choose a small renown, to be the mayor of some poor paltry town? Bigly to look, and barbarously to speak, to pound false weights, and scanty measures break. Then grant we that Sejanus went astray in every wish, and knew not how to pray. For he who grasped the world's exhausted store, yet never had enough, but wished for more, raised atop heavy tower of monstrous height, which mouldering crushed him underneath the weight. What did the mighty Pompey's fall beget? It ruined him who greater than the great. The stubborn pride of Roman nobles broke, and bent their haughty necks beneath his yoke. What else but his immoderate lust of power, prayers made and granted in a luckless hour, for few usurpers to the shades descend, by a dry death, or with a quiet end. The boy, who scarce has paid his entrance down, to his proud pedant or declined a noun, so small an elf, that when the days are foul, he and his satchel must be born to school, yet prays and hopes, and aims at nothing less, to prove a tully or Demosthenes. But both those orators so much renowned, 
in their own depths of eloquence were drowned. The hand and head were never lost of those who dealt in doggerel or who punned in prose. Fortune fortuned the dying notes of Rome, till I, thy consul soul, consoled thy doom. His fate had crept below the lifted sword, and all his malice been to murder words. I rather would be Mavius, thrash for rhymes, like his the scorn and scandal of the times, than that Philippique fatally divine, which is inscribed, the second should be mine. Nor he, the wonder of the Grecian throng, who drove them with the torrent of his tongue, who shook the theatres and sway the state of Athens, found a more propitious fate, whom, born beneath a boding horoscope, his sire, the blear-eyed Vulcan of a shop, from Mars his forge sent to Minerva's schools to learn the unlucky art of wheedling fools. With itch of honour and opinion vain, all things beyond their native worth we strain, the spoils of war brought to Veretrian Jove, an empty coat of armour hung above, the conqueror's chariot, and in triumph borne a streamer from a boarded galley torn. A chap song, beaver loosely hanging by, the cloven helm, an arch of victory, on whose hive convex sits a captive foe, and fighting casts a mournful look below. Of every nation each illustrious name, such toys as these have cheated into fame. Exchanging solid quiet to obtain the windy satisfaction of the brain. So much the thirst of honour fires the blood, so many would be great, so few be good. For who would virtue for her self-regard, or wed without the portion of reward? Yet this mad chase of fame, by few pursued, has drawn destruction on the multitude. This avarice of praise in times to come, those long inscriptions crowded on the tomb, should some wild fig tree take her native bent, and heave below the gaudy monument, would crack the marble titles and disperse the characters of all the lying verse. For sepulchres themselves must crumbling fall, in time's abyss the common grave of all. Great Hannibal within the balance lay, and tell how many pounds his ashes weigh, whom Afric was not able to contain, whose length runs level with the Atlantic main, and wearies fruitful Nilus to convey his sun-beat waters by so long a way, which Ethiopia's double climb divides, and elephants in other mountains hides. Spain first he won, the Pyrenees passed, and steepy Alps the mounds that nature cast, and with corroding juices as he went, a passage through the living rocks he rent. Then, like a torrent rolling from on high, he pours his headlong rage on Italy. In three victorious battles overrun, yet still uneasy, cries there's nothing done. Till level with the ground their gates are laid, and Punic flags on Roman towers displayed. Ask what a face belonged to his high fame, his picture scarcely would deserve a frame, a signpost dauber would disdain to paint the one-eyed hero on his elephant. Now what's his end, O charming glory, say? What rare fifth act to crown his huffing play? In one deciding battle overcome, he flies, is banished from his native home, begs refuge in a foreign court, and there attends his mean petition to prefer. Repulsed by surly grooms, who wait before the sleeping tyrant's interdicted door. What wondrous sort of death has heaven designed, distinguished from the herd of humankind, for so untamed, so turbulent a mind? nor swords at hand, nor hissing darts afar, are doomed to avenge the tedious bloody war. But poison, drawn through a ring's hollow plate, must finish him, a sucking infant's fate. Go, climb the rugged Alps, ambitious fool, to please the boys and be a theme at school. 
One world sufficed not Alexander's mind, cooped up, he seemed in earth and seas confined. And struggling, stretched his restless limbs about the narrow globe to find a passage out. Yet entered in the brick-built town, he tried the tomb and found the straight dimensions wide. Death only this mysterious truth unfolds, the mighty soul how small a body holds. Old Greece a tale of Athos would make out, cut from the continent and sailed about. Seas hid with navies, chariots passing o'er, the channel on a bridge from shore to shore. Rivers, whose depth no sharp beholder sees, drunk at an army's dinner to the lees. With a long legend of romantic things, which in his cups the bowsy poet sings. But how did he return, this haughty brave, who whipped the winds and made the sea his slave? Though Neptune took unkindly to be bound, and Eurus never such hard usage found in his Aeolian prison underground. What god so mean, even he who points the way, so merciless a tyrant to obey? But how returned he, let us ask again, in a poor skiff he passed the bloody main, choked with the slaughtered bodies of his train. For fame he prayed, but let the vents declare, he had no mighty penoweth of his prayer. Jove grant me length of life, and years good store, Heap on my bended back, I ask no more. Both sick and healthful, old and young conspire in this one silly mischievous desire. Mistaken blessing, which old age they call, tis a long, nasty, darksome hospital. A ropey chain of rooms, a visage rough, deformed, unfeatured, and a skin off buff. A flitch form cheek that hangs below the jaw, such a wrinkle as a skilful hand would draw. For an old grandam ape, when, with a grace, She sits at squat and scrubs her leathern face. In youth distinctions infinite abound, No shape or feature just alike are found, The fair, the black, the feeble and the strong, But the same foulness does to age belong. The self-same palsy both in limbs and tongue, The skull and forehead one bald barren plain, And gums unarmed to mumble meat, in vain. Besides the internal drivel that supplies the dropping beard from nostrils, mouth, and eyes, his wife and children loathe him, and, what's worse, himself does his offensive carrion curse. Flatterers forsake him too, for who would kill himself to be remembered in a will? His taste not only palled to wine and meat, but to the relish of a nobler treat. The limber nerve in vain provoked to rise, Inglorious from the field of battle flies. Poor feeble dotard, how could he advance With his blue headpiece and his broken lance? Add that endeavouring still without effect, A lust more sordid justly we suspect. Those senses lost, behold, a new defeat, The soul dislodging from another seat. What music or enchanting voice can cheer? A stupid, old, impenetrable ear. No matter in what place or what degree Of the full theatre he sits to see, Cornets and trumpets cannot reach his ear, Under an actor's nose he's never near. His boy must bawl to make him understand The hour or the day, or such a lord's at hand. The little blood that creeps within his veins is but just warmed in a hot fever's pains. In fine, he wears no limb about him found, with sores and sicknesses beleaguered round. Ask me their names, I sooner could relate, how many drudges on salt hippia wait. What crowds of patients the town doctor kills, or how, last fall, he raised the weekly bills, what provinces by Basilus were spoiled, what herds of heirs by guardians are beguiled, how many bouts a day that bitch has tried, how many boys that pedagogue can ride, what lands and lordships are for their owner know, my quondam barber, but his worship now. This dotard of his broken back complains, one his legs fail, and one his shoulders pains, another is of both his eyes bereft, 
and envies who has one for aiming left. A fifth, with trembling lips expecting, stands, as in his childhood crammed by others' hands. One, who at sight of supper opened wide, his jaws before and wetted grinders tried, now only yawns and waits to be supplied, like a young swallow, when with weary wings expected food her fasting mother brings. His loss of members is a heavy curse, but all his faculties decayed are worse. His servants' names he has forgotten quite, knows not his friend who supped with him last night, not even the children he begot and bred, or his will knows them not, for in their stead, in form of law, a common hackney jade, sole heir for secret services, is made. So lewd and such a battered brothel whore, that she defies all comers at her door. Well, yet suppose his senses are his own, he lives to be chief mourner for his son. Before his face his wife and brother burns, he numbers all his kindred in their urns. These are the fines he pays for living long, and dragging tedious age in his own wrong. Griefs always green, a household still in tears, sad pomps a threshold thronged with daily beers, and liveries of black for length of years. Next to the raven's age, the pillion king was longest lived of any two-legged thing, blessed to defraud the grave so long, to mount his numbered years, and on his right hand count three hundred seasons, guzzling must of wine, but hold a while, and hear himself repine, at fate's unequal laws, and at the clue which, merciless in length, the midmost sister drew. When his brave son upon the funeral pyre he saw extended and his beard on fire, he turned, and weeping asked his friends what crime had cursed his age to this unhappy time. Thus mourned old Peleus for Achilles slain, and thus Ulysses' father did complain how fortunate an end had Priam made among his ancestors a mighty shade, while Troy yet stood when Hector with the race of royal bastards might his funeral grace amidst the tears of Trojan dames inured and by his loyal daughters truly mourned. Had heaven so blessed him, he had died before the fatal fleet to Sparta Paris bore. But mark what age produced, he lived to see his town in flames, his falling monarchy. In fine, the feeble sire, reduced by fate, to change his sceptre for a sword too late, his last effort, before Jove's altar tries, a soldier half, and half a sacrifice falls like an ox that waits the coming blow, old and unprofitable to the plough. At least he died a man, his queen survived, to howl, and in a barking body lived. I hasten to our own, nor will relate great Mithridates and rich Croesus's fate, whom Solon wisely counselled to attend the name of Happy, till he knew his end. That Marius was an exile, that he fled, was ta'en, in ruined Carthage begged his bread, all these were owing to a life too long, for whom had Rome beheld so happy young? High in his chariot, and with laurel crowned, when he had led the Cimbrian captives round the Roman streets, descending from his state, in that blessed hour he should have begged his fate, then, then he might have died, of all admired, and his triumphant soul with shouts expired. Campania, fortunes a malice to prevent, to Pompey and indulgent favour sent, but public prayers imposed on heaven to give their much-loved leader an unkind reprieve. The city's fate, and his conspired to save, the head reserved for an Egyptian slave. Cethegus, though a traitor to the state, and tortured, scaped this ignominious fate, and Sergius, who a bad cause bravely tried, all of a piece, and undiminished, died. To Venus, the fond mother makes her prayer, that all her sons and daughters may be fair. True, for the boy's mumbling vow she sends, but for the girls the vaulted temple rends. 
they must be finished pieces, tis allowed, Diana's beauty made Latona proud. And pleased to see the wondering people pray to the new rising sister of the day. And yet Lucretia's fate would bar that vow, and fair Virginia would her fate bestow on Rotilla, and change her faultless make for the sole rumple of her camel back. But for his mother's boy, the bow, what frights his parents have by day, what anxious nights, form joined with virtue, is a sight too rare. Chaste is no epithet to suit with fair, suppose the same traditionary strain of rigid manners in the house remain. Inveterate truth, an old plain Sabine's heart, suppose that nature too had done her part, infused into his soul a sober grace, and blushed a modest blood into his face. For nature is a better guardian far than saucy pedants or dull tutors are. Yet still the youth must ne'er arrive at man, so much almighty bribes and presents can. Even with a parent where persuasions fail, money is impudent and will prevail. We never read of such a tyrant king who gelt a boy deformed to hear him sing, nor Nero in his more luxurious rage e'er made a mistress of an ugly page. Sporus, his spouse, nor crooked was, nor lame, with mountain back and belly from the game, cross-barred, but both his sexes well became. Go boast your springle by his beauty cursed, to ills, nor think I have declared the worst. His form procures him journey work, a strife betwixt town madams and the merchant's wife. Guess when he undertakes this public war, what furious beasts offended cuckolds are. Adulterers are with dangers round beset. Born under Mars, they cannot scape the net, and from revengeful husbands oft have tried, worse handling than severest laws provide. One stabs, one slashes, one with cruel art, makes colon suffer for the peccant part. But your endymion, your smooth-smocked-faced boy, Unrivalled shall a beauteous dame enjoy. Not so, one more salacious, rich and old, Outbids and buys her pleasure for her gold. Now he must moil and drudge for one he loathes. She keeps him high in equipage and clothes, She pawns her jewels and her rich attire, And thinks the workman worthy of his hire. In all things else immoral, stingy, mean, but in her lusts a conscionable queen. She may be handsome, yet be chaste, you say, good observator, not so fast away. Did it not cost the modest youth his life, who shunned the embraces of his father's wife? And was not t'other stripling forced to fly, who coldly did his patron's queen deny, and pleaded laws of hospitality? The ladies charged them home, and turned the tale. With shame they reddened, and with spite grew pale. Tis dangerous to deny to the longing dame, She loses pity who has lost her shame. Now Silius wants thy counsel, give advice, Wed Caesar's wife, or die, the choice is nice. Her comet eyes she darts on every grace, And takes a fatal liking to his face. Adorned with bridal pomp, she sits in state, the public notaries, and arispects wait. The genial bed is in the garden dressed, the portion paid, and every rite expressed, which in a Roman marriage is professed. Tis no stolen wedding this, rejecting or she scorns to marry, but in form of law. In this moot case your judgment to refuse is present death, besides the night you lose. If you consent, tis hardly worth your pain, A day or two of anxious life you gain. Till loud reports through all the town have passed, And reach the prince, for cuckolds hear the last. Indulge thy pleasure, youth, and take thy swing, For not to take is but the self-same thing. Inevitable death before thee lies, But looks more kindly through a lady's eyes. What then remains? Are we deprived of will? Must we not wish, for fear of wishing ill? Receive my counsel, and securely move, 
entrust thy fortune to the powers above. Leave them to manage for thee, and to grant what their unerring wisdom sees thee want. In goodness, as in greatness, they excel. Ah, that we loved ourselves but half so well! We blindly, by our headstrong passions led, are hot for action and desire to wed. Then wish for heirs, but to the gods alone our future offspring and our wives are known. The audacious strumpet and ungracious son, Yet not to rob the priests of pious gain, that altars be not wholly built in vain. Forgive the gods the rest, and stand confined to health of body and content of mind, a soul that can securely death defy, and count it nature's privilege to die. Serene and manly, hardened to sustain the load of life and exercised in pain, guiltless of hate and proof against desire, that all things weighs, and nothing can admire, that dares prefer the toils of Hercules to dalliance, banquets, and ignoble ease. The path to peace is virtue, what I show, thyself may freely on thyself bestow. Fortune was never worshipped by the wise, but, set aloft by fools, usurps the skies. End of the Tenth Satire The Eleventh Satire of the Satires of Decimus Junius Juvenalis, translated by Mr. John Dryden and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Nicholas Hillier, Wiltshire, England, January 2024. The Eleventh Satire, translated by Mr. William Congreve. The Argument the design of this satire is to expose and reprehend all manner of intemperance and debauchery, but more particularly touches that exorbitant luxury used by the Romans in their feasting. The poet draws the occasion from an invitation, which he here makes to his friend, to dine with him, very artfully preparing him with what he was to expect from his treat. By beginning his satire with a particular invective, against the vanity and folly of some persons who, having but mean fortunes in the world, attempted to live up to the height of men of great estates and quality. He shows us the miserable end of such spendthrifts and gluttons, with the manner and courses of which they took to bring themselves to it, advising men to live within bounds and to proportion their inclinations to the extent of their fortune. He gives his friend a bill of fare, of the entertainment he has provided for him, and from thence takes occasion to reflect upon the temperance and frugality of the greatest men in former ages, to which he opposes the riot and intemperance of the present, attributing to the latter a visible remissness in the care of heaven over the Roman state. He instances some lewd practices at their feasts, and, by the by, touches the nobility with making vice and debauchery the chiefest of their pleasures. He concludes with a repeated invitation to his friend, advising him in one particular somewhat freely to a neglect of all cares and disquiets for the present, and a moderate use of pleasures for the future. If noble Atticus make plenteous feasts, and with luxurious foods indulge his guests, his wealth and quality support the treat. In him nor is it luxury but state. But when poor Rutilus spends all his worth in hope of setting one good dinner forth, tis downright madness, for what greater jests than begging gluttons or than beggars' feasts? But Rutilus is so notorious grown that he's the common theme of all the town. A man, in his full tide of youthful blood, able for arms and for his country's good, urged by no power, restrained by no advice, but following his own inglorious choice, amongst common fences practices the trade, that end debasing for which arms were made, arms which to man their dying fame afford, but his disgrace is owing to his sword. Many there are of the same wretched kind whom their despairing creditors may find lurking in shambles, where with borrowed coin they buy choice meats and in cheap plenty dine. 
such whose sole bliss is eating, who can give but one brutal reason why they live. And yet what's more ridiculous of these, the poorest wretch is still most hard to please. And he, whose thin transparent rags declare how much his tattered fortune wants repair, would ransack every element for choice of every fish and fowl at any price. If brought from far, if very dear has cost, it has a flavour then which pleases most, and he devours it with a greater gust. In riot, while money lasts, he lives, and that exhausted, still new pledges gives. Till forced of mere necessity to eat, he comes to pawn his dish to buy his meat. Nothing of silver or of gold he spares, not what his mother's sacred image bears. The broken relic he with speed devours, as he would all the rest of his ancestors, if wrought in gold, or if exposed to sale, they'd pay the price of one luxurious meal. Thus certain ruin treads upon his heels, the stings of hunger soon, and want he feels, and thus is he reduced at length to serve fences for miserable scraps or starve. Imagine now you see a splendid feast. The question is at whose expense tis dressed. In great Ventidius we the bounty prize, in Brutulus the vanity despise. Strange ignorance, that the same man who knows how far yonder mount above this molehill shows, should not perceive a difference as great between small incomes and a vast estate. From heaven to mankind, sure, that rule was sent, of know thyself, and by some god was meant, to be our never-ending pilot here, through all the various courses which we steer. Thersites, though the most presumptuous Greek, yet durst not for Achilles' armour speak. When scarce Ulysses had a good pretence, with all the advantage of his eloquence, who e'er attempts weak causes to support, ought to be very sure he's able fought, and not mistake strong lungs and impudence for harmony of words and force of sense. Fools only make attempts beyond their skill, a wise man's powers the limit of his will. If fortune has a niggard been to thee, devote thyself to thrift, not luxury, and wisely make that kind of food thy choice, to which necessity confines thy price. Well may they fear some miserable end, whom gluttony and want at once attend, whose large voracious throats have swallowed all, both land and stock, interest and principal. Well may they fear at length vile Pollio's fate, who sold his very ring to purchase meat, and though a knight amongst common slaves now stands, begging an alms with undistinguished hands. Sure sudden death to such should welcome be, on whom each added year heaps misery, scorn poverty, reproach, and infamy. But there are steps in villainy which these observe to tread and follow by degrees. Money they borrow, and from all that lend, which never meaning to restore, they spend but that and their small stock of credit gone, lest Rome should grow too warm, from thence they run. For of late years tis no more scandal grown for debt and roguery to quit the town, than in the midst of summer's scorching heat, from crowds and noise and business to retreat. One only grief such fugitives can find, reflecting on the pleasures left behind the plays and loose diversions of the place, but not one blush appears for the disgrace. Ne'er was of modesty so great a dearth, that out of countenance a virtue fled from earth. Baffled, exposed to ridicule and scorn, she is with Astrea gone, ne'er to return. This day, my Persicus, thou shalt perceive whether myself I keep those rules I give or else an unsuspected glutton live. If moderate fare and abstinence I prize, in public, yet in private, gourmandise. Evander's feast revived, to-day thou'lt see the poor Evander. I, and thou shalt be, Alcides and Aeneas both to me. 
Meantime, I send you now your bill of fare. Be not surprised that tis all homely cheer, for nothing from the shambles I provide, but from my own small farm, the tenderest kid, and fattest of my flock, a suckling yet, that ne'er had nourishment but from the teat. No bitter willow tops have been its food, scarce grass its veins have more milk than blood. Next that shall mountain asparagus be laid, pulled by some plain but cleanly country made, the largest eggs yet warm within the nest, together with the hens which laid them, dressed, clusters of grapes preserved for half a year, which plump and fresh as on the vines appear, apples of a ripe flavour fresh and fair, mixed with the Syrian and the Signian pear, mellowed by winter from their cruder juice, light of digestion now, and fit for use. Such food as this would have been heretofore accounted riot in a senate hall, when the good curious thought it no disgrace, with his own hands a few small herbs to dress, and from his little garden culled a feast, which fettered slaves would now disdain to taste. For scarce a slave, but has to dinner now, the well-dressed paps of a fat pregnant sow. But heretofore was thought a sumptuous treat on birthdays, festivals, or days of state, a salt dry flitch of bacon to prepare. If they had fresh meat, twas delicious fare, which rarely happened, and twas highly prized, if aught was left of what they'd sacrificed. To entertainments of this kind would come the worthiest and the greatest men in Rome. Nay, seldom any at such treats were seen, but those who had at least thrice consuls been. Or the dictator's office had discharged, and now from honourable toil enlarged, retired to husband and manure their land, humbling themselves to those they might command. Then might ye have seen the good old general's haste before the pointed hour to such a feast, his spade aloft, as twere in triumph held, proud of the conquest of some stubborn field. Twas then when pious consuls bore the sway, when vice discouraged, pale and trembling lay. Our censors then were subject to the law, even power itself of justice stood in awe. It was not then a Roman's anxious thought, where largest tortoise shells were bought, where pearls might of the greatest price be had, and shining jewels to adorn his bed, that he at vast expense might loll his head. Plain was his couch, and only rich his mind. Contentedly he slept as cheaply as he dined. The soldier then, in Grecian arts unskilled, returning rich with plunder from the field. If cups of silver or of gold he brought, with jewels set and exquisitely wrought, to glorious trappings straight the plate he turned, and with the glittering spoil his horse adorned, or else a helmet for himself he made, where various warlike figures were inlaid. The Roman wolf, suckling the twins, was there, and Mars himself armed with his shield and spear. Hovering above his crest did dreadful show, as threatening death to each resisting foe. No use of silver, but in arms was known. Splendid they were in war, and there alone. No sideboards then with gilded plate were dressed, no sweating slaves with massive dishes pressed. Expensive riot was not understood, but earthen platters held their homely food. Who would not envy them that age of bliss that sees with shame the luxury of this? Heaven unwearied then did blessings pour, and pitying Joe foretold each dangerous hour. Mankind were then familiar with the God, he snuffed their incense with a gracious nod and would have still been bounteous, as of old, had we not left him for that idle gold. His golden statues hence the god hath driven, for well he knows where our devotion's given. Tis gold we worship, though we pray to heaven. Woods of our own afforded tables then, though none can please us now but from Japan. Invite my lord to dine, and let him have the nicest dish his appetite can crave. 
but let on an oaken board be set, his lordship will grow sick and cannot eat. Something's amiss, he knows not what to think, either your venison's rank or ointment's stink. Order some other table to be brought, something at great expense in India bought, beneath whose orb large yawning panthers lie, carved on rich pedestals of ivory. He finds no more of that offensive smell, the meat recovers, and my lord grows well. An ivory table is a certain wet. You would not think how heartily he'll eat, as if new vigour to his teeth were sent, by sympathy from those of the elephant. But such fine feeders are no guests for me. Riot agrees not with frugality. Then that unfashionable man am I. With me they'd starve for want of ivory. For not one inch does my whole house afford, Not in my very tables or chessboard. Of bone the handles of my knives are made, Yet no ill taste from thence affects the blade, Or what I carve, nor is there ever left Any unsavoury oat boost from the half. A hearty welcome to plain wholesome meat You'll find but served up in no formal state, no sewers nor dexterous carvers have I got, such as by skilful Thyphorus were taught, in whose famed schools the various forms appear of fishes, beasts, and all the fowls of the air, and where, with blunted knives, his scholars learn how to dissect and the nice joints discern, while all the neighbourhood are with noise oppressed from the harsh carving of his wooden feast. On me attends a raw unskilful lad, On fragments fed in homely garments clad, At once my carver and my Ganymede. With diligence he'll serve us while we dine, And in plain beechen vessels fill our wine. No beauteous boys I keep from Phrygia brought, No catamites by shameful pandas taught. Only to me two homebred youths belong, Unskilled in any but their mother tongue. Alike in feature both, and garb appear, With honest faces, though with uncurled hair. This day thou shalt my rural pages see, For I have dressed them both to wait on thee. Of country swains they both were born, And one my ploughman's is, t'other my shepherd's son. A cheerful sweetness in his looks he has, And innocence unartful in his face, Though sometimes sadness will cast the joy, And gentle sighs break from the tender boy. His absence from his mother oft he'll mourn, And with his eyes look wishes to return, Longing to see his tender kids again, And feed his lambs upon the flowery plain. A modest blush he wears not formed by art, Free from deceit his face, and full as free his heart. Such looks, such bashfulness, might well adorn The cheeks of youths that are more nobly born, But noblemen those humble graces scorn. This youth to-day shall my small treat attend, And only he with wine shall serve my friend. With wine from his own country brought, And made from the same vines beneath whose fruitful shade He and his wanton kids have often played. But you perhaps expect a modish feast, With amorous songs and wanton dances graced, When sprightly females to the middle bear, Trip lightlier the ground and frisk in air, Whose pliant limbs in various postures move, And twine and bound as in the rage of love. Such sights the languid nerves to action stir, And jaded lust springs forward with his spur. Virtue would shrink to hear this lewdness told, Which husbands now do with their wives behold. A needful help to make them both approve The dry embraces of long-wedded love. In nuptial cinders this revives the fire, And turns their mutual loathing to desire. But she, who by her sex's charter must, Have double pleasure paid, feels double lust. A pace she warms with an immoderate heat, Strongly her bosom heaves, and pulses beat. With glowing cheeks and trembling lips she lies, With arms expanded, and with naked thighs, Sucking in passion both at ears and eyes, 
But this becomes not me nor my estate, these are the vicious follies of the great. Let him who does on ivory tables dine, whose marble floors with drunken spallings shine, let him lascivious songs and dances have, which ought to see or hear the lewdest slave, the vilest prostitute in all the stews, with bashful indignation would refuse. But fortune there extenuates the crime, what's vice in me is only mirth in him. The fruits which murder, cards, or dice afford, a vestal ravished or a matron hoard, are laudable diversions in a lord. But my poor entertainment is designed to afford you pleasures of another kind. Yet with your taste your hearing shall be fed, and Homer's sacred lines and Virgil's read. Either of whom does all mankind excel, though which exceeds the other none can tell. It matters not with what ill tone they're sung, verses so sublimely good no voice can wrong. Now then be all thy weighty cares away thy jealousies and fears, and while you may, to peace and soft repose give all the day. From thoughts of debt or any worldly ill be free, be all uneasy passions still. What though thy wife do with the morning light, when thou in vain hast toiled and drudged all night, steal from thy bed and house abroad to roam, and having quenched her flame comes breathless home, flecked in her face and with disordered hair, her garments ruffled, and her bosom bare. With ears still tingling, and her eyes on fire, half drowned in sin, still burning in desire, whilst you are forced to wink and seem content, swelling with passion, which you dare not vent. Nay, if you would be free from night alarms, you must seem fond and doting on her charms. Take her, the last of twenty, to your arms. Let this and every other anxious thought at the entrance of my threshold be forgot. All thy domestic griefs at home be left, the wife's adultery with the servant's theft, and the most racking thought which can intrude, forget false friends and their ingratitude. Let us our peaceful mirth at home begin, while Megalensian shows are in the circus scene. There, to the bane of horses, in high state, the praetor sits on a triumphal seat, vainly with ensigns and with robes adorned, as if with conquest from the wars returned. This day all Rome, if I may be allowed without offence to such a numerous crowd to say all Rome, will in the circus sweat. Echoes already do their shouts repeat. Methinks I hear the cry, Away, away! The green have won the honour of the day. Oh, should these sports be but one year forborne, Rome would in tears her loved diversions mourn. For that would now a cause of sorrow yield, Great as the loss of Cannae's fatal field. Such shows as these were not for us designed, But vigorous youth to active sports inclined. On beds of roses laid, let us repose, while round our heads refreshing ointment flows. Our aged limbs we'll bask in Phoebus' rays, and live this day devoted to our ease. Early to-day we'll to the bath repair, nor need we now the common censure fear. On festivals it is allowed no crime to bathe and eat before the usual time. But that continued would a loathing give, nor could you thus a week together live. For frequent use would the delight exclude, Pleasures a toil when constantly pursued. End of the eleventh satire The twelfth satire of the satires of Decimus Junius Juvenalis, translated by Mr. John Dryden and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Nicholas Hillier, Wiltshire, England, January 2024 The Twelfth Satire, translated by Mr. Thomas Power The Argument The poet invites Corvinus to assist at the performance of a sacrifice he had vowed to the gods, and was now thankfully offering up 
for the safety of his friend Catullus the merchant, who, with the loss of his goods, had escaped the double danger of fire and water. He professes the reality of his friendship and the sincerity of his intentions, that what he did in this nature was without any design upon Catullus or prospect of advantage from him, who had three children to leave his estate to. And here, taking the hint, he exercises his satirical vein upon the hieropodi or legacy hunters who made their court to and largely presented and in their sickness sacrificed for the health of rich childless men in hopes to be considered in their will among the rest he singles out one pacubius a fellow very desirous and notorious for this practice and concludes all with a wish for pacubius which some covetous persons would think pleasant enough, but really is a curse. This day's, this joyful day's solemnity does, with my birthdays, more than equal vie. Of grassy turves the rural altars reared, expect of the firstlings of the flock and herd. To royal Juno and the warlike maid shall in a lamb to each my vows be paid. A steer, of the first head in the whole drove, reserved we sacred to Tarpian Jove. Forward he bounds his rope extended length, and pushing front, proud since he tried his strength, and budding horns against an adverse oak, fit for the altar and the fatal stroke. Were but my fortunes equal to my mind, my bounteous love more nobly had designed. A bull high fed should form the sacrifice, one of Hispula's huge prodigious size. Not one of those our neighbouring pastures feed, but of Clytumbus's whitest sacred breed, the lively tincture of whose gushing blood should clearly prove the richness of his food. A neck so strong, so large, as would demand the speeding blow of some uncommon hand. This for my friend, or more, I would perform, who, danger-free, still trembles at the storm, presenting forms so hideous to his sight, as safety scarce allays the wild affright. First from a cloud that heaven all o'ercast, with glance so swift the subtle lightning passed, as split the sail-yards trembling and half-dead, each thought the blow was levelled at his head. The flaming shrouds, so dreadful did appear, all judged a wreck could no proportion bear. So fancy paints, so does the poet write, when he would work a tempest to the height. This danger past, a second does succeed, again with pity and attention heed. No less this second, though of different kind, such as in Isis's temple you may find, on votive tablets, to the life portrayed, where painters are employed and earn their bread. What painters in their liveliest drafts express may be a copy of my friend's distress, for now a sea into the hold was got, wave upon wave another sea had wrought, and nigh o'er set the stern on either side, the hoary pilot his best skill applied, but useless all, when he despairing found, Catullus then did with the winds compound. Just as the beaver, that wise-thinking brute, who, when hard hunted, on a close pursuit, bites off his stones, the cause of all the strife, and pays him down, a ransom for his life. Over with all, he cries, and all that's mine, without reserve I freely all resign, rich garments, purple dyed in grain, go o'er, no soft Mycenaeus ever choicer wore, and others of that fleece that never died, or stained by art is rich in nature's pride, such as its tincture from the soil does bear, by noble springs improved, and beatic air. Nor stopped he so, but over went his plate, made by Parthenius, followed by a great and massy goblet, a two-gallon draught might set a thirsty centaur when he quaffed, or drench the wife of Fucus, add to these baskets of Britain rarities of Greece, a set of plate most artfully embossed, no less a bribe than what Olynthus cost. Show me the man, 
that other he would dare his very life and soul to gold prefer? Now money serves not life's most noble ends, but slavish life imperious wealth attends. Thus most of the ship's freight went overboard, yet all this waste could small relief afford. So fierce the storm, necessity at last, does loudly call to ease her of her mast. Hard is the case, and dangerous the distress, when what we would preserve we must make less. Go now, go trust the wind's uncertain breath, removed four fingers from approaching death. Or seven at most, when thickest is the board, go with provision, biscuit, brandy stored. But if you reasonably hope to speed, you must produce your axe in time of need. Now when the sea grew calm, the winds were laid, and the pleased parquet spun a whiter thread, when fate propitious sent a gentle gale. The shattered vessel, with one wretched sail, beside what gowns and coats her crew could lend, to help her on her course, did homeward bend. The south wind, lessening still, the sun appears, and into lively hope converts their fears. And now, in prospect sweet, his cheerful light, the Alban cliffs confesses to their sight, where Alba's pile Julius' founding reared, when to Lavinium he that seat preferred, and called it Alba, from the white sow named, that for her thirty sucking pigs was famed. At last within the mighty mole she gets, our Tuscan Pharos that the mid-sea meets, with its embrace, and leaves the land behind, a work so wondrous nature ne'er designed. Through it the joyful steersman clears his way, and comes to anchor in its inmost bay, where smallest vessels ride, and are secured, and the shorn sailors boast what they endured. Go then, my boys, the sacred rites prepare, with awful silence and attention here. With bran the knives, with flowers the altar dress, and in your diligence your zeal express. I'll follow straight, and having paid my vow, thence home again where chaplets wreath the brows. Of all my little waxen deities, And incense shall domestic Jove appease. My shining household gods shall revel there, And all the colours of the violet wear. All's right, my portal shines with verdant bays, And consecrated tapers early blaze. Suspect me not, Corvinus, of design, Far be such guilt from any thought of mine. My altars smoke not for so base an end, Catullus, though a father, is my friend, and his three children bar a foreign claim. Who on a friend so hopeless such a name as father would a sickly hen bestow, or on such slender grounds a quail forego? If Pacius or Galita breathe a vein, the temples straight are crowded with a train of fawning rascals uttering each his prayer. Nothing's too precious for a life so dear. A hecatomb is scarce enough to bleed, And but an elephant no common breed, Nor seen nor known in Italy before, They were transported from the Afric shore, Since which, in the Rutilian forest reared, They range at large great Caesar's royal herd, As once they learned King Pyrrhus to obey, And with submission to our consul's sway, Or Tyrion's Hannibal's part of the war, in turrets on their backs they used to bear. Could Novius or Pecuvius but procure these ivory portents, death should seal them sure. A victim for Galata, nothing less, the greatness of their friendship can express. Pecuvius, were he not by law withstood, would manifest his own in human blood. The best, the loveliest slave of either sex, to serve his complement, should yield their necks. Nay, to that height the wicked robe proceeds, his Iphigenia, his daughter, bleeds. If need require, though he was sure to find no dexterous slight to change her for a hind, my fellow citizen I must commend for what's a fleet to a bequeathing friend. For if he chanced to escape this dismal bout, the former legatees are blotted out. 
upon Pacubius, or must be conferred, so great a merit claims no less of reward. Pacubius struts it, and triumphant goes, in the dejected crowd of rival foes. You see the fruit of his projecting brain in offering up his daughter to his gain. As great as Nero's plunder be his store, high mountain high piled with shining ore, then he may life to Nestor's age extend, nor ever be, nor ever find a friend. End of the Twelfth Satire The Thirteenth Satire of the Satires of Decimus Junius Juvenalis, translated by John Dryden and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Nicholas Hillier, Wiltshire, England. The Thirteenth Satire, translated by Mr. Thomas Creech. The Argument. Corvinus had trusted one of his old friends and acquaintance with a bag of money. This friend denies the trust and forswears it too. Corvinus is very much disturbed at this cheat, storms and rages, accuses Providence, and is ready to conclude that God takes no care of things below, because some sudden and remarkable vengeance did not fall upon this perjured false wretch. Juvenal, hearing of Corvinus's loss and unmanly behaviour, writes this satire to him, both to comfort him after his loss, and instruct him how to bear it, and thence takes occasion to speak of the vileness and villainy of his times. He begins with the condition of the wicked man, and tells him, one, that the sinner must needs hate himself, and two, that he will be hated by all mankind. Three, he puts Corvinus in mind that he hath a good estate, and that this loss will not break him. Four and five, are that a great many have suffered the like misfortunes, that cheats were common, his loss but little, and therefore not to be resented with so violent a passion. Hence six, he expiates on the vileness of the times, and seven compares his age with the golden one which he tediously describes. Eight, he continues his reflections on the general wickedness of the times. 9. Makes some observations on the confidence of some sinners, and 10. Endeavours to give some account of this. He observes that some are atheists. 11. Others believe a god, but fancy the money they get by their perjury will do them more good than the punishment he inflicts will do them harm. At least 12. That God is merciful, they may be pardoned, or scape in the crowd of sinners since some are forgiven, and all do not meet with punishments equal to their deserts. 13. He corrects his friend for his atheistical passion, and rude accusations of providence. And 14. Advises him to be more cool and consider, that 15. Such cheats are common, and he hath suffered no more than other men and sixteen, that every day he may meet with greater crimes which require his concernment, that seventeen, his passion is idle and fruitless because revenge, which is the only end of passion, will do him no good, it will not retrieve his loss, and besides is an argument of a base mind and mean temper. Then, coming closer to his point, he tells him, eighteen, the wicked, are severely punished by their own consciences. Nineteen, vengeance waits upon them, and twenty describes the miserable life and terrible death of the wicked man, and twenty-one closes all with observing that few men stop at their first sin, but go on till their crimes provoke providence, and therefore twenty-two, Corvinus, need not fear, but this perjured friend of his would do so too, and then he should see some remarkable judgment fall upon him. He that commits a sin shall quickly find the pressing guilt lie heavy on his mind. Though bribes or favour shall assert his cause, pronounce him guiltless and elude the laws. None quits himself, his own impartial thought will damn and conscience will record the fault. This first the wicked feels, then public hate pursues the cheat, and proves the villain's fate. 
But more, call thyness, thy estate can bear a greater loss, and not implore thy care. Thy stock's sufficient, and thy wealth too great, to feel the damage of a petty cheat. Nor are such losses to the world unknown, a rare example, and thy chance alone. Most feel them, and in fortune's lottery lies a heap of blanks like this for one small prize. Abate thy passion, nor too much complain. Grief should be forced, and it becomes a man, to let it rise no higher than his pain. But you, too weak, are the slightest loss to bear, too delicate the common fate to share, are on the fret of passion boil and rage, because in so debauched and vile an age thy friend and old acquaintance dares disown the gold you lent him and forswear the loan. What start at this, when sixty years have spread their grey experience o'er thy hoary head? Is this all observing age could gain, or hast thou known the world so long in vain? Let Stoics, Ethics, haughty rules advance to combat fortune and conquer chance. Yet happy those, though not so learned, are thought, whom life instructs and by experience taught. For new to come from past misfortunes look, nor shake the yoke which galls the more tis shook. What days are so sacred, but its rests profaned, by violent robbers or by murders stained? Here hired assassins for their gain invade, and treacherous poisoners urge their fatal trade. Good men are scarce, the just are thinly sown, they thrive but ill, nor can they last when grown. And should we count them, and our store compile, yet Thebes more gates would show, more mouths the Nile. Worse than the Iron Age and wretched times, roll on, and use hath so impoverished our crimes that baffled nature knows not how to frame a metal base enough to give the age a name. Yet you exclaim as loud as those that praise, for scraps and coach hire a young noble's plays. You thunder, and as passion rolls along, call heaven and earth to witness to your wrong. Grey-headed infant, and in vain grown old, art thou to learn that in another's gold lie charms resistless, that all laugh to find, unthinking plainness, so spread thy mind? That thou couldst seriously persuade the crowd to keep their oaths and to believe a god? This they could do whilst Saturn filled the throne, ere Juno burnished or young Jove was grown, ere private he left Ida's close retreat, or made rebellion by example great. And whilst his hoary sire to Latium fled, usurped his empire and defiled his bed. Whilst gods dined singly and few feasts above, no beauteous Hebe mixed the wine with love, no Phrygian boy but Vulcan stained the pole, with sooty hands and filled the sparing bowl. Ere gods grew numerous, and the heavenly crowd pressed wretched Atlas with a lighter load, ere chance unenvied Neptune's lot confined, to rule the ocean and oppose the wind, ere Persephone with Plato shared the throne. Ere furies lashed, or ghosts had learned to groan, But free from punishment, as free from sin, The shades lived jolly, and without a king. Then vice was rare, e'en rudeness kept in awe, Felt all the vigour of avenging law. And had not men the hoary heads revered, Or boys paid reverence when a man appeared, Both must have died, though richer skins they wore and saw more heaps of acorns in their store. Four years advance did such respect engage, and youth was reverenced then like sacred age. Now if one honest man I chance to view, condemning interest and to virtue true, I rank him with the prodigies of fame, with ploughed-up fishes and with icy flame, with things which start from nature's common rules, with bearded infants, and with teeming mules. 
as much amazed at the prodigious sign as if I saw bees clustered on a shrine. A shower of stones or rivers changed to blood, roll wondrous waves or urge a milky flood. A little sum you mourn, while most have met with twice the loss and by as vile a cheat. By treacherous friends and secret trust betrayed, some are undone, nor are the gods our aid. Those conscious powers we can with ease condemn, if hid from men we trust our crimes with them. Observe the wretch who hath his faith forsook, how clear his voice and how assured his look. Like innocence and as serenely bold as truth, how loudly he forswears thy gold. By Neptune's trident, by the bolts of Jove, and all the magazine of wrath above, nay more, in curses he goes boldly on, he damns himself and thus devotes his son. If I'm forsworn, you injured gods renew Thyestes' feast, and prove the fable true. Some think that chance rules all, that nature steers the moving seasons, and turns round the years. These run to every shrine, these boldly swear, and keep no faith, because they know no fear. Another doubts, but as his doubts decline, he dreads just vengeance, and he starts at sin. He owns a god, and yet the wretch forswears, and thus he reasons to relieve his fears. Let Isis rage, so I securely hold, the coin forsworn, and keep the ravished gold. Let blindness, lameness come, our legs and eyes, of equal value to so great a prize? Would starving Ladus, had he leave to choose, and were not frantic, the rich gout refuse? For can the glory of the swiftest pace procure him food, or can he feast on praise? The gods take aim before they strike their blow, though sure their vengeance yet the stroke is slow, and should at every sin their thunder fly, I'm yet secure, nor is my danger nigh. But they are gracious, but their hands are free, and who can tell but they may reach to me? Some they forgive, and every age relates that equal crimes have met unequal fates, that sins alike, unlike, rewards have found, and whilst this villain is crucified, the others crowned. The man that shivered on the brink of sin, thus steeled and hardened, ventures boldly in, dare him to swear, he with a cheerful face, flies to the shrine and bids thee mend thy face. He urges, go before thee, shows the way, nay, pulls thee on and chides thy dull delay. For confidence in sin, when mixed with zeal, seems innocence, and looks to most as well. Thus, like the waggish slave in the play, he spreads the net and takes the easy prey. You rage and storm, and blasphemously loud, as stentor bellowing to the Grecian crowd, or Homer's Mars, with too much warmth, exclaim, Jove, dost thou hear, and is thy thunder tame? Wert thou all brass, thy brazen arm should rage, and fix the wretch a sign to future age, else why should mortals to thy feasts repair, spend useless incense and more useless prayer? Bathyllus's statue at this rate may prove thy equal rival, or a greater Jove. Be cool, my friend, and hear my muse dispense some sovereign comforts drawn from common sense, not fetched from Stoics' rigid schools, nor wrought by Epicurus's more indulgent thought, who, led by nature, did with ease pursue the rules of life, guessed best, though missed the true. A desperate wound must skilful hands employ, but thine is curable by Philip's boy. Look o'er the present and the former time, if no example of so vile a crime appears, then mourn, admit no kind relief, but beat thy breast, and I applaud thy grief. Let sorrow then appear in all her state. Keep mournful silence, and shut fast thy gate. 
Let solemn grief on money lost attend greater than waits upon a dying friend. None feigns, none acted, mornings forced to show, or squeeze his eyes to make that torrent flow. For money's lost demands a heartier due, then tears are real, and the grief is true. But if it's each a size and term we try, a thousand rascals of as deep a die, if men forswear the deeds and bonds they draw, though signed with all formality of law, and though the writing and the seal proclaim the barefaced perjury and fix the shame, go, fortune's darling, nor expect to bear the common lot but to avoid thy share. Heaven's favourite, thou, for better fates designed, than we the dregs and rubbish of mankind. This petty sinner scarce deserves thy rage, compared with the great villains of the age. Here hired assassins kill, there sulphur thrown, by treacherous hands destroys the frighted town. Bold sacrilege invading things divine, break through a temple or destroys a shrine. The reverend goblets and the ancient plate, those grateful presents of a conquering state, or pious king, or if the shrine be poor, the image spoils, nor is the god secure. One seizes Neptune's beard, one Castor's crown, or Jove himself and melts the thunderer down. Here poisoners murder, there the impious son, with whom a guiltless ape is doomed to drown prevents old age, and with a hasty blow, cuts down his sire, and quickens fates too slow. Yet what are these to those vast heaps of crimes, which make the greatest business of our times, which terms prolong, and which from morn to night amaze the juries and the judges fright? Attend the court, and thou shalt briefly find, in that one place, the manners of mankind." Hear the indictments, then return again, call thyself wretch, and if thou dost complain. Whom midst the Alps do hanging throats surprise, who stares in Germany at watchet eyes, or who, in Meroe, when the breast reclined, hangs o'er the shoulder to the child behind, and bigger than the boy, for wonders lost, when things grow common and are found in most. When cranes invade his little sword and shield, the pygmy takes and freight attends the field. The fights soon o'er, the cranes descend and bear the sprawling warriors through the liquid air. Now here, should such a fight appear to view, all men would split, the sight would please whilst new. They are none concerned, where every day they fight, and not one warrior is a foot in height. But shall the villains scape, shall perjury grow rich and safe, and shall the cheat be free? Hadst thou full power, rage asks no more, to kill, or measure out his torments by thy will? Yet what couldst thou, tormentor, hope to gain? Thy loss continues unrepaid by pain. In glorious comfort thou shalt poorly meet, from his mean blood, but oh, revenge is sweet. Thus think the crowd, who, eager to engage, take quickly fire, and kindle into rage, who ne'er consider but without a pause, make up in passion what they want in cause. Not so mild Thales, nor Chrysippus thought, nor that good man who drank the poisoner's draught, with mind serene, and could not wish to see his vile accuser drink as deep as he. Exalted Socrates, divinely brave, injured he fell, and dying he forgave. Too noble for revenge, which still we find the weakest frailty of a feeble mind. Degenerous passion, and for man too base, it seats its empire in the female race. There rages, and to make its blow secure, puts flattery on until the aim be sure. But why must those be thought to scape that feel those rods of scorpions and those whips of steel, which conscience shakes when she with rage controls and spreads amazing terrors through their souls? Not sharp revenge, nor hell itself can find a fiercer torment than a guilty mind, which day and night doth dreadfully accuse, condemns the wretch, and still the charge renews. 
A trusted Spartan was inclined to cheat. The coin looked lovely, and the bag was great. Secret the trust, and with an oath defend the prize, and baffle his deluded friend. But weak in sin, and of the gods afraid, and not well versed in the forswearing trade, he goes to Delphi, humbly begs advice, and thus the priestess by command replies, Expect sure vengeance by the gods decreed, to punish thoughts not yet improved to deed. At this he started, and forbore that to swear, not out of conscience of sin, but fear. Yet plagues ensued, and the contagious sin destroyed itself, and ruined all his kin. Thus suffered he for the imperfect will to sin and bear design of doing ill. For he that but conceives a crime in thought contracts the danger of an actual fault. Then what must he expect that still proceeds to finish sin and work up thoughts to deeds? Perpetual anguish fills his anxious breast, not stopped by business nor composed by rest. No music cheers him, and no feast can please. He sits like discontented Damocles, when by the sportive tyrant wisely shown the dangerous pleasures of a flattered throne. Sleep flies the wretch, or when his cares oppressed, and his tossed limbs are wearied into rest, then dreams invade, the injured gods appear, all armed with thunder, and awake his fear. What frights him most in a gigantic size, thy sacred image flashes in his eyes. These shake his soul, and as they boldly press, bring out his crimes and force him to confess. This wretch will start at every flash that flies, grow pale at the first murmur of the skies. Air clouds are formed, and thunder roars afraid, and Epicurus can afford no aid. His notions fail, and the destructive flame commissioned falls, not thrown by chance, but aim. One clap is passed, and now the skies are clear, a short reprieve, but to increase his fear. Whilst arms divine, revenging crimes below, are gathering up to give the greater blow. But if a fever fires his sulphurous blood, in every fit he feels the hand of God, and heaven-born flame, then drowned in deep despair, he dares not offer one repenting prayer, nor vow one victim to preserve his breath. Amazed he lies, and sadly looks for death. For how can hope with desperate guilt agree, and the worst beast is worthier life than he? He that once sins, like him that slides on ice, goes swiftly down the slippery ways of vice. Though conscience checks him, yet those rubs gone o'er, he slides on smoothly and looks back no more. What sinners finish where they first begin, and with one crime content their lust to sin? Nature, that rude, and in her first essay, stood boggling at the roughness of the way. Used to the road, unknowing to return, goes boldly on and loves the path when worn. Fear not, but pleased with this successful bait, thy perjured friend will quickly tempt his fate. He will go on until his crimes provoke the arm divine to strike the fatal stroke. Then thou shalt see him plunged when least he fears, at once accounting for his deep arrears, sent to those narrow isles which thronged we see with mighty exiles once secure as he drawn to the gallows, or condemned to chains, then thou shalt triumph in the villain's pains. Enjoy his groans, and with a grateful mind confess that heaven is neither deaf nor blind. End of the Thirteenth Satire The Fourteenth Satire of the Satires of Decimus Junius Juvenalis Translated by Mr. John Dryden and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Nicholas Hillier, Wiltshire, England, January 2024. The 14th Satire. Translated by Mr. John Dryden, Jr. The Argument. Since domestic examples easily corrupt our youth, 
the poet prudently exhorts all parents that they themselves should abstain from evil practices, amongst which he chiefly points at dice and gaming, taverns, drunkenness and cruelty which they exercised upon their slaves, lest after their pernicious example their sons should copy them in their vices and become gamesters, drunkards and tyrants, lystrogens and cannibals to their servants. For if the father, says Juvenal, love the box and dice, the boy will be given to an itching elbow. Neither is it to be expected that the daughter of Laga, the adulteress, should be more content than her mother, since we are all by nature more apt to receive ill impressions than good, and are besides more pliant in our fancy and youth than when we grow up to riper years. Thus we are more apt to imitate a catline than a Brutus, or the uncle of Brutus, Cato Eutychensis. For these reasons he is instant that all parents, that they permit not their children to hear lascivious words, and that they banish pimps, whores, and parasites from their houses. If they are careful, says the poet, when they make any invitation to their friends, that all things shall be clean and set in order, much more it is their duty to their children that nothing appear corrupt or indecent in their family. Storks and vultures, because they are fed by the old ones, with snakes and carrion, naturally and without instruction, feed on the same uncleanly diet. But the generous eaglet, who is taught by her parents to fly at hares and sows on kids, disdains afterwards to pursue a more ignoble game. Thus the son of Centronius was prone to the vice of raising stately structures beyond his fortune, because his father had ruined himself by building. He, whose father is a Jew, is naturally prone to superstition and to observation of his country laws. From hence the poet descends to a satire against avarice, which he esteems to be the worst example than any of the former. The remaining part of the poem is wholly employed on this subject to show the misery of this vice. He concludes with limiting our desire of riches to a certain measure, which he confines within the compass of what hunger and thirst and cold require for our preservation and subsistence, with which necessaries, if we are not contented, then the treasuries of Croesus, of the Persian king, or of the eunuch Narcissus, who commanded both the will and the fortune of Claudius the emperor, would not be sufficient to satisfy the greediness of our desires. To his friend Fuscinus. Fuscinus, those ill deeds that fully fame and lay such blots upon an honest name, in blood once tainted like a current run, from the lewd father to the lewder son. If gaming does an aged sire entice, then my young master swiftly learns the vice, and shakes in hanging sleeves the little box and dice. Thus the voluptuous youth, bred up to dress for his fat grandsire some delicious mess, in feeding high his tutor will surpass, as heir apparent of the gourmand race. And should a thousand grave philosophers be always hollowing virtue in his ears, they would at last their loss of time lament, and give him o'er for glutton in descent. Can cruel Rutilus, who loves the noise of whips far better than a siren's voice, can Polyphemus or Antiphates, who gorge themselves with man, can such as these set up to teach humanity and give by their example rules for us to live? Can they preach up equality of birth and tell us how we all began from earth? The inhuman lord, who with a cruel gust, can a red fork in his slave's forehead thrust, because the unlucky criminal was caught with little theft of two coarse towels fraught? Can he, a son, so soft remorse in sight, whom goals and blood and butchery delight? Who would expect the daughter should be other than common punk, if large be the mother, whose lover's names, in order to run o'er, the girl took breath full thirty times and more? She, when but yet a tender minx, began to hold the door, but now sets up for man, and to her gallants in her own handwriting sends billet doux of the old board's inditing. So nature prompts so soon we go astray, when old experience puts us in the way. 
Our green youth copies what grey sinners act, when venerable age commends the fact. Some sons, indeed, some very few we see, who keep themselves from this infection free, whom gracious heaven for nobler ends designed, their looks erected and their clay refined. The rest are all by bad example led, and in their father's slimy track they tread. Tis not enough we should ourselves undo, but that our children we must ruin too. Children, like tender osiers, take the bow, and as they first are fashioned always grow. By nature headlong to all ills we run, and virtue, like some dreadful monster, shun. Survey the world, and where one Cato shines, count a degenerate herd of Catalines. Suffer no lewdness or undecent speech, the apartment of the tender youth to reach. Far be from thence the glutton parasite, singing his drunken catches all the night. But farther still be woman, woman first was evil's cause, herself of ills the worst. Boys even from parents may this reverence claim, for when thou dost at some vile action aim, say, should the harmless child withhold thy hand, would it not put thy fury to a stand? Then may we not conclude the sire unjust, who, when his son, uh, come with drink and lust, is by the censor of good manners caught, and suffers public penance for his fault, rails and reviles and turns him out of door, for what himself so oft has done before? A son so copied from his vice, so much the very fame in every little touch, that should he not resemble to his life, the father justly might suspect his wife. This very reverend lecher, quite worn out with rheumatisms and crippled with his gout, forgets what he in youthful times has done, and swinges his own vices in his son. To entertain a guest, with what a care would be his household ornaments prepare? Harris his servants and overseer stand, to keep em working with a threatening wand. Clean all my plate, he cries, let not one stain a sully the figured silver or the plain. Rub all the floors, make all the pillars bright, no hanging cobwebs leave to shock the sight. O wretched man, is all this hurry made on this account, because thou art afraid a dirty hall or entry should offend the curious eyes of thy invited friend? Reform thy family, one son at home concerns thee more than many guests to come. If to some useful art he be not bred, he grows mere lumber, and is worse than dead. For what we learn in youth to that alone, in age we are by second nature prone. The callow stalks with lizard and with snake are fed, and soon as air to wing they take, at sight those animals for food pursue, the first delicious bit they ever knew. Even so tis nature in the vulture's breed, on dogs and human carcasses to feed. Jove's bird will souse upon the timorous hare, and tender kids with his sharp talons tear, because such food was laid before him first, when from his shell the labouring eaglet burst. Centronius does high costly villas raise, with Grecian marble, which the sight amaze. Some stand upon Cajeta's winding shore, at Tiber's tower, and at Prinestim Moor. The dome of Hercules and fortune show, to his tall fabrics like small cots below, so much his palaces o'er look a more, as gelt Poseides does our capitol. His son builds on and never is content, till the last farthing is in structure spent. The Jews, like their begotted sires before, by gazing on the clouds their god adore, so superstitious that they'll sooner dine upon the flesh of men than that of swine. Our Roman customs they contemn and jeer, but learn and keep their country rites with fear. That worship only they in reverence have, which in dark volumes their great Moses gave. Ask them the road, and they shall point you wrong, because you do not 
to their tribe belong. They'll not betray a spring to quench your thirst unless you show em circumcision first. So they are taught and do it to obey their fathers who observe the Sabbath day. Young men, to imitate all ills, are prone, but are compelled to avarice alone. For then in virtue's shape they follow vice, because a true distinction is so nice. That the base wretch who hoards up all he can is praised and called a careful thrifty man, the fabled dragon never guarded more the golden fleece than his ill-got store. What a profound respect, where'er he goes, the multitude to such a monster shows. Each father cries, My son, example take, and led by this wise youth, thy fortunes make, who day and night ne'er ceased to toil and sweat, drudged like a smith, and on the anvil beat, till he had hammered out a vast estate. Side with that sect who learnedly deny that e'er content was joined with poverty, who measure happiness by wealth increased, and think the moneyed man alone is blessed. Parents the little arts of saving teach, ere sons the top of avarice can reach, when with false weights their servants' guts they cheat, and pinch their own to cover the deceit. Keep a stale crust till it looks blue, and think their flesh ne'er fit for eating till it stink the least remains of which they mince and dress it o'er again to make another mess, adding a leek whose every string is told for fear some pilfering hand should make too bold, and with a mark distinct seal up a dish of thrice-boiled beans and putrid summer fish. A beggar on the bridge would loathe such food and send it to be washed in Tiber's flood. But to what end these days of sordid gain? It shows a manifest unsettled brain, living to suffer a low starving fate in hopes of dying in a wealthy state. For as thy strutting bags with money rise, the love of gain is of an equal size. Kind fortune does the poor man better bless, who, though he has it not, desires it less. One villa, therefore, is too little thought, a larger farm at a vast price is bought. Uneasy still within these narrow bounds, thy next design is on thy neighbour's grounds. His crop invites to full perfection grown, thy own seems thin because it is thy own. The purchase therefore is demanded straight, and if he will not sell or make thee wait, a team of oxen in the night are sent, starved for the purpose and with labour spent to take free quarter, which in one half hour the pains and product of the year devour. Then some are basely bribed to vow it looks most plainly done by thieves with reaping hooks. Such mean revenge committed underhand has ruined many an acre of good land. What if men talk and whispers go about, pointing the malice and its author out? He values not what they can say or do, for who will dare a moneyed man to sue? Thus he would rather cursed and envied be than loved and praised in honest poverty. But to possess a long and happy life, freed from diseases and secure from strife, give me, ye gods, the product of one field as large as that which the first Romans tilled. That so I neither may be rich nor poor, and having just enough, not covered more. Twas then old soldiers covered o'er with scars, the marks of Pyrrhus or the Punic wars, thought all past services rewarded well, if to their share at last two acres fell. Their country's frugal bounty, so of old was blood and life at a low market sold. Yet then this little spot of earth, well tilled, a numerous family with plenty filled, the good old man and thrifty housewives spent their days in peace and fattened with content, enjoyed the dregs of life and lived to see a long descending healthful progeny. The men were fashioned in a larger mould, the women fit for labour big and bold, gigantic hands as soon as work was done to their huge pots of boiling pulse would run fell to with eager joy on homely food 
and their large veins beat strong with wholesome blood. Of old, two acres were a bounteous lot, now scarce they serve to make a garden plot. From hence the greatest part of ills descend, when lust of getting more will have no end. That still our weaker passions does command, and puts the sword and poison in our hand. Who covets riches cannot brook delay, but spurs and bears down all that stops his way. Nor laws nor checks of conscience will he hear, when in hot scent of gain and full career. But hark how ancient Marsus did advise, My sons, let these small cots and hills suffice, Let us the harvest of our labour eat, Tis labour makes the coarsest diet sweet. Thus much to the kind rural gods we owe, Who pitied suffering mortals long ago, When on harsh acorns hungrily they fed, And gave em nicer pallets, better bread. The country peasant meditates no harm, When clad with skins of beasts to keep him warm. In winter weather unconcerned he goes, Almost knee-deep through mire, in clumsy shoes. Vice dwells in palaces, is richly dressed, There glows in scarlet, and the Tyrian vest. The wiser ancients these instructions gave, but now a covetous old crafty knave at dead of night shall rouse his son and cry, Turn out, you rogue, how like a beast you lie. Go buckle to the law, is this an hour to stretch your limbs? You'll ne'er be chancellor, or else yourself to Lelius recommend. To such broad shoulders Lelius is the friend. Fight under him, there's plunder to be had. A captain is a very gainful trade. And when in service your best days are spent, In time you may command a regiment. But if the trumpet's clangour you abhor, And dare not be an alderman of war, Take to a shop behind a counter lie. Cheat half in half, none thrive by honesty. Never reflect upon the sordid ware which you expose, Begain your only care. He that grows rich by scouring of a sink Gets wherewithal to justify the stink. This sentence worthy Jove himself record As true and take it on a poet's word. To have money is a necessary task, And whence tis got the world will never ask. Taught by their nurses, little children get This saying sooner than their alphabet. What care a father takes to teach his son With ill-timed industry to be undone? Leave him to nature, and you'll quickly find The tender cockerel takes just after kind. The forward youth will, without driving, go And learn to shoot you in your proper bow. As much as Ajax his own sire excelled, And was the brawnier blockhead in the field. Let nature in the boy but stronger grow, And all the father soon itself will show. When first the down appears upon his chin, For a small sum he swears through thick and thin. At Ceres' altar vents his perjury, And blasts her holy image with a lie. If a rich wife he marries in her bed, She's found by dagger or by poison dead. While merchants make long voyages by sea, To get estates he cuts a shorter way. In mighty mischief little labour lies, I never counselled this, the father cries, But still, base man, he copied this from thee, Thine was the prime original villainy. For he who covets gain to such excess, Does by dumb signs himself as much express, As if in words at length he showed his mind, Thy bad example made him sin by kind. But how can youth let loose to vice restrain? When once the hard-mouthed horse has got the rein, He's past thy power to stop, young Phaeton, By the wild courses of his fancy drawn, From east to north irregularly hurled, First set on fire himself, and then the world. Astrologers are sure long life, you say? Your son can tell you better much than they, Your son and heir, whose hopes your life delay. Poison will work against the stars, beware, For every meal an antidote prepare. 
and let Artigenes some cordial bring, fit for a wealthy father or a king. What sight more pleasant in his public shows did ever Praetor on the stage expose? than are such men, as every day we see, whose chief mishap, and only misery, is to be overstocked with ready coin, which now they bring to watchful Castor's shrine, since Mars, whom we the great Revenger call, lost his own helmet and was stripped of all, tis time dull theatres we should forsake, when busy men much more diversion make the tumblers gamble some delight afford no less the nimble capers on the cord but these are still insipid stuff to thee cooped in a ship and tossed upon the sea base wretch exposed by thy own covetous mind to the deaf mercy of the waves and wind the dancer on the rope with doubtful tread gets wherewithal to clothe and buy him bread nor covets more than hunger to prevent but nothing less than millions thee content. What shipwrecks and dead bodies choke the sea, the numerous fools that were betrayed by thee. For at the charming call of powerful gain, whole fleets equipped appear upon the main, and spite of Libyan and Carpathian gale, beyond the limits of known earth they sail, a labour worth the while at last to brag, when safe returned and with a strutting bag, what finny sea-gods thou hast had in view, More than our lying poets ever knew! What several madnesses in men appear, Orestes runs from fancied furies here, Ajax belabours there an harmless ox, And thinks that Agamemnon feels the nox. Nor is indeed that man less mad than these, Who freights a ship to venture on the seas, with one frail interposing plank, to save from certain death, rolled on by every wave. Yet silver makes him all this toil embrace, silver with titles stamped, and a dull monarch's face, when gathering clouds o'ershadow all the skies, and shoot quick lightnings, way, my boys, he cries, a summer's thunder, soon it will be past, yet hardy fool this night may prove thy last, when thou, thy ship o'erwhelmed with waves, shalt be forced to plunge naked in the raging sea. Thy teeth hard-pressed, a purse full of dear gold, the last remain of all thy treasures hold. Thus he, whose sacred hunger all the stores that lie, in yellow tagus could not satisfy, does now in tattered clothes at some lane's end a painted storm for charity extend. With care and trouble great estates we gain, When got we keep em with more care and pain. Rich Lysenus, his servants ready stand, Each with a water-bucket in his hand, Keeping a guard for fear of fire all night, Yet Lysenus is always in a fright. His curious statues, amber works and plate, Still fresh increasing pangs of mind create. The naked cynic's jar ne'er flames, if broken, tis quickly foddered, or anew bespoken. When Alexander first beheld the face of the great cynic in that narrow space, his own condition thus he did lament, how much more happy thou that art content to live within this little hole than I, who after empire that vain quarry fly. Grappling with dangers wheresoe'er I roam, while thou hast all the conquered world at home, Fortune a goddess is to fools alone. The wise are always masters of their own. If any ask me what would satisfy to make life easy, thus I would reply, As much as keeps out hunger, thirst, and cold, or what contented Socrates of old, as much as made wise Epicurus blessed, who in small gardens spacious realms possessed. This is what nature's wants may well suffice. He that would more is covetous, not wise. But since among mankind so few there are, Who will conform to philosophic fare, Thus much I will indulge thee for thy ease, And mingle something of our times to please. Therefore enjoy a plentiful estate, As much as will a knight of Rome create. By Roscian laws, and if that will not do, 
double and take as much as will make two nay three to satisfy the last desire but if to more than this thou dost aspire believe me all the riches of the east the wealth of croesus cannot make thee blessed the treasure claudius to narcissus gave would make thee claudius like an errant slave who to obey his mighty minions will did his loved empress messalina kill end of the fourteenth satire The Fifteenth Satire of the Satires of Decimus Junius Juvenalis, translated by Mr. John Dryden and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Nicholas Hillier, Wiltshire, England, January 2024. The Fifteenth Satire, translated by Mr. Tate. The Argument. In this satire, against the superstition and cruelty of the Egyptians, "'Tis probable our author had his old friend Crispinus, who was of that country, in his eye, and to whom he had paid his respects more than once before. The scene is now removed from Rome, which shows our author a professed enemy of vice wheresoever he meets with it. But if by the change of place his subject and performance in this satire be, as some think, more barren than in his others, the people being obscure and mean rabble, whose barbarous fact he relates, we find in it, however, sprinklings of the same moral sentiments and reflections that adorn the rest. How Egypt, mad with superstition grown, makes gods of monsters, but too well is known. One sect devotion to Nile's serpent pays, others to Ibis that on serpents preys. Where Thebes thy hundred gate lie unrepaired, and where maimed Mamnon's magic harp is heard, where these are mouldering, let the sots combine with pious care a monkey to enshrine. Fish gods you'll meet with fins and scales o'ergrown, Diana's dogs adorned in every town. Her dogs have temples, but the goddess none. Tis mortal sin an onion to devour. Each clove of garlic is a sacred power. Religious nations, sure, and blessed abodes where every orchard is o'errun with gods to kill is murder sacrilege to eat a kid or lamb man's flesh is lawful meat of such a practice when ulysses told what think you could alcenus's guests withhold from scorn or rage shall we cries one permit this lewd romancer and his bantering wit nor on Charybdis rock beat out his brains, or send him to the Cyclops whom he feigns? Of Scylla's dogs, and stranger flams than these, Cyan's rocks that jostle in the seas, of winds in rags for mirth's sake, let him tell, and of his mates turned swine by Circe's spell, but men to eat men, human flesh surpasses, this traveller takes us islanders for asses. Thus the incredulous fake, having yet drank but one round, replied in sober fret, nor without reason truly, since the board, for proof of the fact, had but Ulysses's word. What I relate more strange, and even exceeds all registers of purple tyrant's deeds. Portentous mischiefs, they but singly act, a multitude conspired to this more horrid fact, Prepare, I say, to hear of such a crime, as tragic poets since the birth of time, ne'er feigned a thronging audience to amaze, but true and perpetrated in our days. Ombus and Tentia, neighbouring towns of late, broke into outrage of deep-festered hate. A grutch in both time, out of mind, begun, and mutually bequeathed from sire to son. Religious spite and pious spleen bred first this quarrel which so long the bigots nursed. Each calls the other's god of senseless stock, his own divine, though from the self same block. One carver framed them, differing but in shape, a serpent, this resembling, that an ape. The Tentriites, to execute their crime, think none so proper as a sacred time, which called the Ombites 
forth to public rites. Seven days they spent in feasts, seven sleepless nights. For scoundrels, as these wretched ombites be, Canopus they exceed in luxury. Them revelling thus, the Tentriites invade, by giddy heads and staggering legs betrayed. Strange odds, where crop-sick drunkards must engage a hungry foe, and armed with sober rage. At first both parties in reproaches jar, and make their tongues the trumpets of the war. Words break no bones, and in a railing fray, women and priests can be as stout as they. Words serve but to inflame our warlike lists, who, wanting weapons, clutch their horny fists, yet thus make shift to exchange such furious blows, scarce one escapes with more than half a nose. Some stand their ground with half their visage gone, but with the remnant of a face fight on. Such transformed spectacles of horror grow, that not a mother her own son would know. One eye remaining for the other spies, which now on earth a trampled jelly lies. Yet hitherto both parties think the fray but mockery of war, mere children's play. Though traversing with streams of blood they meet, they tread no carcass, yet beneath their feet, and scandal thinked to have none slain outright, between two hosts that for religion fight. This whets their rage to search for stones as large as they could lift, or with both hands discharge, not altogether of a size if matched with those which Ajax once or Turnus snatched, for their defence or by Tydides throne that brushed Aeneas's crest and struck him down, of weight would make two men strain hard to raise, such men as lived in honest Homer's days. Whom giants, yet to us we must allow, dwindled into a race of pygmies now. The mirth and scorn of gods that see us fight, such little wasps, and yet so full of spite. For bulk mere insects, yet in mischief strong, and spent so ill our short lives much too long. Fresh forces now of tentyrites from town, with swords and darts to aid their friends come down who with fleet arrows levelled from afar, ere they themselves approached to secure the war. Hard set before, what could the ombites do? They fly, their pressing foes as fast pursue. An ombite wretch, by headlong haste betrayed, and falling down i' the rout, is prisoner made, whose flesh, torn off by lumps, the ravenous foe, in morsels cut, to make it farther go his bones clean-picked, his very bones they gnaw, no stomach bulked, because the core is raw. It had been lost time to dress him, keen desire, supplies the want of kettle, spit, and fire. Prometheus's ghost is sure, a joy to see, his heaven-stone fire from such disaster free. Nor seems the sparkling elements less pleased than he. The guests are found too numerous for the treat, but all, it seems, who had the luck to eat, swear they ne'er tasted more delicious meat. They swear, and such good palates you should trust, who doubts the relish of the first free gust, since one who had either ear excluded been, and could not for a taste of the flesh come in, licks soiled earth which he thinks full as good, while reeking with a mangled ombit's blood. The Vascans once with man's flesh, as tis said, kept life and soul together, grant they did. Their case was different, with long siege distressed, and all extremities of war oppressed. For miserable to the last degree, the excuse of such a practice ought to be, with creatures vermin herbs or weeds sustained, while creatures vermin herbs or weeds remained, till to such a meagre spectacles reduced, as even compassion in the foe produced, acquitted by the manes of the dead, and ghosts of carcasses on which they fed. By Zeno's doctrine we are taught, tis true, for life's support no harmless thing to do. But Zeno never to the Vascans read, tis since their days that civil arts have spread. Twas lately British lawyers, from the Gaul, learnt to harangue and eloquently bawl. 
Thule hopes next to improve her northern style, and plant where yet no spring did ever smile, with flowers of rhetoric, her frozen isle. That brave the Vascans were, we must confess, who fortitude preserved in such distress. Yet not the brightest their example shines, eclipsed by the more noble Sagintines, who both the foe and famine to beguile, for dead and living raised one common pile. Maotis first did impious rites devise of treating gods with human sacrifice, but savage Egypt's cruelty exceeds the Scythian shrine, where, though the captive bleeds secure of burial when his life is fled, the murdering knife thrown by when once the victim's dead. Did famine to this monstrous fact compel, or did the miscreants try this conjuring spell, in time of drought, to make the Nile so swell? Amongst the rugged Cimbrians, or the race of Gauls, or fiercer Tartars, can you trace an outrage of revenge like this pursued by an effeminate scoundrel multitude, whose utmost daring is to cross the Nile in painted boats to fright the crocodile? Can men, or more resenting gods, invent, or hell inflict proportion to punishment, on varlets who could treat revenge and spite, with such a feast as famine's self would fright. Compassion proper to mankind appears, which nature witnessed when she lent us tears. Of tender sentiments we only give those proofs. To weep is our prerogative. To show by pitying looks and melting eyes how with a suffering friend we sympathise. Nay, tears will even from a wronged orphan slide when his false guardian at the bar is tried so tender, so unwilling to accuse, so oft the rolls on his cheeks bedews, so soft his tresses filled with trickling pearl, you doubt his sex and take him for a girl. Bimpulse of nature, though to us unknown the party be, we make the loss our own, and tears steal from our eyes when in the street with some betrothed virgin's hearse we meet, or infant funeral, from the cheated womb conveyed to earth and cradled in a tomb. Who can all sense of others' ills escape is but a brute, at best, in human shape. This natural piety did first refine our wit and raised our thoughts to things divine. This proves our spirit of the gods' descent while that of beasts is prone and downward bent. To them but earth-born life they did dispense, To us for mutual aid celestial sense, From straggling mountaineers for public good, To rank in tribes and quit the savage wood, Houses to build and them contiguous make, For cheerful neighbourhood and safety's sake. In war a common standard to erect, A wounded friend in battle to protect. The summons take of the same trumpet call, To sally from one port, or man one public wall. But serpents now more amity maintain, from spotted skins the leopard does refrain, no weaker lions by a stronger slain, nor from his larger tusks the forest boar, commission takes his brother swine to gore. Tiger with tiger, bear with bear you'll find, in leagues offensive and defensive joined. But lawless man the anvil dares profane, and forged that steel by which a man is slain, which earth at first for ploughshares did afford, nor yet the smith had learned to form a sword. An impious crew we have beheld, whose rage their enemies' very life could not assuage, unless they banquet on the wretch they slew, devour the corpse and lick the blood they drew. What think you would Pythagoras have said of such a feast, or to what desert fled? who flesh of animals refused to eat, nor held all sorts of pulse for lawful meat. End of the fifteenth satire The sixteenth and last satire of the satires of Decimus Junius Juvenalis, translated by Mr. Dryden and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Nicholas Hillier, Wiltshire, England, January 2024. The Sixteenth Satire, translated by Mr. John Dryden. The Argument 
The poet in this satire proves that the condition of a soldier is much better than that of a common man. First, because a countryman, however affronted, provoked, or struck himself, dares not strike a soldier who is only to be judged by a court-martial, and by the laws of Camillus, which obliges him not to quarrel without the trenches, he is also assured to have a speedy hearing and a quick dispatch, whereas the townsman or peasant is delayed in his suit by frivolous pretenses and not sure of justice when he is heard in the court. The soldier is also privileged to make a will and to give away his estate, which he got in war, to whom he pleases, without consideration of parentage or relations, which is denied to all other Romans. This satire was written by Juvenal, when he was a commander in Egypt. Tis certainly his, though I think it not finished, and if it be well observed, you will find he intended an invective against a standing army. What vast prerogatives, my Gallus, are accruing to the mighty man of war! For if into a lucky camp I light, those raw in arms and yet afraid to fight, befriend me, my good stars, and all goes right. One happy hour is to a soldier better than Mother Juno's recommending letter, or Venus, when to Mars she would prefer my suit and own the kindness done to her. See what our common privileges are. As first no saucy citizen shall dare to strike a soldier, nor when struck resent the wrong for fear of further punishment. Not though his teeth are beaten out, his eyes hang by a string, in bumps his forehead rife, shall he presume to mention his disgrace or beg amends for his demolished face. A booted judge shall sit to try his cause, not by the statute, but by martial laws, which old Camillus ordered to confine the brawls of soldiers to the trench and line. A wise provision, and from thence tis clear that officers a soldier's cause should hear. And taking cognizance of wrongs received, an honest man may hope to be relieved. So far tis well, but with a general cry the regiment will rise in mutiny. The freedom of their fellow rogue demand, and if refused will threaten to disband. Withdraw thy action, and depart in peace. The remedy is worse than the disease. This cause is worthy him, who in the hall would for his fee, and for his client, ball. But wouldst thou, friend, who hast two legs alone, which heaven be praised, thou yet mayst call thy own? Wouldst thou to run the gauntlet these expose to a whole company of hobnailed shoes? Sure the good breeding of wise citizens should teach em more good nature to their shins. Besides, whom canst thou think so much thy friend who dares appear thy business to defend? Dry up thy tears and pocket up the abuse, nor put thy friend to make a bad excuse. The judge cries out, your evidence produce. Will he who saw the soldier's mutton fist and saw thee mauled appear within the list to witness truth? When I see one so brave, the dead, I think, are risen from the grave and with their long spade beards and matted hair, our honest ancestors are come to take the air. Against a clown with more security, a witness may be brought to swear a lie, than though his evidence be full and fair, to vouch a truth against a man of war. More benefits remain, and claimed as rights, which are a standing army's perquisites. If any rogue vexatious suits advance against me for my known inheritance, enter by violence my fruitful grounds, or take the sacred landmark from my bounds, those bounds which with possession and with prayer and offered cakes have been my annual care, or if my debtors do not keep their day, deny their hands and then refuse to pay. I must with patience all the terms attend, among the common causes that depend, till mine is called, and that long-looked-for day is still encumbered with some new delay. Perhaps the cloth of state is only spread, some of the quorum may be sick abed, that judge is hot and doffs his gown, while this er night was bowsy and goes out to piss. So many rubs appear, the time is gone for hearing, and the tedious suit goes on. But buff and belt men never know these cares, 
No time nor trick of law their action bars. Their cause they to an easier issue put. They will be heard, or they lug out and cut. Another branch of their revenue still remains beyond their boundless right to kill. Their father, yet alive, empowered to make a will. For what their prowess gained, the law declares, is to themselves alone and to their heirs. No share of that goes back to the begetter. But if the son fights well and plunders better, like stout Coranus, his old shaking sire does a remembrance in his will desire. Inquisitive of fights and longs in vain to find him in the number of the slain. But still he lives, and rising by the war, enjoys his gains and has enough to spare. For tis a noble general's prudent part to cherish valour and reward desert. Let him be daubed with lace, live high and hoar, sometimes be lousy, but never poor. End of the sixteenth satire, and the end of the satires of Decimus Junius Juvenalis, translated by Mr. John Dryden and others.